let me know when you're ready to uh, broadcast. You're live? We're broadcasting now. Very good. All right, good evening and welcome uh, to the Boston School Committee meeting for this evening. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, thank you once again to everyone for joining us for this virtual meeting of the Boston School Committee. Since this is a, vir a virtual meeting, uh, we'll begin under open meeting law by taking attendance. Uh, Ms. Sullivan, we please call the roll. Dr. Coleman? Present. Mr. O'Neill? Dr. Rivera? Present. Ms. Robinson? Present. Mr. Tran? Ms. Oliver Davila? Present. Mr. Lacanto? Here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Sullivan. And I understand that Mr. O'Neill and uh, Mr. Tran will be joining us shortly. And uh, we'll be sure to mark their attendance as soon as they uh, join us. Uh, so for folks um, watching us this evening, uh, as you know, this meeting is being shared live on Zoom and will be rebroadcast on Boston City TV and YouTube. Uh, at a later date, and it will also be posted to the school committee's uh, webpage. Uh, for those of you that are joining us uh, either live on Zoom or at a later date, tonight's meeting uh, documents are also posted on the committee's webpage at bostonpublicschools.org slash school committee under the August 5th tab. We have interpretation uh, services available this evening in Spanish. Uh, Mr. Bernal has joined us. Uh, welcome on. Uh, would you please introduce our, yourself and us, Manuel? Thank you, Mr. Loconto. Good evening, everyone. My name is Juan Bernal. I am the Spanish interpreter. I will provide live interpretation during the public comment portion of the meeting for those in need of interpretation. I will make the uh, same announcement in Spanish. Muy buenas tardes, muy buenas noches para todos. Mi nombre es Juan Bernal. <clears throat> Soy el intérprete para español. Voy a proveer interpretación en vivo durante la porción de comentarios públicos de esta reunión para aquellas personas que necesiten de un intérprete. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Please proceed, Mr. Locanto. Thank you. Thank you once again, Mr. Bernal. Yeah. Uh, and thank you uh, as well to everyone who signed up for public comment this evening. Uh, for those of you that have joined us before, you'll know that sign up for both public comment periods closed at 4.30 p.m. And I want to uh, note for folks that uh, we do have a very high number of public commenters signed up this evening. So I do want to first remind and stress for each one of you that have signed up for public comment uh, that uh, first we want to be uh, courteous to uh, your fellow attendees. Uh, and second, we want you to please be um, careful to observe the two minute limit on comments. Uh, we have reduced uh, per school committee rules once we get past 20 commenters uh, to uh, reach the two minute mark for all comments. We have 96 speakers signed up this evening. So uh, we will be, um, uh, conducted quite a lengthy uh, public comment period. And so again, uh, with respect to courtesy for uh, your fellow commenters, if you can keep your remarks brief and focused and on point, we'd greatly appreciate that. Um, as a further reminder, if you do remind, uh, run out of time, uh, you can certainly um, submit your remaining comments by email to Ms. Sullivan, who will distribute those comments to the committee. Ms. Sullivan will also uh, remind everyone once again about the public comment rules when we get closer to uh, that portion of the meeting. But since we do al also have a number of newcomers joining us uh, this evening, uh, here's one other quick reminder for those of you that have signed up to testify. Um, make sure that when you sign into Zoom, uh, you signed under in under the same name that you used to sign up for public comment. You can use the Zoom tools to quote, rename yourself so that the committee staff will be able to recognize you when it comes time to call on you. So thank you once again for your cooperation. We look forward to hearing from you shortly. We'll begin the meeting now with the approval of minutes from the July 22nd, 20, 2020 school committee meeting. At this time, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the July 22nd meeting as presented. I move. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Vice Chair. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, you please yes. call the roll. Dr. Coleman? Yes. 
Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lacanto? Yes. Minutes are approved unanimously. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Sullivan. Move on now to the superintendent's report. Oh, and before we do, um, Ms. Sullivan, would you also please mark uh, that uh, Mr. O'Neill and Mr. Tran are present? Um, I believe we, we missed them in the, uh, the initial roll call. Uh, move on now, as I was mentioning to the superintendent's report, I present to you our superintendent, Dr. Brenna Caselius. Thank you, Chair Lacanto, and thanks members for being here and all of the people in the audience for joining us this evening. Uh, we have a a really packed agenda this evening. So we have a lot to cover and um, I'd like to discuss just a few updates and keep them short so that um, we don't go on too long. But first, let me start by recognizing some of our amazing BPS staff members who make us very BPS proud. I want to highlight a couple of, um, of our staff member, members because they've, rec they've been recognized and been given awards. So Jack Usain, who worked for BPS for more than 43 years, was recently named one of the recipients of this year's 2020 Shattuck Public Service Awards. Jack is in our technology team and delayed his retirement earlier this spring so that he could stay on and support his colleagues and the district as we transition to remote learning and work to distribute more than 32,000 Chromebooks to our students. Jack is the definition of a public servant and we are so lucky to have him in BPS for, for almost four decades. Last week, Nadia Riegler, a teacher at the Elliott K-8 Innovation School in the North End, was named the 2020 Massachusetts History Teacher of the Year, an award presented annually by the Gilder Lair Re Institute of American History. I've heard from so many colleagues who were not the least bit surprised that Ms. Regler was recognized for this honor. In the press conference announcing the award, Ms. Regler is quoted as saying, as an educator of color in an urban school district, it is important that I create a safe and supportive classroom culture. To foster student inquiry, I encourage participation, critical thinking, and inclusive perspectives. I am so BPS proud not only of Nadia's award, but that we have so many educators like her who work every day in and out to cultivate warm, respectful, and culturally affirming learning environments. Congratulations to both Jack and Nadia. I wanted to just give you an update on a change in nomenclature for our Cabo Verdean uh, community. The Boston Public Schools is committed to continually and authentically engaging the many cultural and ethnic communities who are part of our Boston Public Schools. Over the past year, the Office of English Learners has collaborated with leaders of the Cabo Verdean community as part of our work to implement the Look Act. In response to a July 16th request from the community leaders and following the work of the OEL team, BPS is adopting the term Cabo Verde instead of Cape Verde to refer to the country and Cabo Verdean instead of Cape Verdean to refer to the people of the nation's heritage. South New England has the largest Cabo Verdean American population, and this is an important step in our work to create culturally affirming learning environments and work environments. We'll be working with OEL and our departments and schools to ensure that all communications will be updated moving forward to reflect this very important change. I wanna just quickly briefly update you on conversation that we had in the last school committee around exam school admissions and working group. Um, we have now had the exam school um, admissions working group be created. And as we all know, because COVID uh, revealed some significant disparities uh, that are disproportionately affecting our Boston public school students, um, it raises some real equity questions given the COVID. And so to that end, I am glad to announce that this working group has been established to tackle these very real and complex and difficult decisions uh, in front of us. Membership is Sam Acevedo from the Opportunity Achievement Gap Task Force. He is the co-chair. Acacia Aguilera, a John O'Brien parent. Michael Contapasis, former BLS headmaster and BPS interim superintendent. Matt Kreger, on behalf of the Boston branch NAACP. Tanya Freedom Freeman Wisdom, John D. O'Brien, head of school. Catherine Graza, K-8 principal at the Curley, 
Zena Lum, Boston Latin Academy parent. Rachel Skerritt, Boston Latin School head of school. And Tanisha Sullivan, president of the Boston branch NAACP. I know the members of the working group take this responsibility seriously and will deliberate over the next several weeks to determine recommendations for this next school year. The working group has already held its first meeting yesterday to launch its work and plans to meet weekly. The group facilitated by Chief of Advancement, Monica Roberts, will use the racial equity tool to apply an equity lens to their work and to their recommendations. The meetings will be closed so that they can do their work and the recommendations will be brought forward on September 21st. I wanna just give a brief uh, update on our technology. Uh, we have uh, received our Chromebooks and every student is going to receive, um, that did not receive a new Chromebook in the spring, will receive a new one during reopening. Chromebooks are being reconfigured for our students as we speak, so they're ready to hit the ground running when we return, whether that's in person or whether that's remote. We have an additional 1,400 new hotspots arriving to BPS this week, and we will have established a fund to help families with uh, home broadband service. The city has committed to providing 2,500 families with home broadband through their digital equity fund. Families can continue to receive Comcast internet, internet essentials through uh, December, and after that, they'll receive that at a reduced rate. We have a joint tech, uh, tech task force with the BTU to help steer the adoption of an, all of our new tools uh, for remote learning and make sure that we're bringing teacher and school leader voice into any new tech adoptions that we uh, will have as we begin to look at a hybrid teaching technology, both software and hardware solutions. Each school will have a tech coordinator stipend. This will assess with, uh, assist with the coordination of new devices. Um, it will is assist with home internet in each building. Um, and we're grateful to the staff that is um, helping us to volunteer during closure. And also uh, this stipend will help us to sustain these efforts during our reopening. We're evaluating uh, both the camera and speaker packages and some other new technology that may help us with our hybrid instruction as well. The task force is helping us evaluate this tech and making sure that we provide the right training and the support. And I wanna thank our amazing BPS team, our technology team, and all of the teachers and school leaders working with them for their work, particularly uh, since the school closure. I wanted to update the community and our teachers uh, on our literacy adoption. We were preparing to um, launch um, a, lit a new literacy adoption for the 2021 school year, but we had to make the difficult decision to pause that adoption of the Wit and Wisdom literacy curriculum material uh, for the district after uh, much feedback from teachers and from the public. Our singular focus really does need to be on ensuring students and teachers and school leaders are ready for our new, our new school year. So uh, doubly, this will help us to uh, be more prepared and keep our focus on reopening. And over the next few weeks, as you know, this time is critical for our preparation, uh, we need everybody to focus on that planning and the delivery of high quality instruction via remote and blended learning and not learning a brand new curriculum and changing out the curriculum uh, because there may be uh, inappropriate, um, culturally not responsive or affirming materials in them. So we're pausing this literacy adoption to provide BPS the time and the space to address the concerns more fully uh, that have been surfaced around the curriculum materials and that we will um, then again, use the time that we have to prioritize what we do have and look at what we do have and then work with our teachers and our academic team to address the existing shortcomings in our current uh, materials and shore those up in terms of the standards-based alignment uh, that is needed and the culturally aff affirming focus that would be needed in those materials, both those materials that are online and sourced from online sources, as well as those that uh, are already within our uh, schools. We'll revisit this curriculum adoption next year and we'll conduct a thorough bias review then and also make sure that we include uh, school leaders, teachers, and external stakeholders in that review process. This week, as you know, is the last week of summer school, and I'd like to thank all of our teachers and school leaders for their incredible work this summer with our youth. Uh, 
And I also want to give a special shout out to our many par partners in Boston After School and Beyond for helping us to reinvent summer learning and for providing engaging and enriching opportunities for our students during the summer weeks. Pretty soon I'll be giving you a fall reopening presentation. Um, and earlier today we sent a letter to families and staff updating them on our plans for the fall and the start of the new school year. We've also published this first draft of the reopening plan and it can be found at www.bostonpublicschools.org forward slash reopening. And you can provide feedback uh, to us also at reopening at bostonpublicschools.org. I'll provide more details during my present presentation in just a moment. Um, but before I do, I just wanna say one more thing before I um, get ready to do the, the presentation. I'd like to take a moment to thank Pastor Thompson at Jubilee, Reverend Groover at Charles Street AME, and Reverend Eugene and Dr. Jackie Rivers for their love and support this past Monday. This past Monday, they organized a meeting for me to share our BPS vision and strategic planning with faith leaders. And I wanna thank each of them for their belief in the capacity, the worth and potential of our children, especially our black and brown children. As you know, I spent many Sundays visiting churches this past fall, and with the closure, I lost that ability. So this was a great way to get reconnected and to connect more intentionally with the, uh, as we work together with our faith leaders and our, and our many partners as we look ahead to reopening our schools. This uncertain time and the complex nature of meeting the needs of our children and their families will require an all hands on deck effort. And I can't thank the faith community and our many partners for their incredible generosity and support over the past several months. So with that, um, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Superintendent. I'll uh, open up the, uh, the floor to uh, questions and discussion from the committee. Looks like Dr. Rivera, you have a question. We'll start with you. And uh, anyone else that wishes to speak, please uh, raise your hand virtually or uh, otherwise make yourself known. Hi, Dr. Caselius. Thank you so much for that great updates. Um, I am happy to hear about Cabo Verde. <laughs> That's great. Um, wanted to ask about the exam schools working group. Um, could you say a little bit about how that was formed, um, the process for the composition of the members of that group, and if there is still an opportunity to include some student representation on that working group? Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, do you want to address some of that um, composition to the working group? And I, I think well, sure. that. I'm think sorry, that, are you speaking, Superintendent? So I think that we had um, decided that there would be some parents or some, uh, uh, also some principals and um, you know some of the folks from the exam school community to be on that as well as some civil rights leaders from the community to be on it. We didn't want it to get too large um, at, um, for the group. I don't know if you wanna add anything, Mr. Chair. Right, um, this group came together very quickly and uh, the superintendent and I worked closely on um, trying to get together a, a representative group of members that were um, well-versed in uh, the history of the exam schools and the policies and um, uh, policies with respect to admissions, as well as the work that has gone into um, reviewing uh, the exam school admissions criteria over the decades. Um, and we wanted this group to get together uh, and start working quickly. Uh, so that group's um, been named, it's been tasked, they've already met. Uh, and they continue to, they will continue to meet weekly and they have a short time frame to get us uh, focused uh, recommendations on how to deal with um, the admissions criteria for um, the current year. So we're very helpful um, uh, for this work um, to uh, proceed uh, quickly. Uh, we're very proud of um, the group that we have here. We've got um, two exam school uh, heads of school. We've also got a head of school uh, from outside of the exam schools. And I wanna thank Dr. Coleman for that recommendation. We were able to get out, go out and find ourselves a, uh, a, a school leader that uh, sends a high number of students from across the spectrum uh, to the exam schools. Uh, and we have a number of representatives from the parent um, uh, community as well as um, community advocates. And I wanna thank uh, in particular um, 
Ms. Tanisha Sullivan, the head of the Boston branch of the NAACP for um, agreeing to serve on this group and uh, bring with her her associate, uh, Mr. Matt Krieger, who has uh, worked on this issue for quite a bit over the years. Um, but to my question about whether a student representative, can that, can that still be considered uh, to add a student, some BSAC representation, an alum, some a student rep could be very, uh, very helpful? Well, we agree that our students are um, very insightful, but as I mentioned, this uh, group has already begun meeting. Uh, they've been uh, working in earnest. They have a very short time frame to do this work. And with, they've been picked for the fact that they have done this work before. They're not starting from scratch. None of the folks that are part of this group are starting from scratch. And so uh, we've asked them to um, do a great deal of work in a very short amount of time. And so that's why uh, we have the, uh, the group that's um, working here today. Okay, and just one last question on the same issue. Um, is there a particular deadline that they have to submit like their recommendation as to whether to suspend the test or whatever they recommend in terms of admissions? Is there a deadline that we should be expecting the committee report or something from the group? Uh, Superintendent, I believe you mentioned in your um, September. In your opening in yeah, September. It's September twenty first or twenty second, I believe it is. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. O'Neill. Looks like you have some questions. It was more a comment uh, to you, let's see, okay. It's more a comment to you and the superintendent and, and reaction to what Dr. Rivera was saying. So um, we did talk about this at the last meeting and um, thank you for actually listening to the concerns of the members. So I think, as you said, it was Dr. Coleman who said, we should really have a school leader outside of the uh, three exam school leaders. Um, and I do note, by the way, that the two exam school leaders are also alumni of the school um, and uh, parents in the Boston public school system. And then, uh, uh, excuse me, um, Ms. Garrett, I, I assume will be a parent in a couple of, she is a parent now, but I assume her uh, daughter will be old enough to be a, a Boston public school student in probably two more years. I do know that Dr. Freeman Wisdom um, has children in the district as well. And so, and then having Pastor Sam Acevedo, who is co-chair of the Opportunity Achievement Gap Task Force, which really called the question to us, right? So I thank Dr. Coleman and Dr. and Ms. Robinson for their work on that and, and kind of pushed us to call the question to think differently about it for this coming year. So I'm looking forward to this group who uh, bring very, very different viewpoints to the table and, and very, very long history of working on this issue to the table and to see how they can think differently about how we approach it in this year in light of COVID, in light of some of the research that's come to bear, some of the failings of folks on uh, different sides of the table here will be interesting to see their recommendations. So I, I look forward to the output of that committee, but um, uh, it, it would always be nice to have a student on it, of course, but I, I assume you're also striving to have an odd number, which is nine and very short time frame. So I appreciate the, a variety of, of voices that you brought to the table there, uh, Superintendent and Mr. Chair. I've muted myself, uh, excuse me. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. O'Neill. And um, let me look, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Robinson, you've got a question. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for your report, Superintendent. I have two questions about, one about tech. Um, I'm happy to hear that we're getting more um, laptops for, for students that did not get them previously. Will students, two questions, did the graduating students have to return their laptops back to the district? They did. And they did. Okay. And then the other question is, um, will the, the, the computers that children have now be checked and updated and other things uh, before we launch into the new school year? I've heard about some that have fallen or cracked and other things to making sure that they are ready. However, um, they will be utilized. Yes, that's a good question. So if they we, you know, we've got 20,000 new uh, Chromebooks and we issued out 32,000 of them. So some of them were used that we had to issue once we ran out of the 20,000. 
Um, and so we do have additional computers that we have ordered. And so if you have a used one and it's un not working, you will return that to school and we will give you a new one. Okay. And then my other question is about the curriculum. I'm happy to hear that there will be some more review of the um, English language arts curriculum. Um, moving forward, given that um, at, with the equity analysis and also some of the issues around the decolonized curriculum, et cetera, is there an overall district curriculum working group that is both working and reviewing what we are currently using across the board in curriculum as well as hoping to identify and you know, recommend new curricula that can be um, you know, activated across you know, very many different um, topics that we're using in teaching. Yeah, as you can imagine, Ms. Robinson, this is a huge undertaking for us um, to really take an anti-racist lens to not only our curriculum, but our policies and our practices as well. Um, after George, George Floyd's murder, we uh, have a whole new heightened awareness and concern and drive and new imperative to really do this deep level of work. And we will do that with our curriculum as well. Our academic team has the Excellence for All team that does a lot of this work already. And I know that our chief academic officer is going to have a renewed focus uh, with the bias review that we will be doing in the future for our curriculum materials. Yeah, okay, yes. And lastly, I just wanna thank you all for getting, so quickly getting the exam school work group up and running and definitely are looking forward to hearing the recommendations in September. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Um, before we move on to the vice chair, just want to make sure I, I didn't miss anyone else. Okay, uh, vice chair. Uh, thank you, chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sully, for the update. Um, Ms. Robinson stole a couple of my questions, but I'm glad they were answered. Um, I wanted to know about the computers. Um, if, it, if we uh, end up remote, if it will be possible for um, out-of-school time partners to be able to assist some families that have a really challenging time getting those um, Chromebooks, if, if we can figure that out? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. That would be great. Um, and then uh, I was just curious about, um, I know we talked um, a long time ago, it feels like, um, in, in April, um, we had mentioned uh, that some families were struggling trying to figure out the technology. So I'm, I'm just curious if we ended up um, having anything online, because we had, we had kind of played with having some kind of trainings where some families who maybe aren't as tech savvy and having it in different languages. Um, so you could kind of navigate like Google Classroom, et cetera, if that ended up happening. Yeah, um, Mark Racine, I'm not sure if he's on the call um, right now in the room to be able to answer, but I know that they were working on some of that. I know our parent university also did some work uh, out of our community advancement office, but this is an area that we know we have to do better. It was identified uh, in our surveys. Parents said they needed more help especially for parents who had multiple children in the home and just managing, you know, two to three different children on their learning platforms and the schedules and the routines. Um, so that's why a lot of parents have actually asked, asked if the students can be in the same A group or B group when we are doing hybrid, we just to eliminate some of the confusion. And then, you know, in our 33 transformation schools, we have the family liaisons now, and we're going to really be depending on them to help support of families, and then we also have that in our language um, uh, schools, schools that have over 50% one language. We gave them also a family liaison in order to help um, better uh, meet the needs of our families um, and their linguistic uh, needs. So Mark, I see popped on, so I'll let him talk a little bit about it. Yeah, every, everything you says is, is perfect. And then to add, we also partnered with the Office of English Language Learners to produce uh, translated technical help documents uh, in, in all of our languages, um, but that it needs to go farther. And so this summer we're gonna be making those documents and those resources into a visual uh, uh, representation of, of all of our tech tips. Uh, we also launched the family hotline, which is in multiple languages. Um, and then we plan to transition not just to pre uh, or, or self-guided uh, resources, but also live trainings through uh, the family department, excuse me, the uh, parent university. 
Okay. And one other thing, I don't know if you're aware of the resources that we had that were curated during remote learning time on the multilingual library. Mm -hmm. Yep. And some of the resources that we did with our partners at BNN as well with story time and and getting um, resources out in different in multiple languages. But this is something that we'll just continue to learn and continue to grow and continue to do outreach in. Um, thank you so much. Um, I did see the multilingual um, library. I thought it was great. So thank you. That was such a great start. Um, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to say congratulations to um, the award winners. And thank you so much for all your work. Thank you once again, Vice Chair. I want to loop back. Uh, Mr. Tran had a question and then uh, Mr. O'Neill had an additional question. Mr. Tran. Hi. Um, thank you for uh, having been uh, present with all, all members. I'm, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I would like to loop back to the uh, exam school entrance uh, test the issue regarding that, I, I, I understand that we now have a committee focusing on revising or making any kind of, or all kind of recommendations to, to the committee as well as to the superintendent about how to move forward uh, um, for the future. The question I have is, aside from equity, I understand equity is, is very important. Um, and as I uh, mentioned in my evaluation, equity, equity is, uh, 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 it de depends on different people, um, belief and, and definition. Um, what is the set criteria? Is there a set criteria that the committee must adhere to in order to evaluate the exam? Uh, can we have that, um, can, can we have that, 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 that syllabus? You know, the, the synopsis of the type of uh, criteria that they are going to use in, 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 in evaluating, you know, whatever the, the options out there regarding the test or any other kind of, um, uh, a, options you know to move forward i i like to see a a a, a set criteria uh, for them to evaluate and i like to see that if, if it is at, at all possible in addition to the issue of equity that, that that we have we all have concerns with well mr tran i think um it, it may have been lost in the shuffle with uh the uh, the volume of emails that we've all received this week uh on reopening um, but uh, I believe the superintendent or Ms. Sullivan or perhaps Mr. Consalvo sent an email a few days ago that included the, the roster of um, the members on the committee as well as that working group's charge. So um, if Ms. Sullivan's on the line, if she could find that uh, email at, at some point during this meeting and forward that to you with the working, uh, the working group's charge, I believe that'll answer your question. I have already reviewed that, that oh, you know, okay. all, all the emails. That oh, my apologies. Sent. No, 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 I'm, I'm, that's all right. What, you know, my, 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 uh, my, uh, my question is pretty specific. I mm -hmm. need to see, if at all, a list of criteria that they are going to use in order to come up with any kind of evaluation that they are making to us, in addition to the, the equity issue that we are all concerned with. And uh, the, 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 the thing that I received is very general. I need to see, okay, this is the area that they are going to look at, you know, regarding the test. This, mm -hmm. the, this is the concerns that are raised from the uh, community and how to address them. And, you know, I, I, I need to see, you know, the breakdown on the kind of specific criteria, if at all possible, that, that, that's my, my, my concern. Okay. Not not a general not a general um, uh, benchmark of okay these are you know, this is what we are going to do we're going to sit down we're going to talk about the test we, you know uh, the, uh, the equity is the issue and and um, black and brown people I'm a, I'm brown um, have been adversely impacted by the test 
and we'll look at it. Uh, there, there may be a consideration of affirmative action, let's say. I understand that. But I'd like to see something more concrete than just a general statement, if at all possible. Thank well, you. Of course, Mr. Tran and, and Superintendent, you might want to speak a little bit more to this on the equity tool that um, Ms. Roberts has brought to the, um, the working group and um, some of the um, considerations that are going into uh, looking at uh, demographic data across the city as well as um, the specific demographic data with recent admissions into these schools um, have been key considerations that have already been raised by uh, members of the working group and, and requests for data that they'd like to uh, review. Um, but what I would offer is, I think, you know, a lot of what you're asking for, Mr. Tran, respectfully, I think is is the actual work that the, the working group is being tasked to do. Um, this is uh, in large part an, an issue that's being given to this working group at this time, um, quite frankly, from a, a capacity um, perspective. You know, we've asked a, uh, for a tight timeline to address this um, key concern that's arisen um, as a result of the effects of COVID on our student body and uh, the specific uh, switch to remote learning in uh, the spring that uh, affected the, uh, um, uh, the GPA, the grades that are a key consideration in uh, exam school admissions. So um, I, I'll, I'll um, toss it to the superintendent if she wants to add anything um, further with respect to that tool, but um, I, I think a lot of what you're asking for is going to be um, the work that is the product of uh, the working group and we'll look forward to hearing from them on in, in a few short months. Yeah, uh, Mr. Tran, I have a question. There's going to be a number of criteria that they will use as they evaluate um, the recommendations and so that will be presented when they do bring it on the 21st and so that'll be looking at all kinds of data, student demographic data, we'll be looking at uh, previous test history data, previous academic uh, measure data, um, and a lot of the other recommendations that have been made prior from prior working groups and the, um, some other reports that have been uh, provided by working groups uh, before who have tried to tackle this issue. So um, that will all be available when they bring the recommendations forward in September. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tran. We'll go back to Mr. O'Neill now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to step outside our, our purview with school committee and, and bring up one issue of a, of a world event superintendent. You know, I know part of your heritage, you and I have talked about is, is part of your heritage is you are Lebanese. And um, as my fellow members know, uh, my wife is 100% Lebanese, having been raised in Beirut and moved here in middle school, immigrated to the US uh, due to the civil war in Beirut. And there's a substantial uh, Lebanese population in Boston, including in our schools. And obviously there was a horrific explosion yesterday that uh, dramatically uh, affected a country that was facing some pretty serious headwinds already due to economic and political instability, the uncertainties from COVID, a civil war right next door in Syria that has 2 million refugees in Lebanon and just uh, amazing what has happened to that country. And, you know, I personally spent all day on the phone yesterday with my wife's family here and in, in Lebanon. And I know all of our students who have Lebanese heritage and our teachers and our staff and our families, um, it's a very, very difficult time. And so <laughs> I just wanted to say that, um, you know, the, the Lebanese are wonderful people. They've had a lot thrown at them in life, but they're incredibly warm and generous and funny and generous to a fault and uh, family oriented and, and above all resilient. Um, but that country needs the world's love and support right now. And our students um, and our teachers and our staff and our parents and families who are of that heritage need our support as well right now. Yeah. Thank you, Michael, for bringing that up. That's, that's very true. Thank you as well, Mr. O'Neill. Boston certainly knows something about resi resiliency and um, certainly uh, I'm sure the, uh, the Lebanese people can use a little bit of our uh, um, love and compassion at this time as well. So uh, thank you for raising that and certainly thinking about um, the, uh, the Lebanese community in, in Boston and um, I know there's a quite a, a large community in, in my home neighborhood of West Roxbury uh, that are certainly suffering right now at, at the thought of uh, their family's loss um, 
we want to make sure that we, we, we bring that community close within, uh, within the uh, BPS family. So thank you for that. Um, just a uh, switching gears back to um, the recognition that um, uh, the superintendent uh, called out at the very beginning of her uh, superintendent's report. Um, I, I, I was so honored to hear that um, Mr. Uh, Yesayan was, um, was honored by the, uh, the Shattuck Award. And um, I think back to uh, the very beginning of our evacuation of the schools in March and the work that uh, the district did to uh, stand up a tech operation and ensure that um, 30,000 Chromebooks were distributed and um, the, uh, the needs of remote learning were, were provided for for both our students and our teachers. Uh, another, I think, 8,000 uh, Wi-Fi units were um, uh, were distributed to our students. All of that was certainly, uh, um, uh, and for good reason, uh, a lot of the praise around that was showered on people like Mark Racine and certainly um, our superintendent and our mayor for going out and getting uh, all of those units uh, available for our students. But so many other people took um, part in uh, the work that was done and that that spanned the, the entire district. Um, I know there were superintendents, uh, assistant superintendents who were driving around all across the city delivering 25 laptops at a time in the, in the trunk of their Corollas. Um, but um, certainly people like Jack um, did a lot of this work without, um, without the knowledge of uh, many in the public. And, you know, Mr. Yusayan actually delayed his retirement. I, I, I can't remember how long he was with us. It was either three or four decades, but it seems like forever. Um, to, to continue um, along and support the district uh, in its hour of need uh, in the spring and uh, on through the early part of the summer. And so that's the definition of a Shattuck Award uh, recipient, somebody who puts public service above uh, self and um, we're greatly indebted to him and, and we're so proud to see him uh, honored in the way that he was. And so thank you, uh, Superintendent, particularly for uh, calling that out and for all the folks within BPS that nominated and spoke out on behalf of uh, Mr. Yusayan in uh, his nomination. Um, I think that's all that I have for comments for now. I know uh, we, are, we do want to get the public comment. We also want to get to the uh, superintendent's um, presentation on uh, reopening. So without further discussion, I'll entertain a motion to uh, receive the superintendent's report as presented. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Is there a second? Second. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Any discussion or objection to that motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Dr. Coleman? <laughs> thank you. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lacanto. Yes. The report is passed unanimously. Very good, Ms. Sullivan. Thank you very much. And before we move on to uh, public comment, as I mentioned, we're going a little bit out of order with our reports tonight. Um, as uh, viewers will recall, at our last meeting, we asked the superintendent to give us a brief update on uh, the reopening plans of the district uh, during our superintendent's report. Uh, we've structured it a little bit differently this time to uh, have a, a full report given uh, on the agenda and, and prepare the, uh, the public for uh, that. Um, as the superintendent moves into her report, I just wanna give a couple of opening comments to uh, frame out the discussion. First of all, a number of you may have noticed um, some reports uh, in the Globe a little earlier this afternoon that were initially inaccurate. Um, that uh, report was uh, indicating that schools uh, within the district were going to be able to uh, choose whether to open or not. Um, that was inaccurate and that's been corrected. So I just wanted to make sure that folks that are watching at home, uh, as well as members of the committee who, have met, who may have seen that story uh, just briefly before joining the meeting, uh, understand that that's not the case. Uh, we are moving forward as a district, no matter what uh, we select. Um, I also want to note, you know, this is a point in time for us. Um, we understand, um, I'm a parent myself, and uh, a, a number of, uh, uh, actually a majority of our committee are parents, and we're all worried about uh, what school is going to look like for the fall for our students. We're getting very close to September 10th, um, but we also understand as, as district leaders that 
uh, we have a lot of work to go uh, to do, and we had a, have um, much distance to go before we reach a resolution on uh, whether or not to open uh, in person in a hybrid uh, capacity uh, and how to do so, and what are the preparations to do that. Nevertheless, um, we are moving forward with the planning, uh, and you'll hear that from uh, the superintendent in just a moment, the planning specifically for a hybrid approach to uh, instruction that um, uh, start of school remains September 10, and we continue to make great strides in moving toward uh, that planning. But nevertheless, this is a draft plan. The draft plan that was released to the state and released to the public yesterday uh, continues to be in development. And I think the thing that folks need to keep in mind most of all is that the work that the district is doing right now is completely dependent on what the public health guidance is. What is the current environment? Um, and where do we find the virus uh, within the district and within the city? And how does that affect uh, what our decisions will be for opening? We continue to be um, following the guidance of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to prepare a plan that is three-pronged that would allow us to fully reopen, which is not on the table right now, which would allow us to open in this hybrid model, or which would allow us to open fully remote. And the reason why that's uh, good practice is because we need to be able to quickly react to what the public health get, uh, data um, provides for us and what that tells us about uh, the health and safety of our families and our students and our, our teachers and staff uh, in our buildings. So we'll continue to pay uh, the utmost attention to what our public health partners are telling us. Um, I wanna rem remind folks as well, we did have a number of uh, people lined up tonight uh, for public comment that wanted to speak specifically on emails that we've been receiving this week about voting. This school committee does not take a vote on what model um, to uh, will be followed uh, with respect to opening uh, these schools. That is a decision for the superintendent. It's an operational decision, and she's going to be informed by what the public health data tells us. And so we want this conversation to focus on what are the plans that are um, that are occurring um, to get us ready for uh, whatever model we open in. And we wanna make sure that uh, we as committee members are voicing our opinions and providing the superintendent with the feedback that we are receiving from our, our fellow uh, neighbors and, and friends in the community. And finally, I do wanna note that um, because we're not taking a vote and because we're not um, making any decisions tonight, um, and because this work remains ongoing, I wanna remind our friends in the teachers union and, and in our other staff units that collective bargaining remains ongoing. Uh, the superintendent is at the bargaining table with the teachers union. She's at the bargaining table with, uh, she and her staff are at the bargaining table with all of our 12 uh, staff unions over the effects of what these models mean for reopening our schools. So we're not gonna make any decisions about that tonight. There's issues about terms and conditions of employment. That's gonna happen at the bargaining table and you've got representatives to, to make that argument for you. So before I go on any further, I wanna uh, hand it over to the superintendent. I know she's gonna be joined by uh, Ms. Tammy Poost, who's been leading uh, the, um, the charge on this uh, work and they'll have a short presentation for us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, you know, yesterday we gave you all a copy of the reopening draft plan. We have been working months on this plan um, in different components with central office staff, with our teachers, with our nurse uh, faculty senate, and um, with all of the professionals within the organization, as well as listening. We've held over, well, almost nearly, I think, 30 meetings with our community members to gather feedback. We've surveyed students, teachers, and families around what worked and what did not work in remote learning to better understand that. I held focus groups myself, five focus groups from May and through June uh, to talk to teachers from ESL teachers, special ed teachers, teachers at different grade levels so that we could uh, better understand remote learning and what were some of the successes and what were some of the things that we needed to shore up, shore up uh, for this fall uh, as we began to think about um, servicing our children in a, in a remote environment. Um, we also have recently released to you, like you said, a framework uh, on the 22nd uh, school committee meeting. We gave very high level talking about a hybrid model, a remote model, and an all in-person model required by the state. 
uh, to turn in by August 10th. Um, after that, July 22nd, we convened uh, on July 24th, our working groups of teachers, BTU members and school leaders in order to look at that framework and to better put some uh, like meat on the bones to, to give more depth to the, to the planning. They've been meeting now uh, over the past two weeks and will continue to meet this week on now this draft reopening plan and um, even give it even more eyes and, and, um, and effort and, and looking at our reopening plans. So I'm really, I'm really pleased with the amount of uh, engagement that we're getting into these draft plans, the amount of feedback that we are getting. Um, but I do also recognize that this all hinges on a safety first kind of frame uh, like you shared. We will not move forward with a plan uh, of in-person if we do not think it is safe to do so. We can't say it enough that this is a draft plan and it will continue to evolve and emerge. Just a week ago, um, the, the commissioner gave out two pieces of really critical information, one about transportation guidance, which was kind of late to come. Um, and then another piece that came out was the fact that there are a, a, an additional 10 days uh, potentially to do professional development, which could impact our calendar. And so the, the commissioner puts this guidance out there um, and then we have to work with our teachers and figure out what does that mean and what does that mean for staff in terms of the preparation that they have to and then how would that impact our calendar. So of course, these are like two pieces of guidance that just came and so these things continue to evolve and we do also know that the virus is uh, on the uptick for the state of Massachusetts. Therefore, we are watching that incredibly close uh, for the implications here in Boston so that we can make sure that we're paying attention to um, those rates and making sure that we're mindful of that and that we're communicating very clearly to the public that any decision to reopen will be one based on science. It will be done in collaboration with our city partners, Boston, Boston Health Commission and guidance from the state. And we're watching also what the governor might decide to do in terms of reopening and adjusting the DESE guidance for school districts. So with that, we have been looking at our operations. We've been looking at our facilities We've, I gave you a little bit of an update on our technology and some of the things we're doing with technology, as well as our uh, fixing of our air, air quality within our buildings, the cleanliness of our buildings, uh, the ordering of our uh, safety protocols, and then developing the protocols we'll need for our school leaders, our teachers, and our staff in their school buildings around professional development mm -hmm. for safety and also for the academic planning. And then uh, the final thing is really working with Monica Roberts and her team around what types of partnerships can we uh, engage in with our faith-based leaders, with our, um, with our Boston After School Beyond leaders and with our existing partners to uh, better meet the needs of students when they are um, in a remote environment so that they can stay engaged in their community. So, um, there's just a lot of complex moving pieces here that have to be considered from operations to transportation to facilities um, and to the professional development of our teachers and our, and our faculty um, and professional staff. So I'm going to let uh, Ms. Poost, who has helped us coordinate all of this um, effort, she has been like an air traffic controller keeping us all uh, in our lanes and now working more cross-functionally across the lanes to ensure that we're crossing our T's and dotting our I's. She has great expertise in administration, uh, great expertise in risk management, uh, and her legal mind on, on these documents has really helped us to uh, stay, stay to task. Um, she has been relying on the experts within those lanes, the central office team, as well as school leaders and teachers to inform the plans as we have been drafting all along and um, and then putting those in in the document. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to her and let her just give us a very brief update and then I'd be happy to take your questions and I'll take the easy ones and give the hard ones to Tammy. So uh, Ms. Poost, if you're on, um, we'll have you turn on your video and um, I think Dana is going to share the screen. 
Um, thank you. Uh, this is Tammy Poussin. I hope you can hear me. My video won't go on, at least on my end. It says unable to start video because the host hasn't done, the host has stopped it. So um, I'm happy to talk while you look at that cute picture of my dog. Um, in the, oh, here I am. In the meantime, I think um, Dana is ready to throw up the deck. Thanks. All right, and I know that we wanna do this really fast because really we'd rather take your questions and talk to you about things that you're interested in, not, um, not talk to you about things that you already know. But at a very high level, this is, again, we have a draft. Our draft plan came out yesterday. Next slide, Dana. I hope you've seen it. We sent it all to you directly. I hope that you um, are enjoying reading it. As you can see, even in the title line, it says draft one. And I know I've told you this before, but we have to have three plans a fully remote plan, a hybrid plan, and an all-in-person plan. And our, we need to file them with DESE next Monday on the 10th. Next slide, please. These are the public health requirements that I talk about all the time. And I know it's repetitive, but it's important for everyone to understand that these are the guardrails within which we are building the plan. We Everything that we're doing with regard to both um, anything in person, whether it's everybody at some point in time or some part of us at, at an earlier point in time, everybody will be held six feet apart and um, rooms will be arranged to make sure that that's available. Everyone will have masks on. One student per bench is the guidance right now that we are following. As you know, that means that we can only get half the number of students on our buses, which means we need to figure out how to get kids to um, our schools in a different way, given that we can't um, simply route the buses in the same way we did before. We can't do, serve food in cafeterias, but we can serve food and we will be serving food. We have made um, new protocols for how buildings are cleaned, for how buses are cleaned and sanitized between AM and PM routes and also between um, uh, overnight. And we've got protocols in place that our school nurses are following with regard to if anybody shows up in a building that's either symptomatic or um, reports exposure. All of that is also based on, as, as I know I've explained before, the fact that we are really partnering directly with our families to do home health screens before anybody is sent to a school building or put on a school bus. And as the superintendent mentioned, we will not be opening our school buildings without the guidance from the Boston Public Health Commission and other public health entities that say it is safe to gather um, groups of people together. And we are watching very closely right now the metrics in the Commonwealth and specifically in the city of Boston, um, because that is going to be um, the determinative factor on whether or not we and, and when we can safely open our buildings. Next slide. These are the facts that I need everyone to also understand. First of all, you all have that draft. I know it's long. I think it's 62 or four pages, I'm not sure. I know that's long, but it's long because it contains a lot of information and it really does scoop up everything that we have been working to put in front of all of our school leaders and our union partners to make sure that they know everything that we know so that we can share that with people and now get better ideas and make sure that we can make a better plan in draft two. So there has been no final decision made by the Boston Public Schools as to whether we will open remotely or in a hybrid model on the first day of school. That decision has not been made because that decision is made by science. And we are waiting and watching what the science is telling us. And frankly, um, we may not know that by the time that we file this plan with DESE on August 10th, because that is already a month away from the beginning of school. And we will simply be watching to make sure with the advice from the um, Boston Public Health Commission um, to, to make sure that we are staying within the guardrails of what's safe. If it's not safe, because the metrics say it's not safe, we won't be bringing anyone back into buildings. We also know that if we had made a decision in our first draft, or even if we make one on Friday, or if we make one two weeks from now, that decision will change if the science changes. So as the virus changes, as the community metrics change, our decisions will change with regard to whether or not we're opening fully remote or with some kids in buildings. We are not making that decision alone. We're not making it in a cubicle somewhere. We are making it directly in conversation now with the entire community and specifically with our union partners. We acknowledge that the draft hybrid that is defined in the document, in the plan that you all have, is not perfect. 
it is the best ideas that we could bring to bear today as of or as of yesterday and we've gotten other ideas today and we will continue to change this plan you'll see another draft sometime this um, later this weekend or on monday and you'll probably see drafts after that as well because we are trying to come up with what works exactly right for the community of boston and the community of boston is changing as the covid virus changes and then the last bullet again is no matter what the decision is that decision will very likely change. It will change if the public health metrics change. Now, maybe we will get very lucky and all of a sudden COVID will evaporate and be gone from our world. That would be wonderful. But if that does not happen throughout this school year, we will be continuing to monitor those metrics and the decision will change if in fact the metrics change as to what is safe in terms of gathering students and staff in school buildings. Next slide. So these are the guardrails for how it is we're again deciding. First of all, still, no matter what decision is made, whether the district decides that it should open fully remote or it should open in a hybrid model, all parents are being contacted and asked if they want to opt out and simply have their children stay fully remote. That is a, a um, decision that every family will get to make and that we will honor and make happen. We'll also be at the same time when we're asking our parents to make that first decision, we'll need to ask them to, to decide whether or not they're gonna use bus transportation because we need to know how many families are opting out of our buses so that we can better route the buses to the students who actually are opting in to go to school. Again, if and when we get there, if the public health metrics tell us it's safe. If, if the public health metrics say it's perfect, not perfectly safe. If the public health metrics stay within the guidelines set by the Boston Public Health Commission, which continue to change over time, but if they stay within the safety range, we would be able to open um, in a hybrid model. If they do not, we will open in a remote for all model. I know I've said that five different ways, uh, but I do that purposely so that everybody who's listening, even to just some parts of it, understands we can't make a decision yet. We need to see, see what public health does, what, what the metrics do. And if it's safe, we'll find a way to come back in a hybrid model. If it's not safe, we will not. Next slide. We've talked a lot about the hybrid model that is defined in the plan. It's an alternating model where students are divided into cohorts. Um, so on the left side of your screen, you'll see um, four different rows. That bottom row, group D, that is um, students who decide to stay fully remote because their parents chose, chose that for them. Okay, so they're fully remote. Now go back up to group A and group B. Group A and group B have decided, their families have decided not to go fully remote, but will go hybrid if in fact you can tell us that the public health metrics are safe to do that. And if so, we will then divide kids into group A and group B. Um, group A kids will come two days a week to learn in person and learn at home three days. Same with group B and they will alternate the days. You can see that A is there Monday and Tuesday, B is there Thursday and Friday. Nobody's in the buildings on Wednesdays. Buildings are cleaned on Wednesdays to make sure all germs from one group are out before the other comes in. And also you can see buildings are cleaned again on the weekends to make sure that um, germs from the last group are out before the next one comes back. We've added a line, group C, and, and just let me explain tiny uh, amounts of what that is about. We understand that there are some of our students, some of our learners, who may need more than two days of in-person learning. We are open to trying to figure out how to make that happen. We will need to decide first how many are in group D, so they opted out altogether, and therefore we have some available space and then maybe we could give some of that extra available space to some kids, which would then become group C in that they are there more than two days. That is very dependent on all the other choices that families make. We cannot start with um, everyone choosing group C. It's something we have to do after um, each domino falls. So once group, once students opt out, then once students decide to be in A and B, then we'll be left with can we put people into group C and if so, where. The illustration on your right is, you've seen this before, I hope it's, this one's a little clearer. It's to, intending to illustrate how a classroom in this alternating hybrid model could work. 
the different colored desks, you'll see they're blue and sort of orange. Imagine that the blue desks are group A desks. So on group A days, those blue desks are filled, but the orangish desks are not, those are empty. And that is how we can keep our students six feet apart because while the desks themselves may be three feet apart, the students, because there's an empty desk between, the students are six feet apart. We've also tried to mark that in fact, we'll, we're making sure the rows are six feet apart and that they're six feet uh, between the teacher and uh, the first row students. With that, my very last slide is um, the email address that we are asking you and everyone in the public who is listening to this presentation who has thoughts, expertise, questions, ideas, anything to share with us that you think would be a positive addition which would help us make this plan better, here's an email. Please send it in to us. We're gathering all of that input and you'll see that reflected in the second draft. And with that, um, I will um, step back and the superintendent can answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Poost, and uh, thank you, Superintendent, for uh, keeping us informed and up to date on all the good work that you and your colleagues are doing. Uh, I want to uh, open up the floor now to members for questions and comments. Please uh, use the raise hand uh, button if you'd like to uh, speak, or it looks like uh, Lorna, uh, Dr. Rivera, excuse me, you're waving at me, so we'll start with you. Sorry, I couldn't figure the button. I think Ms. Ro did Ms. Robinson want to go before me? No, go ahead. Are you fine? Please. Thank you. Okay, so I did read the 63-page report, <laughs> hey. um, whoo, uh, but um, I did have just a couple, I mean, a couple of questions about, um, again, it says in the report that COVID testing would not be required for initial return. And, um, you know, as a social scientist who've done research on COVID and a member of the city's uh, health inequities task force, um, I just don't understand that recommendation. Um, where that, you know, we're talking about this being based in science. Um, could you explain that part, why COVID testing would not be required for initial returns? You're on mute, Tammy. You're on mute, Tammy. Nope. Try one more time. There you go. Am I here now? Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yes, we are not requiring in this draft plan, we are not um, recommending that all students and or all staff be either temperature tested when they come into buildings or that they have to show a positive or a negative COVID test. And here's why. It is grounded in the science. The science research that we are relying on as advised by the Boston Public Health Commission is that because testing right now, um, the amount of time it takes to get a test result, you could ask everyone to get tested 10 days before you start on the school day, or you could test them all the day that they're coming into the school building, but you couldn't get the results. And so then you couldn't actually let anyone in because there isn't any, re way to get the test results immediately like that. And, and with regard to temperature testing, while that was recommended about six to eight weeks ago, again, as everything changes, now the public health guidance universally throughout um, the CDC and every, every other state that is advising both DESE and the other um, state regulators that advise in the other states for public education are not advising temperature testing because there are such a high percentage of people who have no temperature symptomology associated with the disease, and therefore you give the public assurances that, that are really false. Because the fact that I don't have a temperature does not mean that I'm not exposed or that I don't have other symptoms or that I might not carry the virus. And so instead, what we were advised to do and what most public um, educational systems are doing is relying on a home health screen that is very detailed. It isn't sort of, um, don't send your student to school today if you think they're ill. They go through a set of symptomology that has again been developed not just by the Boston Public Schools nurses, but approved by the Boston Public Health Commission. And frankly, it is what every employee of the Boston Public Health or the Boston Public Schools has been doing since we entered back into buildings in like June. Every one of us has to do this home health screen 
before we are allowed to come into our own buildings because we too have a responsibility to not be coming to the workplace and exposing our colleagues. So I understand there's different views on that. That's the advice we have right now from the um, Public Health Commission. And so that's um, what is reflected in the plan. Can you clarify, can you clarify uh, Tammy, if a, if a child is sick, um, what happens then? I think sure. that, that that's a good clarification piece though. Yes, we have protocols in place where, first of all, if, if a, a child is in the building and um, appears to be sick or says they feel sick, teachers or any other adult can send them to the nurse's office. Every school will have a nurse. Every school has a nurse's office where there is now nobody else in the nurse's office. That was not always true. So that we can actually contain people in rooms. There's also isolation rooms identified in every school. And that's where a child that is suspected of being um, COVID symptomatic will be taken to the isolation room. Then our nurses have protocols with regard to evaluating and, in, in, and um, with regard to then calling parents and getting the child picked up and taken home. I wanna be clear, we're not expecting to put a child on a yellow bus and have our bus drivers and monitors exposed to anybody who we might believe is potentially symptomatic. We continue to work with Boston um, Children's and other healthcare providers in the community to try to set up a mobile testing unit that would come to schools. But until we have that, what is linked in the plan is an actual interactive map to all the free testing centers that are available in Boston, including with um, identification of which ones take um, people under age 14 and which ones do not. Um, and so we're continuing to work on that because we understand that again, not everybody has the ability to um, transport their kid. I'm sorry, I can hear my dog. Um, but we're continuing to work with the healthcare community in Boston to try and make sure that we would have testing sites available to come to us. But in the meantime, we have protocols in place to get people to where the testing sites are. Just two more questions. Um, about the Wednesdays, um, a couple of teachers have contacted me about whether teachers need to be in the buildings on Wednesdays. I know the buildings will be clean, that the students in the, hype, in the hopscotch model would not be in, are just the buildings gonna be vacant on Wednesdays or are teachers also are gonna be expected to be in the buildings on Wednesdays? This is an item we are discussing with our unions at the bargaining table, but right now our expectation is that teachers will be in the buildings on Wednesdays because one of the things we've heard is they have a huge need to do collaborative planning and um, administrative work time where they do that in groups and together. And so that is, um, an, an, that is what's reflected in the plan right now. Obviously, um, we too have heard from our teachers that have different views about that and we're continuing to discuss that with them. I'm sorry, I just don't see how a building can be fully clean when there's going to be individuals in the building. So, um, but you know, I just, that's a real concern um, I, you know, my last point is really, um, you know, as a parent, um, I really am concerned. I know I can't vote on this, but I would highly recommend that we, I really fully support a remote learning for all. Um, I, I've, I know the data, Latinx communities are on the rise, um, while the numbers for Blacks, Black, you know, African Americans have are, are going down. Um, the Latinx numbers in East Boston are the highest in the in the city. Um, so there, this is, again, I, I'm not saying something you haven't heard, but I want to go on the record that I fully support a remote learning plan for all. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Rivera. I appreciate all of your questions and um, your uh, certainly your views as a, a researcher and a parent in our system. Um, I did um, just want to go back for a moment. You asked about um, the symptom checking, and I uh, wanted to note for folks at home that might be watching, uh, you could take a look at buoyhealth.org. Um, that's uh, B-U-O-Y. Uh, that's the uh, Symptom Checker Act that the, uh, the city has been using and also recommending uh, free for uh, use for uh, members of the public who might want to check their symptoms before going to take one of the free tests. Um, you can find that on the Public Health uh, Commission's website and on the city's website as well. Um, and that might help give some context to, uh, I don't know if Bowie is necessarily going to be what the symptom checker will be that we'll use for 
BPS, but certainly it's indicative of the types of questions that um, we'll be asking of students and of teachers. Uh, and frankly, a lot of us that are going to work every day are uh, answering um, you know, through one app or another, or one questionnaire or another uh, prior to entering buildings. So thank you again for raising that, Dr. Rivera. We're gonna go next to uh, Dr. Coleman. Great, Th thank you for the attention and you know, incredibly difficult task. I don't know, as we know, you have to go through this process and there's no way to guarantee what's coming out. So I appreciate the, the data-driven approach that you're, you're taking and know that um, it's gonna be very hard on all of us when we're gonna have to make massive adjustments on the fly because we, we, we're out of control and that chaos is frightening. But I wanna thank you for creating a document that at least gives us a starting point, kind of a dock in the storm from which we know we can go and adjust. So I appreciate, I appreciate how difficult that is, how incomplete that is, but how uh, important it is for us to have this. So I wanna thank you for that. So I have a couple, um, two questions, a little bit uh, probably specific and maybe two uh, um, micro and then uh, one larger uh, question. Um, that, and so the, the first two are probably to uh, Ms. Pust and the larger one is to uh, the superintendent. So the first one, so on page 33 under classroom school uh, this, um, closure, um, it says with the superintendent, um, and this will come up again in the evaluation process, uh, you know, we, as a, as a committee, we're deeply concerned with how overwhelmed uh, the superintendent's job is and how many small things are not, not, not in unimportant, but small items that she ends up having to have her attention drawn to. So in my world, I would prefer that to say either superintendent's office or superintendent's designee. So it'll be superintendent, the office, or designee. So that's something that could be, um, uh, someone else can give them the authority and responsibility to make that decision so that, um, you know, as, as, as uh, our previous president said, you can only make a, so many good decisions in a day. So he, the only decision he made each day is what color tie he would wear because uh, the clothes were all the same every day. So I think in that spirit, that, that'd be an area that I would recommend some just, just structural changes because I think at the end of the day, if the superintendent is not making a decision, that could have ramifications that are unfortunate and then forcing you to make all those decisions, I think can have a, 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 an in that, uh, unintended consequences for us as well. So that's one idea. Um, the second on page 37, and this truly is coming out of a, a very different space. It says on visitors, I know a lot of people in my world and higher ed world is going through this, are very concerned about the student teachers and, and the other, uh, power for the training and that and that conversation and I am, and that's not a that's an important but not urgent issue but uh, I know there are a lot of people particularly as other schools are opening up around the city as well that that's a big concern and, and figuring out who to turn to on that uh, would be shouldn't should then not to be in this document now but that is a question people are coming up so those are two uh, relatively minor issues um, the, the bigger issue is um, and I, and I understand why it's not in this document now, but I think it's very important in the next iteration of this conversation is to hear um, how we're gonna build in, how we're gonna take in all this data. We talked about assessments. We talked about um, uh, we, uh, the medical piece. I'm not gonna, the, 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 the response to the pandemic I think is clear, but the learning issues about how when we're not getting the outcomes we uh, desire or think are important and possible. It, I would love to see uh, what is, how are we gonna collect that data? How's it gonna be interpreted? And what's the response cycle? So it's not in this document. We talked about the data you wanna collect and the assessment process, which I thought, thought uh, it's very difficult. You know, we, can, we, can, we know we can argue forever about assessments and what's good, what's useful, how many, how little. I don't wanna open up that can of worms now, but how it's being used to drive decisions, I would not now, uh, but would like to have more specificity on, because I think that's where the devil in our details about continual improvement is about that cycle. So when you get the information, who's getting it, how it's gonna be acted on, and how do we know that's happening? And then 
since we as a committee don't want to be involved in the micro piece, we're more, I'm more interested in the system piece. So that was more of a statement than a question. So Dr. Caselius, if you want to find a question in what I was saying, I'd love I'd to be hear glad it. To, I'd be glad to address some of that, Dr. Coleman. Um, we started in our remote learning plan, the first one, a couple of accountability measures. One was to provide uh, formative and interim assessments to our students. Mm -hmm. Then also to develop an MTSS framework, multi-tiered systems of support framework. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then also to ask school leaders to do two things, to create student support teams, to develop student success plans for students who were not engaged or mm -hmm. who were not um, learning at the levels that we wanted them to based on multiple evidence, teacher report, mm -hmm. parent report, um, evidence from assessments or mm -hmm. evidence from other professionals, and then to work on their student support teams to develop these student success plans. We wrote about 27,000 student success plans um, and um, then had used those also to invite for summer school uh, invitations. We also had another level of uh, accountability around our data. So for instance, we got information about the Chromebook distribution mm -hmm. and we knew from our um, reach out to parents around Chromebooks who did and did not have a Chromebook. We then gave that to our school leaders and asked them to work with their equity roundtables, which we had for the first time created at each school to take a problem of practice, to look at data, to look at their dashboards around their attendance, around their student success plans, around their any, any data that we give, and then to work as a community to uh, try to shore up wherever there were shortages. So mm -hmm. we'll still continue that into the next school year as promising practices. We'll mature that and give more training to our school leaders around their equity roundtables and around student support teams and around MTSS frameworks in order to do quick interventions with students. We also will be requiring this uh, use of uh, interim assessments mm -hmm. and that data will be both public and also given to schools um, and we'll have that available as well as what we do traditionally which is you know report cards and progress reporting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great thank you that's very exciting so just, um, just and, and and I hope this I'm not I hope I'm not getting too close into operations and sticking at the policy level so but how as we collect that data and go through the, how will we know it's working? And when it's not working, how will change be driven? So we will know because the indicators will tell us whether students are mm -hmm. on or off track. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we will be able to work through our school superintendents to give them that data and work with the school leaders in order to monitor those uh, student success team um, processes, as well mm -hmm. as the student success plans, which are going to be entered into a whole new data system called Panorama, which yeah. we will be requiring of our school dis school um, leaders to use. Great. So it'll be aggregate. The regional superintendents will get it at, at, at each right. school at aggregate level, and so they'll be able to make some quick uh, interpretation and bring that back to the supervision of the principals, and then and then that will that. Great. Thank you. That's, that's very right. helpful. That, that, I love that. And that's so, a system of accountability, Dr. Coleman, that we have not had before. That's right. That that's we right. piloted during we piloted with the school leaders during mm -hmm. remote learning number for our first phase mm -hmm. of that, mm -hmm. and then now we will continue to provide more additional and deeper training in those frameworks and those tech tools so that we have them and then they feed up to a larger dashboard that we'll be looking at at the district level with the school superintendents. Oh, great. So, and, and, and yes, I agree we haven't that before. So it's, I'm really excited to hear that then the regional superintendents will be uh, the place in which that will be aggregated in a way to work in their, uh, to use in their supervision of the principals. That's very helpful and um, I'm very excited to see how that works. Uh, one last, and I'll just use the word one more time, uh, mastery learning. We had this disaster of the pandemic. We have kids going to be all over the map. And when we start talking about scope and sequence and somewhat, somewhat traditional academic language, I just, I just hope that there's people who are still thinking about how do we assess kids for mastery and redo. Uh, you know, I'm clearly uh, uh, on the, in the group that believes that continued grade oriented scope and sequence uh, may not be working for us anyway, let alone this pandemic. 
And so I know that uh, um, super, Assistant Superintendent Zayas was talking about integrating mastery learning, and I'm looking forward to see that language appearing in our reports. I know not now, but I'm, you know me, I like to think that kind of, you know, around, I'm looking around the corner for us. So great. Thank, but thank you. This is very helpful. And thank you for your time. We have developed a standards-based uh, scope and sequence uh, to be mm -hmm. followed as well as um, competency-based uh, mm -hmm. measures. Good, good. Looking forward to see how that works out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. We'll move on now to uh, Ms. Robinson. Thank you. I want to thank you both for this amazing amount of very difficult work that you've been doing. I have a couple of questions. Um, around health and safety, knowing that's our most critical issue around just beginning the thoughts of coming back. Um, you talked about that we will have all of these protocols around cleaning, et cetera. Um, will we be increasing greatly our maintenance staff? Because I realized that you know, in a regular school day, things didn't always happen. And now everybody is gonna be hyper aware of spills, smells, you know, windows not opening, all of those kinds of things. You know, who is going to actually help us to make sure all of our buildings are really ready to um, accept students so that teachers and families really do feel comfortable and trust that these environments will be safe? Well, we, you know, we have a, a bunch of new custodians that will be joining our teams uh, to work on the cleanliness uh, issues. And then uh, some of the safety issues we talked about with some of the protocols that we have with the health checker and the nurse protocols that they'll have around uh, our students. And then, you know, we've measured off the six feet of distance in the classrooms and the wearing of masks. And we'll be counting on our wonderful teachers to help us with uh, compliance around those measures. And it'll be a whole community, you know, if there's not soap in the dispenser, we're gonna really ask everybody as a whole village to come together and make sure there's soap in the dispenser. Um, Tammy, do you have additional things? I know that they're fixing some of the windows. I know that some of there's been some concern about windows that you open and they slam down really hard. So um, you know the fixing of the windows so that you know they're they're safe as well. I can have additional. I'm sorry. I'm just saying you have additional things. Go ahead and add them. Sure. Um, so we have made sure that all of the uh, there's a scheduled upgrade of all the filters that in the schools that have mechanical systems. There aren't many. There's only 30 some. Um, and they've done an audit of all of the windows, whether or not they open and will stay open or not. Um, and are um, quickly working through a scheduled repair that will easily be done before um, whatever the start date is. Um, I think there's something that we also just don't keep in mind, and that is that we are not coming back on any model that has everybody in the building. So we'll have at the most half of our students in the building at one time, which doesn't answer the question, but it will be easier to keep up and keep the cleanliness with half of the people in the building than it used to be. Um, but our custodians have um, upgraded the work that they've done and they've had been working with uh, people from other city departments as well to make sure that they are really hitting the highest quality standards and making sure that all of that is scheduled to actually be done. And um, we have linked as much of that as we could in this version of the plan. Although again, as that changes, we'll continue to link those in as well. Yeah. I think one other thing, uh, Ms. Robinson, is the principals will soon be back in their buildings. If they're not already in, in their buildings, they'll be also doing walkthroughs and they'll be doing those walkthroughs with their nurses and with their teachers and, and bringing to our attention anything that does need to be fixed or corrected so that uh, we can have our eyes on the ground as well. I know that Sam DePina, our chief mm -hmm. operation officer, has been sending me pictures and has a file of um, all of the pictures of, of the building so that I can uh, check on their readiness and has a readiness checklist for every single school. Mm -hmm. I know every fall we have issues when it is become 70 and 80 degrees outside and we have students and teachers re returning to schools that have no air conditioning, um, concerns about airflow, ventilation, and how are you gonna ask people to be in the classroom with no air conditioning and keeping a mask on for seven hours? Uh, we certainly agree that that's difficult. I, I don't know about you, but it's difficult for me to keep a mask on for seven hours out in the heat. 15 um, minutes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. On, on the other hand, on. we don't have a choice about that. So we have to keep them on. 
and it simply isn't possible to retrofit 100 or 90 some buildings that have no air filtration systems or put in air conditioning in every one of the buildings. Um, and be because we can all acknowledge what we can't do, we've had to pivot to what can we do. And what we can do is ensure that there are no spaces in our buildings being used for student gatherings or student instruction that do not have outdoor airflow, by, which basically is windows open and doors open so that outdoor air can get in. We are looking now at how many fans we have or don't have and what, how can we supplement that. That really has to be done on a building by building basis uh, because we can't simply tell that by looking at blueprints. Um, but as this plan came out, now the next step is a template goes to all school leaders and they are walking through their buildings and not just with their nurses and their, um, uh, their school leads and everybody, but we're hoping the parent council is involved. We're hoping that their lead custodian is involved so that everybody who has a, a piece to play in keeping our kids and staff safe is working on the same team. Okay. My other question moves more to program. Um, I know that, you know, when I look at this model, I look at, you think, well, all students are the same in a classroom and we know that's not true. We have many, many inclusion classrooms. We have other aides and other people who are in and out of classrooms support individual students. Um, I'm not sure if you could give me sort of a, a day in the life of a teacher who is teaching in hopscotch with her kids here and there and is an inclusion classroom. What does that look like and how does this, and who are the people? I shouldn't say maybe it's one teacher or maybe there are other assistants. Who's helping whom? Who's helping the kids in the room? Who's who are on IEPs at the same time as kids who are trying to do this virtually? Maybe some of them are also on IEPs and putting their questions in the chat and a teacher is talking to a group in front of her. How does all of this come together? Because it boggles my mind. So I would love yeah. someone. It boggles, it boggles all of but our minds. Is there anybody who's actually doing this or has done this anywhere in the country that's videotaped it so we could see what it looks like because I'm having a very difficult time imagining it or, or putting myself in the shoes of that teacher and what this could look like. I know how hard they work just to do virtual with kids half sleeping and doing all other kinds, but to have a group in front of me and a group virtually with a variety of needs, help me. Yeah, so this is hard for all of us um, and so it's hard for it, whether you're in the remote, obviously we know that that didn't work perfectly well uh, in remote and it certainly is going to be also challenging uh, in person. Just being six feet apart is a big enough challenge, right? <laughs> uh, Robinson, you know, uh, you think about those early childhood classrooms that you love so much and our Montessori classrooms where they use manipulatives and imaginative play as part of their uh, learning and all of the teachers out there who have said, oh my goodness, I've worked two decades to try to not be in rows anymore and to do project-based mm -hmm. lessons and Socratic seminars. And, um, you know, so it is it is going to be quite challenging. It's going to look different, but I don't think it's impossible. So I think about if I were a third grade teacher, I would gather my children, the ones that I have in front of me as well as the ones I have virtually and I would host a morning meeting like I typically would bringing them to the carpet but you can't do that obviously with the six feet of distance but you can virtually in the zoom room and create the sense of community and connectedness that you do and then I would move into um, a math lesson that maybe I taped over the weekend um, so that children could see the math lesson and they'd watch the video of me teaching and then I might throw them into the Zoom uh, meeting rooms where they're in small groups or they're in a pair share and they're working one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, with one another. And then I might come back as a large group in the Zoom again uh, with the whole entire class, both those virtually and in person. And then after that, I might take a break from the screen and we might uh, do a sing-along um, in, in person. And that might be a similar mm -hmm. sing-along that they might just do at home with a parent or a sibling. And then I might take more of a break and have uh, lunch or a snack and then go outside and do play or an outdoor activity for recess and do some sort of movement and then come back as a whole group and reconvene after that again. 
and then do another uh, directed lesson. If, if it's an inclusionary classroom, this might be a time when they get additional one-on-one -on -one services from a resource teacher or a different uh, teacher providing some additional one-on-one -on -one, or a paraprofessional might work with them on one-on-one, -on -one, either in person or also on the Zoom, depending on how that's staffed and how they work that out at the school level. Um, and then I might um, take a few hours to work on a project um, and that could be either done in group project or a, a different project for kids. So, I mean, there are ways to, to do it and, um, and to, you know, and, and then you could also um, potentially have opportunities for place-based learning uh, where they can uh, go to the museum and do a scavenger hunt if, if it's open and some other uh, different types of activities. So it's really going to take the creativity of our teachers thinking about how to mix in independent practice, um, small group practice, guided practice, and then practice with uh, uh, other professionals and specialists like an art teacher, a PE teacher, and how they schedule those days. And that's why it's really important that teachers yeah. uh, get back in the classrooms and they um, mm. learn from one another what's working. We know that there were lots of success this summer in Boston After School and beyond and some of our partners. I know Dr. Rivera was telling me about how her child is uh, really engaged in the summer learning as well as um, uh, other, other folks who have given me really great examples. So mm -hmm. we're just gonna have to learn and grow as we go. There'll be things we do and we'll, we will, you know, new technologies that we use that maybe won't work that we'll end up throwing out and saying that didn't work. Uh, but we'll learn as we go, get better. Yeah, and that and this will all will really depend on having spectacular technology and technology that works both in our classrooms as well as hopefully everybody who is home on Zoom. Because and we all know that, that that sometimes doesn't work either. Right. So my, yeah. So my 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 fear for teachers is how much of their time will be spent on logistics of just trying to get everybody all on the same platform, same page, particularly the younger students. You know, my hope is that middle school and above, they've got this better down. But I really worry about our second to fifth graders who are still learning the tools um, about, you know, the balance of the logistical part of it and how much real teaching gets to happen and gets to happen continuously. Because, you know, I know last year you were all about bringing in the joy, et cetera. And now the question is, where will we find the joy? <laughs> and how can we make sure it still is joyful in this very, very changed environment? Yeah, and that's a really critical yeah. piece with the arts. You know, lots of districts mm -hmm. are getting rid of their art teachers or lessening their arts programming and, and we are not, we are actually increasing that, so. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. And um, just to be uh, mindful of the time and do a time check, I, I know we have a number of questions among the members, um, but we also have 96 members of the public waiting to um, comment this evening as well. So I wanna ask uh, the members to keep the questions brief and uh, know that, uh, keep the answers brief as well uh, to the extent possible for the uh, um, members of the district that are um, answering questions here so that we can get to those questions tonight and know that we have many more community forums uh, set up for uh, discussions here about reopening and um, we will continue to have updates as our meetings progress through this month. So moving uh, on now to uh, Mr. O'Neill, uh, you had your hand raised. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I kind of find, uh, feel like those comments were directed at me, but I also have to say that in my years in the committee, this is probably one of the most difficult issues I've seen the committee wrestle with and I've seen the district wrestle with and I certainly have wrestled with as an individual member. It, the thought process about reopening and the balancing act we're trying to do is certainly keeping me awake, as I'm sure it is my fellow members, as I'm sure it is the superintendent of our team and quite frankly our teachers and our parents and our students as well. Because we are balancing that we are trying as hard as we can to balance the needs of getting our students back in school because recognizing all the shortfalls to them socially, emotionally, intellectually, physically by not being in the classroom with the risk, and it is a risk that our um, students who are predominantly asymptomatic 
can be picking up a virus or sharing a virus with our teachers, many of whom are in high risk categories, and I would count myself in that same category, and or parents, their families and extended families when they go back home. So this is a, a huge, huge issue, and I think it is appropriate that we spend a significant amount of time asking about it, particularly since um, this is now the second time, and, and parents rightfully, and teachers rightfully, uh, who we're asking both of them to sacrifice have a lot of questions. And so we heard the first round of it last time. Now folks are wanting to hear more specifics. We have all received a lot of communications from members of the public, uh, from teachers especially. I, I wanna thank those who took the time to really write a very personal message about what the impact is in their classroom and in their life. Um, others took a more uh, cut and paste approach and that's fine, but um, the ones who, who really personalized it helped us to learn. And so, uh, Superintendent and Ms. Post, uh, I, I do want to ask a, a couple of questions. Um, first is, what are our learnings from summer learning? So, what have we learned about how long have our students who have been in summer learning been? Um, how many hours are they doing? And are the learnings from summer learning that we are applying to our thought process now? We haven't had a full chance yet, uh, Mr. O'Neill, to uh, assess summer learning. So I'm just getting anecdotal information from partners who are telling us about some of the successes of summer learning. They, uh, they do a full analysis though and a full evaluation and we look forward to getting those results. Okay, and uh, as, as I look ahead and I know, and Mr. Chair, I appreciate um, your comments up front that this is, this is subject to public health at the time. This is very much subject to change. Part of this is the state wanted us to put out three plans and say which one we prefer. I know the state uh, uh, superintendent, I was on the same Chamber of Commerce call that you were on yesterday with Commissioner Riley. Thank you for doing that. I thought your presentation was excellent. But you know, as the commissioner said, they're reviewing the three different plans. They will be back to us with comments and advice and suggestions. They have also issued a range of guidance on a number of these issues. So questions that people are asking about, what's the protocol if a student is sick? What's the protocol about transportation? What's the protocol about remote learning? The state has issued a number of guidance on this, and I think folks can find that at the DESE website and more of it is coming out. But it's clear from the state, the encouragement is try to get back to a class if we can, but this is all subject to public health. And so um, I'm interested in, in some of the specific planning we are doing for to get ready to be back when we are back. And it may be September 10th, it may be a little bit later, obviously subject to discussions on the health at the time. But for example, um, Ms. Post, when I see you have the map of the classroom, several years ago, we spent a lot of money on 21st century classroom uh, furniture and arranged for our students to work in groups. So are we giving that up and arranging it all back in rows? Well, you know, what are we doing in the classroom itself? And how much of that work has already been done? What has been done to date is we have set up sample classrooms because it's true, and I think that on behalf of the district, I want to thank the committee for having made that investment in 21st century classrooms. Not every building has those, but some do. What we have found in actually doing this analysis is in every building, there's different furniture and different size rooms, obviously, because they're all different buildings. And so those class, I mean, the illustration was you know, a, um, an illustration, a high level illustration. It's not a picture of a classroom. Each classroom is going to have to look a little different, not only building wise, but also grade level wise. So a lot of our classrooms in the higher grades in high school are in our, our long rows of tables with chairs. Okay, that's pretty easy to take out a number of chairs so that only the tables, you know, you can keep people six feet apart. On the opposite side of that spectrum, though, is um, early childhood classrooms that don't have desks at all, generally. And it's true, we set up some sample classrooms for early childhood with desks. We can't really imagine how that would work because that's not how little kids are taught, three-year-olds and four-year-olds sitting in desks in rows. But we have been working with the child care community also and looking at videos of what they've been doing and zooming into their classrooms because they are open and they also serve some of these same age kids as we do. And so some of the model that is described in the plan with regard to our early childhood work is based on the actual observations we've made in various child cares. There's a, 
a thing called the Denmark model where the pods are two kids and you keep two kids at a table and they are six feet apart and then they can sit on the, their own little um, rug, but they can't sit on the rug for the um, kids next door. I know that every time I describe that, our first reaction is this is terrible and it is, but the only positive message I have is that we are looking individually at what are the specifics for that grade group within the confines of the logistics of what we of what we the district have provided in the past so so when you say you've set up sample classrooms how many have you set up uh, i don't know that answer i know i saw six or eight about a month ago i'm not sure how many of those are still there i know there were pictures taken to send to the school leaders that is part of the package they will get with the template that is related to the, doc, the, the plan that was just released. So how many classrooms do we have in the district? I actually know that it is not 5,000. I'm trying to see if I can find in my head what the number is. I do have in an email somewhere a number. We'll get that, we'll get that for you. I, someone may text it to me in, in a few yeah. minutes, but um, okay. we'll make sure we can get that for you. Because when I think of those classrooms, I also think of if we're doing this hybrid teaching you know, are we going to order, say we have 5,000 classrooms for sake of argument. Have we ordered 5,000 cameras? Have we ordered 5,000 setups for each of those classrooms? So we have 4,500 teachers about, and we have um, about four, four or 5,000 cameras from a vendor ready to send them to us. If, um, and we have them like until Tuesday to make the decision to, <laughs> before he needs to ship them to someone else. So it's kind of like, when this past spring, we had 20,000 computers that yeah. we could get from the supplier. And he said, you got to order them right now if you want them, you know, because across all the nation, as you know, as chair of the Council for Great City Schools, you know, everybody is wanting the same things. Right. Um, so we do have them on hold and we're just really waiting on the working group's recommendations on what we should do in terms of which type of technology we'll need to in our classrooms. That's great to know, actually. Thank you. And they're portable as well, uh, Mr. O'Neill. So it's not something that has to be installed. Uh, so the, some, the ones that are attempting to be favored for, by the working group are the ones that are actually movable and could be, could go with classroom okay. to classroom. And, and in line with that, what about PPE, the personal protective equipment? So masks and sanitizers, how much of that is already ordered? How much of that is coming in? I mean, this is, the concerns of, of everyone, right? We already have, I think it's either 60 or 80,000 masks in um, hand. We have much more than that ordered in a supply chain that is guaranteed to be here uh, far before September 10th. We also would like to actually shout out um, thanks to the Red Sox who have donated to us 60,000 reusable masks and we're continuing to work with other partners in the community to get other donations that way. Um, there's actually 10,000 other masks coming from various um, churches and other faith communities um, where they're actually sewing them for us. Um, and so that's great. But we also, in the, we're not relying on that, but it is a lovely thing and something that we should acknowledge as public right. servants that the community is stepping up. But we've also, um, I think, I'm not sure if you have yours, Superintendent, if you can show your mask, but we have ordered um, other um, cloth masks. And I, I think have to go in the other room. Yeah. I, I have mine around somewhere, the Boston Public Schools exactly. one. Exactly, exactly. Right. You know, I like that mask from Boston Public Schools, but I was out um, doing the day of service with the NAACP on Saturday at Madison Park and it was pretty hot and I thought I was gonna about die on that thing. So <laughs> it's, it's about three different layers of really heavy cotton. So one of the things that I'm really thinking about is how do we think about and get assessments from our students on the type of mask and the breathability of them because yep. there's a lot of people making the masks but there are some that are fit tighter against and they're multiple layers of too thick of material so we want to make sure that uh, in the future we have some pretty good guidance out around the type of breathable mask that would that you could endure for a longer period of time. Thank you. Well, we see our chair demonstrating the Boston uh, Public Schools one. So, um, or, yeah, you know, yeah. some of the masks. I want to... I I know. Along, this, along this the is lines not good of, uh, advertising. Along the lines of uh, what Ms. Robinson said, so I think parents are having a hard time and teachers are having a hard time visualizing this. So to say we've set up a half dozen classrooms when we have 5,000 and it's been a couple of weeks since we first put this proposal out, 
I think we need to set up several school buildings, not just classrooms. And as Ms. Robinson said, other districts are putting out videos. So I know Dallas has done it, Long Beach has done it, where they are showing a parent, first of all, showing a teacher what it's like in a classroom, but also showing parents and students, here's what it would look like. And it is gonna look different, right, for elementary schools versus high schools, and we should have different approaches for them as well. I encourage us, you know, time is ticking here and two weeks have gone by since the last meeting. And I think we got to set up not just classrooms, but buildings and be very public about it. Videos, get the press in to see it, get um, members of the teachers union in to see it, get members of the school leaders associations in to see it and have some collaboration about it. Um, and I think it's, it is critical that that be done sooner rather than later. I appreciate yeah. that. It's a great idea. And I know our comms team is working on videos now. I don't know what yeah. the, the yeah. Uh, and we should include and we should include the buses as well. What's it like to be on a bus? It should be yeah. from the start of a student's day to the end of a student's day. And it should be from the start of a teacher's day to the end of a teacher's day. Yeah, the um, really good suggestions, Mr. Neal, was about three weeks ago, we went to the mayor's storytelling team and video team, and they graciously are working with us on scripts and um, doing that, just that right. thing. So right. more to come on uh, really helping to build the public confidence and help inform them about what these things look like so that they can see it for themselves. And I think it was uh, Dr. Rivera who said it when she was talking about the teachers, if they're in on Wednesday while the building's being cleaned, you know, how's that going to work? I think that was you, Dr. Rivera, who brought that up. I heard yesterday of some technology where they put uh, and it had been used in a bunch of retail stores, but it's now being applied at schools where they put tags at each of the doors. And when the custodians clean that room, they swipe it with their iPhone or with their phone. And then a teacher or a student can hold up the same app and see the last time that room was clean. So there's a lot of new technology out there that we That's should be thinking about. Obviously that involves collective bargaining discussions, et cetera. But um, you know, there's, there's a lot of new ideas out there. I do also note a, a couple of other points and trying to be aware of the, what the chair said. I was on a call this morning, uh, Dr. Casillas, you mentioned my council role, so I was on a call with a number of the national people. Um, and one of the speakers was Dr. Burks from the White House uh, Coronavirus Task Force. And she was talking about um, hot spots around the country and the level of the uh, positive rate of, of under 2% has you at the green level 5% has you at level, uh, has you at the yellow level, 10% has you at red. And then she started naming some cities that she's concerned about that she's seeing upticks. And we were in that list. Boston is one of them. And uh, you mentioned that during the presentation before, but uh, this is being noticed by people. And, and as Dr. Rivera said, different communities are being hit very, very hard. So we may need even more of a local approach beyond just the district approach. Um, I also uh, point out that right now, I think 25 of 21 of the 25 largest districts in the countries have decided to be remote to begin with. And I acknowledge this is shifting on a daily basis. And we have to be, we, we have to be full speed ahead on our planning on remote and full speed ahead of our planning on hybrid and beg our community's indulgence and understanding as we are doing that. Um, know that we hear you and we're sensitive to the concerns being raised. We take none of this lightly, um, but we are, our goal, all of us, is to have our students back in classrooms, but only when we are sure that it's safe. And so my mind is still open to the final approach, what's the right way to do, and I also know that it's gonna be changing over time. But the more we can do on things like, you know, the, the furniture, the set, classroom setup, the PPE, the technology, showing our folks what it would look like now is the time. Time is wasting if we're not pushing on this absolutely full throttle right now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. O'Neill, one thing I do want to share um, just very briefly is that, you know, even though it's very challenging to figure out the hybrid model, and we are preparing for both the hybrid and the remote, even if there's a vaccine, say, in February or March, it will take a while for everybody to be vaccinated. Absolutely. So that's, you know, that could take years for everybody to be vaccinated, for there to be enough vaccine and for that to happen. So we have to prepare for the hybrid model at some point. 
whether oh, it's- there's, uh, yeah. there's no question about it. I think we absolutely should. And we may be starting with hybrid and moving to remote, then back to hybrid. We may be starting with hybrid and then remote. It's gonna mm -hmm. be a, a year in flux like none of us, that hasn't happened in a hundred years. But communication around this to show that the planning is actually be done so people can buy into the plans and that we yeah. hear their concerns is critical. And one other issue and no one else has raised it. So I apologize, Mr. Chair, but I have to. We haven't talked about the financial implications here. What is the cost for all this? How are we planning on it? How are we paying for it? Absent, obviously, we're hoping that the Senate's going to reach agreement and they're talking about including a lot of funding for districts in it. But what are we looking at for the cost of hybrid versus remote? Well, we think it's going to be anywhere from 3 to 5% of our budget. So uh, we think it could cost upwards of $50 million. It, you know, just our cost for students with disabilities could make that even greater um, in terms of the cost and then you add in any additional technologies that we want. As for the HEALS Act that's going through right now, the Senate, they have tied that to being in person. So I think it's two thirds of it you won't get. You'll only get a one third of the funding if you are um, remote only. I think uh, that is an administration and a Senate proposal. Um, right. I, I think the House will be uh, fighting that um, tie quite vigorously. To yeah, leave there it. was the HEROES Act yeah. before that that came right. out of the House, I believe, and then the Senate yeah. has the HEALS Act version, yes. uh, which is much more restrictive um, and political, I think. And the, fi right, and the final bill will be a combination <laughs> between the two, and we're trusting Speaker Pelosi to hold firm to uh, um, um, represent districts well. That's right. My money would be on her. Um, so I understand, um, but yeah, these are pretty substantial costs and people want to know that as well. Um, you know, that should be part of what we're communicating to our public as well. Thank you. I've taken more than enough time. Thank you for your brevity, Mr. O'Neill. Move on now to uh, the vice chair. Uh, thank you, chair. And I will try to be brief because I really want to hear from uh, the community. Um, I wanted to ask. Um, what exactly happens on Wednesdays? I know the cleaning, I'm sorry, but I just realized when Dr. Rivera asked that I really wasn't, I thought I was clear on the Wednesday, um, but I, apparently I wasn't. So if you could just say what exactly is happening with teachers on Wednesdays. Um, I, I certainly can. First of all, all of our students in the Commonwealth by law are required to have a certain number of instructional days. And so students will be learning on Wednesdays, which means teachers will be teaching on Wednesdays. The question of whether they're teaching from the building or not from the building, I understand that the logistical question about, do I need to get out of my room because they're cleaning my room right now? I understand that logistics. But I think it isn't that um, Wednesday is a, an off day. It's a learning day that counts towards the 170 or 180 or whatever the number is going to end up to be. Great. I, I, I thought so, but I just wanted to make sure. So thank you for that. Um, I have mostly comments, not questions. Um, I'm glad to hear about um, the PPE number and I would suggest obviously getting more than what you need, um, especially right now since I think everybody's trying to, to get that um, PPE. I also just want to also thank everyone who wrote and took time to, to write to us. Um, that was, uh, it was really great to kind of um, understand everybody's different um, perspectives. The one thing, you know, I'll say about the plan is that I do appreciate that, that it is an option for families. Um, I think it's really important. Um, I, you know, as, as a mom, I totally understand, um, you know, what Dr. Rivera is saying as a member of a community that's been really hit very hard, um, not just with the virus, but economically. I want to be sensitive um, to people that need to have their children back in school and also sensitive to people that uh, are afraid to come back to school um, for many reasons uh, that I just mentioned, including having um, family members with um, having risk. I do worry about um, the uh, exposure of children on the T, which we haven't like really talked a lot about, and what is what does that mean for our kids? Um, and I'm not uh, a scientist, but I am also worried about 
some of the recent articles that I've seen are specifically for African, African American, uh, Black and Latino young people around uh, inflammatory disease. And since we don't really know what this virus is, um, we don't know the long-term health repercussions. Um, but I just want to say I appreciate all the planning. And I, and, uh, I think that we do obviously want to have our children go back to school for all the social uh, benefits, et cetera, but also that we're following uh, public health guidelines will be really, really important. So in the meantime, just a few comments, because the way that it, you know, that it's rolling across the country, as um, Mr. O'Neill said, 21 out of 25 districts that are similar to ours are remote. If we do end up going completely remote, it will be really, really important that remote is excellent. It will be really, really important that all families are connected uh, instead of some, uh, and the disconnection rate that we have, I know is because we never faced this before, but it will be really important to do that. I think um, we all received a couple of emails um, around some of the uh, suggestions that were made for remote in terms of making sure that we're retrofitting buildings during that time, because we said we were gonna do that anyway um, and build BPS, and that we look at also um, having staff work in, um, in connection with external partners around the remote piece and also with the Boston Housing Authority. Um, so I don't want us to miss and, and also support some of the parent-led efforts um, where parents are educating students at home. So I just want to make those comments. But thank you for working uh, so, you know, so hard, all the staff that have been working on this. I do appreciate it. I know it's very sensitive. This is a life and death matter, so we cannot take it lightly. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Vice Chair. I want to look around once at the committee before we move on from this topic to see if there are any further questions or comments that occurred in listening to our uh, colleagues and their questions this evening. Well, seeing none and hearing none, um, I, I want to I appreciate the Vice Chair's words and, um, you know, certainly reminding folks that uh, no matter what, um, this is a choice that we're allowing families to make um, about uh, the educational um, uh, mode that they want for their kids. And so it's important for folks to, uh, uh, to know and to keep in mind that if you don't feel safe uh, and secure in sending your kids to school, you always have that option to choose the remote option. Um, unfortunately, I know our, uh, if we're starting hybrid and we will have in person, our staff and our faculty won't have that option, but we are, that's why we are paying such close attention to uh, the public health metrics that are out there because we want to make sure that if we're doing this in person we're only doing it in as a, a safe and effective way uh, that supports uh, learning outcomes and keeps our educators safe um, so i know um, as we end every one of these conversations you certainly have a tall order um, superintendent and, and miss poost and um, your staff and your colleagues i i know um, you are uh, eating, sleeping, and drinking this stuff right now. Um, and uh, certainly as someone who's uh, working on this at his day job as well at a, at a very small college that's got about, uh, I'd say about 1 27th of the enrollment of the uh, the Boston Public Schools, um, it's, a, it, it's quite a feat and it can be all encompassing. Um, but I know that you folks are, are really working hard on this and we're very appreciative of the work that you do and we'll continue to look forward to additional um, updates on what this plan will look like, particularly the plan that gets submitted, or the plans, plural, that gets submitted to uh, DESE in the coming days, and uh, to the updates you'll be providing to the community and to the committee over the uh, next couple of weeks. Before we move off this topic, um, Superintendent or Ms. Poos, could you remind us um, what's the schedule for the upcoming community meetings on reopening, or if there's a website that we can point uh, folks to, to uh, to find out more information about that? Yeah, so I know we have one coming up on Saturday as well, um, and there's a number of them. Uh, I would say the best place is to go to www.bostonpublicschools.org forward slash reopening, and you can see all of the dates there. There's also a link to the document in the plan that will continually update. So if you want to look in the community engagement section, you could always see what's coming up next. Very good, thank you. So again, that's bostonpublicschools.org slash reopening. 
Yes, and I do think that the um, in the next week or in a couple of weeks when principals return, they will start having virtual open houses and we will also, I know um, our communications office is also working on those videos that uh, Mr. O'Neill had suggested and different things like that. We'll keep updating our website so that people can see the progress we're making. Very good. Well, thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, Ms. Poost, for your work. Uh, we'll move on now to uh, general public comment. And so I'll ask Ms. Sullivan to join us. And um, a as I mentioned at the outset of the meeting, Ms. Sullivan will talk just a little bit about what the typical uh, school committee rules are for uh, public comment. And um, But I just wanted to reiterate that we do have a, a very large number of people that uh, wish to comment this evening. Um, so I'd ask uh, each and every one of you that are taking the time to share your views with us. First of all, we thank you for doing that. Um, and, um, you know, unlike a lot of other bodies, we don't uh, limit the public comment uh, period. We don't uh, limit the number of comments that we take. Um, but when we do get above a certain number, we do reduce the time limits for um, public comment. So we ask you to be succinct and to the point and um, be thoughtful of uh, all the other folks that are waiting to, uh, to speak and share their views with us this, uh, this evening. We do have 96 speakers signed up, so we want to get right into that. Ms. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. The public comment period is an opportunity for parents, students, and other concerned parties to make brief presentations to the school committee on pertinent school issues. Questions on specific school matters are not answered at this time, but are referred to the superintendent for a later response. Questions on specific policy matters are not answered at this time, but may be the subject of later discussion by the committee. As Mr. Locanto said, we have 96 speakers this evening. So in accordance with school committee policy, time will be reduced to two minutes per person. And I'll remind you when you have 30 seconds remaining. Those who require interpretation services will receive additional two minutes. Speakers may not reassign their time to others. Large groups addressing the same topic are encouraged to consolidate their remarks or choose a spokesperson to provide testimony. Written testimony is appreciated and encouraged. Please state your name and affiliation before you begin. When I call your name, please raise your hand virtually in Zoom. Also, please make sure you're signed into Zoom with the same name that you used to sign up for public comment. And that will allow us to identify you when it's your turn to testify. Our first speaker this evening is Counselor Julia Mejia. She'll be followed by Counselor Michelle Wu. Counselor Anissa Asabi George and Counselor Ricardo Arroyo. You could please virtually raise your hands. Okay, great. So I'm not sure if how this works, if you can hear me or see me. However, she's also aware oh of the health issues. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, there's a little background noise, but we can hear you. Okay. Um, so then you can't see me, but you can hear me, right? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I want to speak on two issues here, and I'm not sure if I'm going to have two minutes to speak on both or what the rules of engagement are before I even start. Just I it's, want to be clear. It's two minutes total, uh, Counselor. Thank for, you. For both? Okay. Yes. Well, then I'm going to do Speedy Gonzalez. You can start um, clocking me in now. So first, I just want to say that in regards to the school opening, um, I, I really will have to say that I am a, a strong opposition of the hybrid model. I'm not sure, the hopscotch situation, I'm not sure really in terms of input. I, I hear that you have hosted several meetings with community members and educators, but I'm just really concerned about the lack of engagement. Um, and I'm not sure whether or not we're really taking into consideration the um, the safety of our uh, most vulnerable learners. I would propose that we look at this from a two phase. One is maybe focusing on our most vulnerable learners for special education and ELs and giving them the first option to return to school um, while providing families remote learning options. Um, I also think that this is an opportunity for BPS to really think outside the box um, and drawing upon the, the strength um, and assets that exist in the community. So I think that this plan as is right now does not satisfy um, the needs of, of those that I have served and, and I've heard from. So the next um, 
point that I want to talk about is the McCormick. Um, we've been inspired by the activism of families from Harbor Point residents, and particularly um, the McCormick students. And I'm here to say that I am not um, in favor right now uh, about uh, utilizing the fields in other ways. Um, more specifically, the proposal ignores that, um, as it clearly stated, that the McCormick students who express a desire for a green space above all else does not benefit those young people. A proposal that makes that takes away green space from children during a pandemic where indoor physical activity is virtually impossible does not benefit McCormick students. A proposal that does not account for the expansion of the McCormick into a seven to 12 school and the needed for fields and grounds required for high school athletes um, does not benefit the students of the McCormick. A proposal that, that, that comes to a vote during the height of a concern around a school reopening and distracts us from focusing on what critical issues are um, does not benefit the students at the McCormick or any students in the Boston Public Schools for that matter. Um, and the proposal that uses uh, that makes decisions regarding this field has left out those most impacted and continues to prioritize the needs of the wrong constituencies in the city of Boston. We need to prioritize the health and well-being of our Black <clears throat> and Latinx students and families and how we plan and how we implement our plans. Please vote no on this proposal um, and provide the creation of a new RFP process that abids by the expectations you set forth initially and one that puts the needs of the McCormick students front and center. I am really looking um, to the school committee to do right by all, all means all. And this is an opportunity for us to right the wrong and listen to the voices of those who are most impacted. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Next we'll hear from Councillor Michelle Wu. Good evening, everyone. Um, good evening, Superintendent, Mr. Chair, all the members of the Boston School Committee. I want to thank you for your continued hard work during this pandemic. Um, of course, I'm grateful as a colleague in city government, but even more so as a BPS mom. We're looking forward to our K2 year. Um, tonight, I want to spend my two minutes reflecting the feedback of my BPS constituents and amplifying their call for processes that cultivate trust, empower school communities, and empower schools as critical hubs to support the surrounding community. So first, I'd like to stand with the McCormick community and Harbor Point residents in urging the committee to reject the proposal to develop these athletic fields through a public-private partnership against the wishes of the school community and surrounding residential community. As my colleague noted just before, this goes against the very immediate and urgent needs during this public health crisis for more open space, more fresh air, and it goes against the call to center racial equity in policy and processes for decision making. This is a question of land use that falls under your jurisdiction. And I wanna reiterate as chair of the city council's planning development and transportation committee, that public land is incredibly precious and decisions to eliminate open space have generational impact, permanently barring access for generations to come. So there are many well-meaning parties involved here, but our charge, especially in this moment, is to make decisions that center the voices of those most impacted and benefit generations to come. So I stand with the community in urging you all to reject this proposal, incorporate the planning into the larger planning efforts for the school and remove the artificial deadline to push this through in the midst of this crisis. Um, now I'd like to turn to a topic that is very urgent, but also hinges on addressing the lack of trust and prioritizing community engagement. That is the planning for a reopening. So I read through the entire reopening plan last night and um, to be honest, felt quite frustrated because a little over a month away from the start of school, we are still facing the same type of uncertainty about what will happen with schools as we face at the very beginning of the shutdown. It doesn't help provide certainty to simply say that science will drive the decision. When there's no transparency about how infection data might drive decisions beyond deferring to the Boston Public Health Commission, when in all these months since the pandemic began, BPHC has issued no guidance or protocols for what happens in the inevitable situation that a student or school community member becomes exposed to the virus or what might trigger another shutdown. The draft plan also holds up health and well being as a core value, but shifts the burden for carrying that out onto families. No virus testing provided or even required by the district, no contact tracing, no water available for students during the day, trying to address the need to distance on school buses by cutting the number of families eligible for bus service, no plan to guarantee airflow and air quality in our older buildings. Uh, finally, I'm grateful <clears throat> to the many educators, students, families, and school community members 
who I've had the opportunity to speak with in small group conversations and a larger town hall last week. They are brilliant. There are so many creative ideas put forward. And I want to note that I've yet to hear from one constituent, um, besides our lovely superintendent, who believes that the hopscotch model of simultaneous teaching is workable. Please, we can These should not be the only options Councilor Wu. Councilor Wu, I just want to interrupt you. You're well past the two minutes. And I do uh, want to remind folks that we do have a, a number of people signed up tonight. And I know that you sent a letter uh, to uh, outline your concerns to the committee and to the superintendent. So we appreciate that. I'd ask you just to sum up so that we can move on and make sure everybody gets an equal chance to be heard this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate that you will review that letter. Um, just to summarize, there are many ideas out there, many ways that a hybrid model could work better than this, this current proposal for a hybrid. I urge BPS to commit to an all remote start to the school year, take the hopscotch proposal off the table in order to plan for a phased in transition to in-person learning for at least some students and exploring creative options for facilities, put educators at the front and, and spearheading these decisions. Um, so I want to thank you again. Um, as you mentioned, I've emailed a nine page document. It's not, not near the 63 pages um, summarizing the concerns and feedback I received on reopening and recovery to you all shortly before this meeting started and look forward to continued engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Next, we'll hear from Councillor Anissa Arsabi George. She'll be followed by Councillor Ricardo Avoyo and Jessica Tang. Uh, good evening. My name is Anissa Arsabi George. I'm an at-large city councilor, former teacher, and more importantly, a parent of four BPS students. My remarks are based on the current draft reopening plan and concerns from our constituents from the last few weeks and months. There are some immediate questions I'll share this evening, but a larger list I will submit to you. I also look forward to a more in-depth discussion at the city council hearing regarding the opening of schools next week. I imagine some changes between now and then will occur as well. I have heard from a number of teachers who are deeply concerned about the feasibility of teaching in person and online simultaneously. It seems like an impossible task and would result in poor learning environments for both the students in person as well as online. I strongly urge you to not have teachers using the simultaneous model. Will laid off Paris teachers substitutes be recalled to fill their positions or to provide backup should staff need to quarantine? Appropriate staffing level Appropriate staffing levels are critical to creating safe environments and providing the rigorous instruction of both in-person and online learning. Some of our teachers teach classes larger than 20 to 24 students. Dividing these students in half for in-person teaching will mean that in-person classrooms will be larger than the recommended 10 to 12 people in the room. How will BPS handle this and where, and where are we in the process of creating satellite classrooms so that we can maintain safety while students are in person? TransDev has hired a cleaning company, but our drivers have said they never saw anyone last year while they were transporting students prior to schools being closed and during the pandemic delivering food. Has BPS confirmed that buses will be cleaned and what additional steps will BPS take to ensure buses are cleaned during this coming school year? Additionally, how many bus monitors have been hired and do we need to still hire for safe routes to school? We also would like to know about the recent audits of buildings to the public. There are so many concerns about the availability the availability of space, nurses, offices, isolation rooms, ad adequacy of our windows, and lack of in cla classroom temperature and ventilation control. We also are concerned about soap in our bathrooms and sanitizers throughout our schools. Who do staff, students, or families call if their classrooms or school buildings are not uh, reaching those necessary sanitation levels and supplies are not available? On another note, and finally, I am not opposed to this project, but question the timing of voting on the McCormick Fields plan. There are so many questions about the process that got us here, and many in the community have reached out in opposition to the field house at the McCormick School. We are all in need, we all need to be focused on rebuilding our schools and ensuring our students have a great school year. Adding this to our plate seems to be too much. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak this evening. Have a great night. Thank you, Councillor. Our next speaker is Councillor Ricardo Avoyo. He'll be followed by Jessica Tang, Marcus McNeil, and Calvin Tran. If you could please raise your hands virtually. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. 
my name is Ricardo Arroyo. I'm a product of BPS. I have five nephews and nieces of school age, all who attend BPS, one who has an IEP. My mother taught in BPS for 35 years. My sister is currently teaching at BPS, and my father was once the president of this very committee. I personally represent Hyde Park, Mattapan, and Roslindale, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Public Health on the Boston City Council. I've read this plan, and I believe before and more strongly now, that only remote learning can adequately protect the safety of our students, families, and staff at this time. That said, I'd like to direct your attention to the BPS plan, which we've been told is informed by science, relies on data, and provides necessary safety for our school communities. Practical realities is on page 11 to 12, and I'm gonna quote this plan. Following the reopening of school facilities, it is likely that there will be some level of exposure to and or outbreak of COVID-19. That's one bullet point. Second bullet point. Our workforce is made up of dedicated public servants, but many, including educators, bus drivers, and monitors, as well as other support service employees who work closely with students may be at higher risk for COVID-19. Uh, just some editorial there. They're not maybe, they are. People of color and families living with less financial resources, this is a bullet point, are disproportionately harmed by COVID-19. The majority of BPS families meet one or both of these descriptors. Regulatory guidance issued by the Boston Public Health Commission, CDC, Department of Education and Secondary Education, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, and other state and federal agencies often direct a one-size-fits-all solution to the problem that manifests differently in every community, including in every school district. And finally, the Boston Public Schools will rely on guidance from the Boston Public Health Commission about current virus conditions and determining if and when to return to in-person instruction in 2020. How can anybody read that and determine that this plan accounts for those issues, it does not and it cannot. When I proposed declaring racism a public health crisis in March, it was because our systems are structurally racist and create disparity and inequity. What message does it send our communities of color who make up over 80% of our student population and who have been devastated by COVID and are at a higher risk for COVID, a fact this plan acknowledges that we are willing to subject them to unsafe schooling conditions that are, and I quote, likely to cause an outbreak of a disease that has caused so much death and illness disproportionately in their communities and their homes. That is the definition of causing systemic harm. This plan has nothing for contact tracing. This plan has nothing for mandatory testing. This plan doesn't protect our children. I intend to fight and advocate for a plan that does. I feel wholeheartedly for families that want a plan that lets their children be in school. And I understand that this plan does not allow for that reality at this time. Thank you for your, for, your, uh, for your work on this. And I intend to be uh, on top of this to the best of my ability to ensure that we create a testing plan that actually has contact tracing, that actually has mandated testing, that actually has some kind of solution or plan for asymptomatic students. There is nothing in this plan that deals with the fact that 25% to Thank 25% you, of people who have this disease don't show symptoms. There's nothing in this plan to deal with that. That's a reality that won't go away no matter how many drafts of this plan we put together. And so thank I you, look counselor. forward to hearing how we plan to address that moving forward. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Counselor. Before we move on to Ms. Tang, we have another elected official um, who's in the room with us, Representative Liz Miranda. Representative, are you with us? Uh, Ms. Sullivan, perhaps we can come back to our representative Miranda and uh, hear from Ms. Tang right now while we uh, while we try to track her down. Well, certainly, Ms. <laughs> Ms. Tang. Yep, I'm here. Welcome. Thank you. So good evening. My name is Jessica Tang and I'm president of the Boston Teachers Union, proudly representing educators and staff of the Boston Public Schools. Since our school shut down, we've missed our students and we've missed teaching our students in classrooms. We want to see them in person once school reopens, but we must now more than ever prioritize everyone's health and safety. That is why beginning in March, we immediately implored the district to work with us to begin planning for the summer and fall. We knew it would take months of thoughtful planning resources and immediate action to best prepare for the fall. Now it is August, and while there are aspects of the reopening plan released by BPS yesterday that we find encouraging and that we agree with, we don't think the plan is tenable or realistic. The main areas where we disagree are on the misguided simultaneous hybrid approach and the feasibility of accomplishing the goals set forth within the timeline provided, especially if COVID-19 data continues trending in the wrong direction as it re has recently. The city of Boston has done a great many things well to combat the spread, but until our whole nation joins in the effort by following science and not the fallacious rhetoric coming from the White House, we will all be in grave danger. 
We look forward to resuming discussions with BPS through the joint task forces that we've advocated for that include both frontline B2 educators and BPS staff. And while we'd like to have seen those task forces given more attention by the district in the lead up to the release of this report, we appreciate that a commitment has been made to resume them through frequent collaboration and meaningful discussions. Through those task forces in here today, we are eager to discuss and to hear additional details around safely transporting our students to schools, what the public health metrics actually are, and how the facilities plan will maintain the CDC standards. Currently, as has been reported, we have been respectfully urging the district to move toward a fully remote opening to begin the school year and a phased in return to any voluntary in-person learning only when all safety protocols are in place and fully verified. As we have shared with the district, we believe that the separate September 10th start is completely unrealistic and we have gotten no evidence to the contrary. Leaving schools to create their own plans by August 21st without further guidance will further lead to chaos, inconsistency, and undue anxiety and stress for families and educators. We need the additional days granted by DESE to fully plan and prepare. A delayed start is better than a disastrous start. The health and safety of students and their families and educators must be the first priority, which is why verification of the protocols and resources being in place before setting the fragile or overly optimistic timelines is so critical. If we had the plan and funding months ago, it might be more realistic, but it is not now. Students put their trust in us to keep them safe. We must absolutely do so. We want to work collaboratively through a process to make sure we can explore every possibility. And we implore you to join us in advocating for the funding we needed before the pandemic and certainly now need more than ever. We- Ms. Chang. Yes. Yes, you're a little bit past your time. If you could yes, uh, summarize, please, last, thank you. Yes, I am, I am I'm summarizing just the last few sentences um, that if we, we reopen fully with a detailed, without a fully detailed, fund, fully funded plan, we will assuredly contribute to resurgence and we will not have that on our conscience. So you'll hear this evening from uh, educators, students and families who are advocating for safe and equitable schools. We will be releasing our own detailed aspiration proposals soon and hope our experiences will guide the district's reopening effort. And uh, lastly, we do stand with the students and families in the Cormac and urge you not to give away their field. These are all social and racial justice issues and we hope that you hear us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tang. Um, it looks like Representative Miranda is with us now. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. I'm sorry, I can't see my face, so this is a little difficult. So thank you. To oh. I'm sorry, Rep. Miranda, I uh, hit the mute button. I was trying to uh, open up your uh, your video. If you could start over again, my apologies. Hello, everyone. Can I start now? Yes, sorry about that, Rep. Thank you. Um, no problem. Good evening, everyone. And I really am really honored to be here this evening. Um, one, as someone that I feel um, is really into collaboration and bringing people together. I'm actually on the call tonight um, in support of a long process that I think is just beginning between the Martin Richard Foundation, the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester, which is in my district, at least one half of it, and the Boston Public School System. I'm a, a product of Boston Public Schools and I'm also a product of Boston's community centers. Uh, I was a latchkey kid whose mom worked 16 hour days. And if it wasn't for the local community centers, I don't know where I'd be in my life. I'm really excited about the potential opportunity to use an underutilized parcel in Columbia Point and create like a campus-like atmosphere for the students that go to the schools, the McCormick Dever and to the Harbor Point community. The Harbor Point community has changed a lot, but still many families remain um, and who are low to moderate income, who deserve a place, um, a de deserve a place for the young people to succeed. One thing that's been on my mind is that um, a lot of times when there's a community process, it's very challenging for folks that don't speak English, uh, for parents that are working like my mom did, and for those who are um, juggling multiple children in different Boston public schools. And what I want to encourage and also fully support is that it's my hope that we continue to engage with the parents, um, the children that go to these schools and the wider community so we can ensure that this public process is extended expanded and so that we can hear more from community voices. I've been working for a year and a half very closely with the Boys and Girls Club. Um, it's one of the many community centers in my school, in my district. 
And one of the things that I'm hopeful for is that the kids from Harbor Point also get an opportunity to get the stellar programming that I've seen um, happening on Dot Ave for the Dorchester community. Um, I'm sorry I'm not prepared to make longer remarks, but I stand with everyone to figure out how I can bring both the community that is in opposition and those that are for this project together so that we can ensure that the children and the people of the Columbia Point, Dorchester and South Boston communities get everything that they deserve. Thank you for your time, Representative. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we'll hear from our students. If you could please virtually raise your hand. Marcus McNeil, Calvin Tran, Rama Bengura, Jocelyn Sammy, and Aman Jomar. Is Marcus McNeil with us? Yes. Welcome. So good evening, everyone. My name is Mar Marcus McNeil, and I'm an incoming junior at Fenway High School. In 2018, I graduated from the McCormick Middle School. The McCormick holds a special place in my heart because that's where I found my voice to advocate for the things I care about. If you would have asked me to testify a few years ago, I probably would have turned down the opportunity. But now I have the confidence to stand up and speak for the things that need to be addressed. The teachers at the McCormick are absolutely rock stars. They care for the students like their own children and equip them with the necessary tools needed to successfully go on to high school and then to college. Never in a million years did I imagine that the McCormick would undergo high intensity renovation plans without properly consulting the people that would personally be affected by this renovation, the students and teachers at the McCormick. I have the highest respect for the Martin Richard Foundation and the work that they do for the community in honor of Martin Richard. I am disappointed that they are participating in the planning and development of this project that is taking place. In a recent article published by the Bay State Banner that outlines the plans from the McCormick, the author, Mr. Miller, brings in school committee member, Lorna Rivera, she says that the department's push to advance the project seemed to come out of the blue. She continues to say the school committee members received a PowerPoint presentation from the developers at 2.30 on a Wednesday afternoon, just two and a half hours before the 5 p.m. meeting. I have the same question as Ms. Rivera. Why is this topic even coming up at, a, at this point? We have an ongoing pandemic and we're spending all this time planning for a new building. We should really be focused on how we're gonna get our students back into the buildings, but that's a testimony for a different time. I'm disappointed that Mr. Rob Consalvo, the person who handles intergovernmental relations, decided to advance the plan. Mr. Chairman, I have a question for you. I want you to put yourself in these students' shoes and think about how you would feel if you were a child and you were going to the school and you were told that your land that you play recess on was getting taken away. Think about that for a second. So in conclusion, I look to the members of the school committee to take this process carefully and slowly Focus on the things that matter the most, which is taking care of the students of BPS and ensuring that we can keep everyone safe. I'm still very disappointed that these students might not ever get a chance to use a building that's in their backyard. We need to come up with a solution that to ensure that this new construction will not negatively and inaccurately affect the students of the McCormick. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McNeil. Our next speaker is Calvin Tran. Mr. Tran. Rama Bangura, is Rama with us? Jocelyn Sammy. Hello. Hello, welcome. Hi, hello, my name is Rama Talai Bangura, and I am currently enrolled at a BPS school and a member at the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester, where I attend the Walter Denny Youth Center in Harbor Point. Every day I look across and see an empty lot. I could not be more excited to the endless possibilities of an indoor facility for new space to hang out with friends and enjoy our time together. The indoor fields will allow us to play and practice throughout the year. It is hard to play basketball in high piles of snow and muddy, murky mud. I can't wait to have an indoor space here in Harbor Point. The Boys and Girls Club of Dutchess has introduced me to people and experiences I have never knew otherwise, otherwise and has opened so many doors and opportunities to grow. One of my favorite experiences was when I went to Disney for the first time with a hundred other club members. I am proud to be a part of this passionate and invested community and can't wait to see the project that holds for us and future member members. 
Thank you very much. We're going to go back to Calvin Tran and try Mr. Tran again. Welcome. Calvin? Calvin? Okay. All right. Uh, Jocelyn Sammy. Jocelyn? Hi. Wait. Oh, good evening. My name is Jocelyn Sammy, and I am a recent graduate of Tech Boston Academy. I will be attending Suffolk University on a full ride this fall. I'm here to let you know that the opportunity to attend college would have not been possible without the support and guidance of Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester. For the past 10 years, I have been a member of the club. At the club, we are all a family and a family means everything. I used to be shy and I didn't have a lot of confidence. The club changed all of that. The club has given me a voice and a vision for my future. As a member, I played basketball, traveled, and attended overnight camp, Camp Northbound. I have gained confidence, developed leadership skills, and I even spoke in front of 600 people as the 2018 keynote speaker for the New England Women's Leadership Awards. These are just a few things that I have participated in over the years. As junior staff, I have also discovered my love working with kids and hope to become a guidance counselor or a child psychologist who will make a difference someday in Boston. At the club, we give children the chance to figure out who they are and who they can become. I think everyone should have the same opportunities I did at the club. We are excited about the new field house at Harbor Point. It will be a special place that will open doors for many kids who will need help, guidance, and support. The new facility will be a shining star for the schools and everyone in the community. I respectfully ask that the school committee endorse the development of the Martin Richard Fieldhouse, allowing even more children to thrive and become members of our family at Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Amanj Omar. Amanj. Amanj, go ahead. Okay. Um, Maybe we can move on and come back if uh, he's able to un un sure. mute himself. It looks like Mr. Trans here as well. Oh, hello. Hello. Go hello. ahead. Who is this? Oh my gosh, Calvin Tran. I'm so sorry. Like I was having technical difficulties. Okay, Calvin. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, um, school committee members and Superintendent Caselius. My name is Calvin Tran, and I'm a rising junior at Dear One STEM, along as an alumni of John W. McCormick and a long student of Boston Public Schools. On behalf of John W. McCormick and Harper Point, I'd like to ask the school committee to avoid the erection of the Boys and Girls Club plan to be constructed on community property. Despite constant conversations and collective backlash, there are still attempts to assemble the building, essentially meaning we've engaged in nonsensical dialogue. Over the span of a few months, it's apparent BPS lacks two crucial components in serving our communities, accountability and transparency. Mayor Wall stated that racism is a public health issue, and so to allow the gentrification of low-income communities of color to exist is inherently racist. To hold Mayor Wall accountable, this calls for an immediate intervention and the instantaneous moratorium on constructing the Boys and Girls Club. With the dire circumstances and coldness of our current reality, the city intends to add to the world's chaos by removing much-needed green space. Climate change, one of the most pressing concerns and global issues, is slowly creeping upon us and manufacturing a building rapidly contributes to an inter international issue soon deemed irreversible. Even worse, the production of this building is an insult to environmental environmentalists dedicated to protecting our earth. Countless times we are not listened to, and certainly the community is not listened to. Adults in power pride themselves on incorporating community feedback and voice, yet when we vocalize our concerns, our voices are immediately undermined or disregarded. Even if we are listened to, we aren't understood or our words are conditioned to, meet, to be misunderstood. Thus, this raises a disturbing re revelation regarding adults in our city. You work against our needs. Your lack of commitment enables for social injustice to prominently persist and thrive. The battle for social, for social justice is a very rigor, rigorous and challenging task, but we continue to ask for your support because concrete change comes with collective collaboration. We cannot do this alone. 
So please note that while the advocacy for a greener space and preventing the gentrification of low-income communities of color is a cumbersome process, the dedication and persistence of the community shall not be diminished. Collective collabor collaborative work is best when all of us are on the same page. Thank you so much for my learning this time and thank you so much for listening. And sorry about earlier. Thank you, no problem. Thank you, thanks for hanging in there. Um, our next speaker is Amanj Omar. Amanj? Please go ahead. Okay, it looks like uh, Ms. Omar is having uh, some trouble, so why don't we move on? Okay, Nima Avashia, followed by Laura Carroll and Antoinette Brownell. If you could please raise your hands virtually and join us. Ms. Avashia? Ms. Uh, Ms. Sullivan, did we miss um, Mr. Jenkins? Mr. Jenkins is not with us. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Avashia? Yep, am I good to go? Yes, welcome. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good evening. My name is Nima Avashia. I'm a teacher at the McCormick and a Boston resident. I'm here tonight to speak about the deeply flawed implementation of the planning process around the McCormick field. To summarize, an RFP was issued with zero input from McCormick students. Plans for the field house were announced in the newspaper before anyone at the school had been informed. Middle school students had to testify at school committee to elicit minimal engagement with the planning process, a process that was, according to this body, supposed to begin with them and focus on them. And even after students made it clear that they value green space above all else, that their field where they play even in the wintertime is sometimes their only access to safe outdoor space, you're set to vote on a plan today that does not meet their stated needs and includes no equity analysis of the impact of stripping Black and Latinx students of their green space. The way in which this process has been subverted has created ill will among members of our community. It has pitted us against each other, left some feeling ignored and others feeling defensive, and none of that was necessary. If the process had been implemented as you outlined, beginning with eliciting community needs and wishes as a way of informing the creation of the RFP, we'd be in a very, very different place right now. None of us believe that the current state of the grounds at the McCormick are what our kids deserve. The area is neglected by both the city and the district and is in desperate need of maintenance. There is a way forward that allows for the creation of a space that meets a broad set of needs, but that way needs to be grounded in equity, transparency, and inclusiveness. And given that it is public land associated with a public school, it needs to begin with the young people most impacted by any change, the current and future students of the seven to 12 school. One of my very wise colleagues always says, you can't get to a good place in a bad way. The process we follow here will set the precedent for public-private partnerships in our city. It will either engender trust in the community or breed suspicion. It will center the voices of those most impacted or those most connected. Please hit reset on this process and begin again. Thank you. Thank you. I see that Mr. Jenkins is with us now. So we'll go back to Robert Jenkins. Mr. Jenkins? Mr. Jenkins, go ahead. Yes, how you doing? Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Um, I would like to thank the school committee, school superintendent and her staff. We have a very hard task here about, um, we have a very strong task here. Uh, you know, we're basically damned if we do, damned if we don't. You know, getting the kids back in the school and teachers in the school in a safe environment. But then again, remote learning. Remote learning is not working with a lot of parents and students that I've spoken to. Uh, with that being said, if we do go to remote learning by in, in, for the entire district, we need to make sure that remote learning is working. We need to improve that one way or another. But then on the same token, our kids are missing out with their friends having that social and emotional learning aspect that they've lacked since March, since this COVID has hit. So there's gotta be a way, hopefully, that we can use the hybrid in helping. But again, you guys have a tough, we have a tough road ahead of us. I would like to also add as our vice chair, um, has spoken about the MBTA, putting our students, all our students from grade six to 12 ride the MBTA. That's another problem on safety measures. The buses 
the, the single buses do not create social and safe distancing for anybody, including our students. And that is something that definitely has to be looked at. Uh, you know, um, I know, again, it's, it's hard here, you know, but our kids have to get back to some type of social uh, interaction as, as well as uh, pay, uh, uh, teachers. I was with some of my students that I haven't seen, and it was great to see them. They've grown, they miss each other, but again, uh, you know, it's safety. So just taking that in mind, uh, working on that. As far as getting parent engagement, the 36 questions was another issue, and I thank you for the time. I'll see you in the community meetings. Have a good night. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. Our next speaker is Laura Carroll. Ms. Carroll, are you with us? Ms. Carroll? Yes, hi, am I unmuted now? Yes, welcome. Okay, great. It's just odd talking to a black square. Um, thank you, uh, committee members um, and uh, superintendents. Um, I have sent another uh, detailed letter uh, to the committee and superintendent um, this past Monday, August 3rd, and I understand that that has been distributed to all of you. So I will uh, just hit some of the high points rather than go through it, um, but I urge you all to read it carefully. As you know, I represent the Harbor Point Community Task Force, uh, which remains opposed to the proposal uh, to uh, build, uh, to lease land from the, McC the McCormick Fields uh, to the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester and build a field house there. Let me be clear, we've heard uh, testimony tonight, we heard testimony at the last meeting about how wonderful the club is. That is not the issue. We have no doubt that club members have benefited from the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester. The Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester operates a facility at Harbor Point. That is not the issue. The issue is where it is going to be put. Originally, the plan was let's put it on the McCormick Fields because maybe the McCormick School will close. That hasn't happened. So now the school committee is being asked to strip away the land of the McCormick School, yet somehow have the McCormick School turn into a grade seven to 12 school that will attract students. I think that's laughable. We have seen no plan as to what the new McCormick School, the transformational school is gonna look like. I'm not pushing you to do it now. We're in the middle of a pandemic, but this is like saying I'm building the swimming pool, but I don't know where the house is gonna be or I'm building the garage, but I don't know where the house is gonna be. There is lots of land in the Harbor Point, Columbia Point area, including the entire undeveloped area of Bayside. I understand the mayor's office is given money. Uh, why can't, to help this process, why can't the Boys and Girls Club build their field house there? You really need to ask why it seems okay to take away uh, the land from a school and from an area that is low income and black and brown students. Um, I really urge you to read my letter and answer the questions asked in that letter. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carroll. Next we'll hear from Antoinetta Brownell, Samantha Laney, and Ashley Clurge. Ms. Hi. Oh, hi, this is Antonetta Brunel. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I just want to say, um, I kind of am rethinking about what I wanted to share and um, somebody stated something to make it personal. So I kind of wanted to make it personal. Um, so this summer I decided I'm a teacher as well as a parent um, in BPS. And um, this summer I decided to actually teach summer school. I did that for a couple of reasons, because I wanted to help kids catch up. I did it to improve my skills so that I can be better at remote teaching. And to see, does re remote teaching, if done well, does it work? Um, I am very pleased to say that with all the support in the early childhood department, that I feel like the remote teaching um, that I was involved in helped me build an excellent relationship with the parents and the students. 
um, I actually got to pay more attention to my students than sometimes I would at school because I feel like all I do is run around and try to manage things. So on that note, I do want to say that remote learning, if done well and proper, can work. I also want to say that I think it's really important that we have perspective. Um, I am not, I, my husband has a compromised immune system. So my thoughts are, I think I'm going to have to live somewhere else. I will not send my kids to school. They will be full remote. Um, that is a fear that is kind of going on inside of me right now because I am not willing to put my husband at risk um, for this. And so, but I understand that there's needs in the school. Um, I am just urging that, yes, maybe there might be some lost learning. Um, that's not going to kill them, but COVID can. And it scares me to death to think that I may be walking in a war zone. Um, it, it also scares me when there are unanswered questions. If there are any unanswered questions or things are not 100% safe, I do not feel that it's right for anybody to ask anyone to risk their lives. Teachers, parents, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, anybody that's working on the front line. Um, I'm also serving on the collective bargaining unit. I have been spending all of my summers on Zoom. I've been on Zoom today since 9 a.m. And I just want you guys to know that um, we need to think outside the box. Like, let's think about instead of what are these parents going to do with their kids if they have to go to work? Let's think about getting those families support. Let's think of making remote learning the best it can because that is 100% foolproof. That is what Thank, Thank you. Sorry. Thank you so much for letting me share. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Our next speaker is Samantha Laney. Ms. Laney? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi, my name is Samantha Laney and I teach fifth grade inclusion at the Holmes Innovation School. And I am here to tell you point blank that it is not yet safe to return to the school buildings, hybrid or otherwise. And please know that I have read through the reopening plans and guidelines, including the ones sent out today. The Boston Teachers Union has been very clear about the need for fully funded schools. But I'm here to discuss some specific concerns that have yet to be discussed because teachers have been denied a sufficient seat at the table. What is being asked of teachers is unfair and frankly, physically impossible, making it unsafe for our kids. Even if all schools were fully funded and sufficiently up to par with CDC guidelines, which once again, they are not. There is no air filtration system in my or most classrooms. That doesn't mean we should just deal with the difficult situation. Even if there were sufficient filtration systems, there is no way that anyone can guarantee that students will allow what is being proposed. Students are human beings who display age appropriate behavior. But what happens when almost all age appropriate behavior is deemed dangerous? What is a teacher expected to do when a student refuses to wear a mask or straight up tries to lick another student? This sounds funny, but it will happen. I already have fifth grade students who would rather get into physical altercations than complete their work. What happens when they find out all they have to do now is lick someone? If no recess is allowed and I can no longer bring in snacks or prizes from my home, how are we holding students accountable for their behavior or their academic work? Not to mention the kids on Zoom. How am I holding them accountable for doing their work or even looking at the screen? screen all while simultaneously teaching a class live. Committee member, committee member Robinson hit the nail on the head asking about the day in the life of a teacher. Most of what Superintendent Caselius proposed is not plausible and much of it, including outside time, is actually against CDC guidelines. It is physically impossible to make sure that 20 students get an equitable education on two different learning mediums on four different scheduling patterns. It is frankly insulting to be told again that teachers will just have to get creative and figure it out. Teachers have been bearing more than their fair share of the burden of our youth since the inception of public schools, and it is not fair to ask us to also sacrifice our health and well-being. That doesn't even begin to address the over-policing of our black and brown students' bodies that will be necessary to enforce these guidelines or the resource access. Ms. Laney, Ms. Laney you're thank, thank you. You passed your time. Sorry, I'm so, I'm so sorry, but that's, that's the general concept. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ashley Clurge, followed by Sean Dabney Small. Hi. Um, can everybody hear me? 
Yes, welcome. Right, awesome. Um, good evening. My name is Ashley Claire J, and I'm a fifth grade teacher at the Hero O'Donnell. Um, I wanted to start my public comment by saying that I am incredibly disappointed by Boston Public School leadership on the issue. Under a false guise of community involvement and engagement, have been extremely condescending lectures on a hopscotch plan, little community voice, and in the few forums where we were allowed to speak in the speak in the community wasn't actually allowed input in the process, just commentary and quickly cut off. Um, this was yet another condescending attempt for a majority for a majority black and brown district um, being told what to do and assuming they didn't know what was best for them. This decision to even offer a hybrid model is extremely irresponsible for a district that serves black and brown families and to have children enter buildings that aren't actually adequate for the 21st century, let alone for the 21st century during a pandemic. Let's be honest and frank. One window, one open door is not sufficient air ventilation. Our buildings do not have the adequate ventilation, sanitation, or safety measures in place. With a pandemic where black and brown people are being intentionally left to die, it, this, is, this is, um, is the district ready to have blood on their hands. The choice to continue pushing the hybrid model is un, unfairly pits the community and the staff against each other. The intentional antagonizing of staff and community um, is so that BPS can deflect the blame is systematic racism. This paired with rising cases is a dangerous type of systemic racism. The intentional creation of a system that has vague accountability is the systematic racism that is the most dangerous and deadly. I implore the superintendent and the district to take bold leadership, safe leadership, one that prioritizes reopening where it, when, it, when it is only safe to do so. We need, a, we need for our buildings to have actual good air quality. My school personally does not. We were rated poorly in Build BPS's plan. We need a plan that, that schools can maintain CDC guidelines. We need a plan that ensures student transportation safety, especially for students that take public transport. We need a plan to have safety protocols with rapid testing and contact tracing so we can not only keep our community safe, but alive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Ashan Dabney Small. Please go ahead. Hello. Ashan. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. All right, thank you so much for having me. Hello, District 3 and fellow school committee members. I'm honored to speak before you today to stand against developers turning this land belonging to the McCormick Endeavor Schools into a field house. As an alum, this field represents many things a hangout space after school for tenacity, the workout space for gym activities football practice damages, and so much more. Back in 2018, the committee vowed to make sure that this land would be used in a way that would specifically benefit the students of the McCormick Endeavor. And now during uncertain times, when everyone is trying to stay safe, they are pushing it and taking away the very place that many black and brown children seek out for a quick break, for a run, or who come out with their science teacher to learn about the stars at the school. Thank you, Mr. Ramapre. When I launched my campaign for city council in District 3, which includes all of the land which is in school, which the school occupies in JFK and most of Georgechester, I promised my community, especially those who are black and brown, that they brought, that be brought into every process and issue. This wasn't the case for this matter. You left out the most important people in my district. The students who attend this school, I get it. The president of Boys and Girls Club visited twice and said, it was just wonderful then why did their wonderful ideas not get included in their final design? And why weren't all of the students fully engaged in the planning process instead of those who volunteered just to go to a meeting? Mind you, this school will be turned into a high school, which means many more students will fill these halls and the land developers want to be even more important as the school becomes larger in population. This is the reason I asked you to vote to keep the land under the control of the Dever McCormick schools, both of which I am an alum and proud product of. Please. If you vote to support this pro proposal, excuse me, I'm not done, then you play with the future of these schools and will choose to play against these students. Thank you, and I give my time back. Thank you. Um, coming up, we'll hear from Sabine Ferdinand, Joel Richards, and Lindsay Eldridge. If you could please virtually raise your hands. Ms. Ferdinand? Yes, hello. Hello, welcome. Hi, uh, good evening. My name is Sabine Ferdinand and I'm a second grade teacher at the PA Shaw School. 
When I began teaching, I made a commitment to teach in Boston because I wanted to help close the achievement gap for students who look like me, who come from immigrant families like me, and generally underserved students. COVID-19 has been challenging for everyone. While I too want to go back to school and return to my normal way of life, we cannot go back until our school buildings are safe. As is the case with many schools in BPS, our school is not equipped to meet the guidelines presented by the CDC. Prior to COVID-19, our school, like others, lacked the basic infrastructure to ensure student and staff safety. For example, we rely on Poland Spring water coolers because the faulty plumbing in our schools make the lead levels unacceptable for consumption. This has been the case in schools across Boston since 2016 and is still not resolved. If rectifying the water issue that wasn't able to happen in four years, the necessary upgrades to ensure student safety and adult safety in this pandemic will surely not happen before September. Last year, Superintendent Caselius visited my school. While watching a few minutes of my lesson, Superintendent Caselius came up to me, gave me a hug, and stated that she can feel the joy in my classroom. This is a joy that I want. Teachers want to feel this joy in the classrooms, but most importantly, we want to feel safe with our kids in the classroom. While teaching summer school this summer, I asked the question, what do you worry about when you're next year in third grade to my students. Some students said they worry about nothing, but then others shared that they had fears. They said school won't be the same. Are we going to die? Eight and nine year olds should not be talking about are we going to die? So as much as we want to go back into buildings, we need to think about the safety of our kids and our families and everybody involved. So I, I urge us all to reject the hopscotch plan. Think about how can we make our remote learning better? That's the thing we need to do. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joel Richards. Mr. Richards? Mr. Richards? Go ahead, please. You could unmute yourself. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, please. Maybe we can come back to Mr. Richards when he gets his tech issues. Uh, can you hear me now? Like, uh, looks like we've got Lindsay Eldridge le next. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. Richards? Yes, can you hear me? Okay, go ahead, please. Yes. Yes, sorry. Good evening. I just want uh, Boston to stop asking teachers to choose between people that they love. We love our families and we definitely love our students. When school was originally closed for the year, it was not easy for a lot of teachers because we knew it would be the last time some of our students would get hugs, food, attention, a stable environment, and to see a consistent person that was there every day. So all I ask is that you please make decisions based on data and mercy and the best interest of the students that are constantly trampled upon, forgot about, underfunded, and over-policed in our city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Our next speaker is Lindsay Eldridge. Ms. Eldridge? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Good evening. My name is Lindsay Eldridge, and I'm a first grade inclusion teacher at the Lee Academy. I wanna make it clear to the members of the committee that there is literally nothing I want more than to return to school. To be frank, I cannot imagine reading another book to my computer screen instead of in my classroom to my students. Unfortunately, due to the lack of <clears throat> funding to provide ventilation, sanitation, and adequate furnishings, I do not feel safe returning. The school committee has had such pointed and thoughtful questions that are a direct reflection of the concerns of teachers and families. However, it would appear that despite these concerns, changes have not been made to address the basic needs of a safe reopening. The hopscotch plan mandates that students sit six feet apart. Currently in my building, after surveying teachers, only four out of our 12 classrooms have sufficient furniture to facilitate this. To my dismay, there will be no, no new furniture purchased, no removal of current furniture or opportunities to access furniture already in storage. It has been communicated that this is cost prohibitive. For safety, 
we need appropriate furniture. Similarly, six out of our 12 classrooms have at least one damaged or broken window. But again, there is not any plan to repair any of these windows because it has been determined that one functioning window is sufficient. To say to students and families in Boston that one window is sufficient to protect young children from a deadly virus is criminal. Students deserve windows that work. We know and understand that the city has disinvested in our facility for decades. However, we are responsible for changing this. Finally, 25 additional custodians have been hired, but there are 135 schools in Boston, not 25. Our building consistently struggles to maintain bare minimum cleanliness standards. Dust is piled inches high, mouse droppings are literally everywhere, mysterious sticky spots are for months. Back add you can't walk past them without holding your breath. How will our building be deep cleaned every day? How can we expect this to happen with the same staffing levels that were inadequate prior to the pandemic? We need additional custodial staff. Please support the BTU's phased in plan for reopening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, coming up, we have Edith Bazil, Mary Claire Flores, Doug McNichol, and Mike Heishman. Please raise your hands virtually. Ms. Bazil, are you with us? Yes. Teachers are dedicated, hardworking, creative professionals, but they are not contortionists. Instead of being recipients of an unrealistic hopscotch plan involving simultaneous remote and in-person instruction, BPS needs to engage these hardworking professionals who work directly in buildings with students in the development of a school reopening plan based on lessons learned, best practices, and the support necessary for a plan to work. The district needs to honor the critical input of the nurse faculty senate, our medical professionals, and they should be intricately involved in the plan's construction. The plan can't lead with science, equity, and transparency without their input in the design, as well as school leaders, custodians, support staff, paraprofessionals, parents, students, bus drivers, bus monitors, and the community writ large. Without school staff's collective input, the district will send the message that BPS's essential workers are sacrificial workers, and we know that is not your intention. Since the academic department heads were dismissed in the middle of the pandemic, the district also needs to share, which they have not, how core instruction will be thoughtfully integrated using technology for all students, especially our most vulnerable populations, early childhood students with disabilities in EL. Mr. Lacanto. Given the monumental challenge of the pandemic to this community, it's also time to reconsider a different school committee format by engaging the public in these virtual meetings. First, it would be helpful to allow participants to be visible if they so desire in this Zoom format. Second, would you consider unlocking the chat box to allow varied participation? Not everyone is prone to speak publicly and it would be an alternative to passive listening. Third, Setting people up for a race with a timer is sometimes unevenly implemented. Instead, recognize the public's need to speak. Fourth, regarding the McCormick project, why now? It should be delayed, especially due to the community overwhelming opposition to this plan. Fifth, provide language interpreters and ensure they speak the same language as parents so there is equity of voice. Sixth, answer the public's questions and provide a transcript of questions and responses, as well as actions you will take so people feel heard. In the crisis of this pandemic, widespread community engagement is necessary to promote an all hands on deck approach. Lastly, the school, the school committee should invite the mayor to address these critical issues with the community writ large, since many of these educational decisions are made at City Hall. I respectfully request a response to these inquiries. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bazil. Ms. Flores is next. Ms. Flores. Uh, please turn on my screen. Excuse me? Well, I don't have that ability, Ms. Flores. If you could just start with your testimony, please. Uh, the person who does facilitate, if you could turn on my video, that'd be great. Ms. Flores, could you please read your testimony? Ma'am, you're here to speak. Your time has begun. Oh my, I was just asking for the person who's facilitating. But my name is Mary Claire Flores. 
I'm a fifth and sixth grade teacher and I'm also a twin. So a lot of you guys might be familiar uh, with those who are twins. Uh, scientists and researchers like to use uh, twins for studies because it reduces the variables. So we have two twins and um, they are both teachers, my twin sister and I. And I'm in Boston, she's in Kansas City. My sister uh, teaches at her school and they decided on June 18, that based on the number of cases in the US, world trends and the deadly nature of a pandemic, that they would go all virtual in the fall. Here we are a matter of weeks uh, away from the school and we just received the first draft of the reopening plan yesterday. Um, and now there are deadlines, August 7th, parents need to make sure they're coming, uh, registering, and then they'll get preference for transportation. This is completely unrealistic and it seems that everyone is pretty much on the same boat, that we need to make sure we're doing virtual learning in the fall. Um, it seems that Michael made it clear at the beginning of this that uh, the school committee only has advising power. So is it just the mayor and the superintendent who are making this decision that's going to affect the lives of thousands and thousands of people and possibly the deaths? My sister and her colleagues have been adapting their curriculum to a virtual space, providing the Wi-Fi technology, emotional, mental, physical resources their families need. They regularly have been in contact with families, making sure their basic human needs are met and that they feel supported, while I have been going to local actions, national actions, been on call after call and call, organizing and fighting against this reopening because it's literally for people's lives. Question, what specifically are the public health metrics? What specific guidelines allow for returning physically to school? You will not have to repeat them if you tell them to us so that we know when it is gonna be safe to go back to school and what you're going by. Because right now, health experts agree, your nurses agree, your teachers agree, your families agree, that it is not safe to go back to school. Your own plan states that it is not safe to go back to school, especially for our black and brown children. So we need to go all virtual in the fall we need to make sure that we are providing resources for those with severe disabilities and that we can come up with creative solutions once we have, a, once we have the foundation and assurance that people are not going to die. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Flores. Our next speaker is Doug McNichol. Mr. McNichol. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, good evening. Uh, I'm here to talk about three things. Um, Wi-Fi, Windows, and Welcome Spaces. Um, in reading the uh, Boston Public Schools uh, reopening plan, um, Wi-Fi and Windows seem to come out, uh, speak out to me. Um, in order to live stream class, classes, Wi-Fi must be reliable in buildings. Uh, much of it is not uh, in, in the Boston Public School buildings. Um, I believe that needs to be looked at before reopening. Second, Windows. In order to get proper air, air filtration, Windows need to work. In my wife's BPS high school classroom, she needs to rely on students to open and close windows for her because they are too hard and tall to do so. I believe this infrastructure needs another look as well. I'm also here to talk about welcome spaces. Uh, I'm here to ask the school committee to vote against the RFP for the Boys and Girls Club Fieldhouse for three reasons. One, taking away outdoor space during a pandemic is illogical to me. This is when we need the space the most. Two, Students were not consulted from the beginning for this plan. Martin Richards' own father said he does not want to support something that the community does not. Number three, what comes after the field house? In this narrative of private companies and organizations taking land from the public, it always ends in gentrification. The land is taken, repurposed, and made for the people who do not live in that area. So I ask the members of the school committee to think about five, 10 years from now, you're walking down Mount Vernon Street with a colleague and you see the field house that was wrongly approved at a school committee meeting in which you voted for it. You also see other developments, condos, maybe a restaurant or two. Will you tell that story of gentrification and how you regretted it? Or will you shy away from that narrative and stand proudly at the displacement of the McCormick community? I believe in, especially in today's reckoning, you want to be on the right side of this history. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Mike Heishman. Mr. Heishman? Yeah, thank you very much. Mike Heishman, Dorchester, member of Boston Education Justice Alliance. Because of time, I'll be very brief about the McCormick. Um, against the propaganda campaign and the theft of this space, a lot of people have come up with wonderful reasons, and I asked the school committee to vote it down. Uh, because of time, I will focus about reopening, restarting the schools. At this July 22nd meeting, there was a long report and discussion about the restarting of the school year. 
What I didn't know until after the meeting was that this draft was done without the input from the Boston Teachers Union and other unions that represent school workers. It is outrageous that the superintendent would come out with a draft proposal without their participation. This draft proposal would have a hopscotch reopening the school buildings. This proposal would be hilarious if I were reading this in a science fiction book. Before Corona, our mayors, school committee members, and prior superintendents have been willing to send many of our children into deplorable school buildings. It will now take time and sufficient financial resources to overcome decades of neglect of our buildings in order to reopen safe as possible schools. The superintendents reported that every school has been examined in great detail. These reports must be made public and should include the level of either equity or inequity. The education of our children is a secondary objective. Our primary re responsibility must be the safety of our children and the educators and other staff who care and educate them. The system must find safe buildings, including student homes, to provide educational services to those students who have the greatest needs. Except for this population, the education of our children this fall must start online. The buildings not, must not reopen without the active participation of all of our stakeholders and until the pandemic is under control. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heishman. Next, we'll hear from Christine Langhoff, followed by Iris Diaz and Tarina Harrison. Ms. Langhoff? Hello. 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 Welcome. Superintendent Casilius and members of the school committee. My name is Christine Langhoff. I'm a retired Boston school teacher, also a BPS grad. My own three kids grew up in the Dan Mar Club in Dorchester. It's an excellent nonprofit and is dedicated to the development of our youth. Nonetheless, I wish to express my opposition to the proposal to convey the field and green space at the McCormick School to the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester. Others have already spoken to three of my points. The giveaway of any green space is not acceptable. It's emblematic of the city's gentrification. Second, during the time of a pandemic, we cannot sacrifice green space due to the negative impact on health on outcomes of our most vulnerable kids. Third, construction of a field house may make it impossible to site the promised new seven to 12 school. Students in those grades must have outdoor fields. But to pull back with the wider perspective, I'm concerned about the process as we have seen it unfold since it was first raised and tabled in April of 2018. In October of 2018, there was a proposal to close the McCormick School. The argument to do so were illogical, and we arrived at the plans to expand the McCormick in a new building on the current site. <coughs> Excuse me. Now in a fine example of disaster capitalism, the public-private partnership is back. This project is being shepherded by Mr. Consalvo, but certainly he acts with the mayor's approval. As appointees of the mayor, you're in a bit of a bind to follow through on his wishes. Public records demonstrate that there is a network of donations and donors among those involved here. The Boys and Girls Club, the Martin Richard Foundation, Mr. LeConte to Mr. Consalvo's campaign, and Mr. Scannell to the mayor. Perhaps this can be waved as aside as cronyism. Perhaps it doesn't rise to the level of corruption. But the optics during a pandemic are not good, and etching the name of a dead child on a building will not sanitize it. Our next speaker is Iris Diaz. Ms. Diaz? Señora Iris Diaz, soy el intérprete. Buenas noches. Se encuentra disponible. Nos está escuchando. Iris Diaz. Me oyen. Sí, me oyen. Can you hear me? Okay. Hola, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Iris Díaz. Tengo un niño de 10 años que estudia en la Blasto. Uh, good evening. My name is Iris Díaz. I have a 10-year-old boy and he goes to the Blackstone School. Me gustaría saber por qué no se está trabajando en la estructura de la Blasto. ¿Por qué si nosotros ganamos 5 millones el año pasado para puertas y paredes? So I would like to know why is it that we are not working towards creating the appropriate structure at school, providing that a $5 million award was given to school for the purpose of having doors and walls. Because we're seeing that basically uh, BPS is not doing anything with this particular situation. 
quiero pedir disculpa a esta comisión si me sienten insistente con el tema de la estructura del hablasto. If I sound persistent, I would like to apologize to the commission here, to the committee, uh, because I'm talking about the uh, structure at school. Pero es que como madre tengo el derecho de estar preocupada por esto, porque mi hijo asiste a la escuela Blaston. As a mother, I do believe that I have to write to be concerned because my boy, he goes to the Blackstone school. Pienso que para nuestros niños y nuestros maestros no es justo operar sobre estas condiciones estructurales. So I do believe that operating under this structural problematic uh, things, it is not fair for the fathers, it is not for the parents, it is not fair for the kids. Por otro lado, quiero llamar la atención de ustedes con relación a la limpieza profunda que deberían de estar haciendo ya en la escuela Blaston. On the other hand, I would like to bring your attention to the inappropriate cleaning. More cleaning has to be done at the Blackstone School. Pregunta para ustedes, ¿cuándo comenzará la limpieza? Tengo entendido que a partir de septiembre 20 empezarán las clases. So the question is, when are you going to start this cleaning? I'm referring to, it is my understanding that classes will start on September the 20th. Para ir a mi casa, paso todos los días por la escuela Blaston. Y miro y miro, y no veo a nadie limpiando profundamente, ni tan siquiera un mapa por las escaleras. ¿Cuándo harán eso? So anytime I go through school, I pass school in front of the school, and I do not see anybody cleaning school, not even people mopping the stairs in front of the school. So my question is, when are you going to start doing this? Señores, no es justo que por nuestros niños, nuestros maestros, nuestros enfermeros y nuestro personal directorio, que aún en este tiempo no han empezado a limpiar las escuelas, que, está, que con esta pandemia que azota a nuestra población. So it is, it is not fair to put all at risk under this particular pandemia that is affecting all the situation. We have to think about the parents and the kids and the teachers. It is not fair that to put, that to put the threat of this situation. Espero que mis palabras no queden en el vacío. Que los niños y nuestros maestros se sientan seguros en una repartura digna y justa. Muchas gracias. I do hope for an opening that has a dignity and that is just, that is fair for everybody, for our kids and for our teachers. And thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Ms. Diaz. Muchas Next gracias, Señora Diaz. Next we'll hear from Tarina Harrison. She'll be followed by Zomara Garcia. Ms. Harrison? Yes, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi. Good evening, everybody. My name is Tarina Harrison. My child attends Orchard Gardens Pilot School to where she will be in the fifth grade in September. I am also part of parent council at the school. I have volunteered numerous times to where I have an awesome relationship with many of the staff and students. I come here today to talk about Orchard Garden, or as we all call OG. As a parent, I do not want my child to go back to school in September because of safety issues. I know before school had let out, they had just, they had just got equipped, well, restocked up on hand sanitizer, soap, disinfect cleaners, et cetera, et cetera. They also placed new, hand, new sanitizer stations almost everywhere around in the school. Just because these things are present do not guarantee our children will be safe. No one can tell the difference from a common cold to the flu to the coronavirus. They all have the same exact symptoms, cough, fever, diarrhea, headache, runny nose, sore throat, and many, many more. <clears throat> flu season is around the corner, is almost around the corner. My friend stated that the flu, is, the flu with the corona is a recipe for disaster. Yes, that is instant death to many people who have underlying health conditions, many kids, the elderly, and myself. All of our children are missing out, missing out socializing and learning with classmates and friends. It's unfair to send our children back to school to try to learn from a teacher who will have an extra task of trying to keep our children social distance from each other. It is safer for them to learn through Zoom until COVID is no longer a serious yet deadly threat to all of us. And also with that, um, this is just, you know, my mind um, going. Um, my child do not ride the school bus, so she is forced to walk to school 
but yet she also rides trans, um, public MBTA to get to school as well. That is also a concern. It's not only middle school kids that ride the bus, but it's also elementary school kids that ride the bus just as well. So thank you for you guys' time. Be safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. Um, next we'll hear from Zamara Garcia. Señora Xiomara Garcia, nos está escuchando. Señora Xiomara Garcia, nos está escuchando. Hola, buenas noches. Good evening to all. Hola. Good evening. Mi nombre es Xiomara Garcia, madre de un estudiante de octavo grado de la escuela Kelly School. My name is Xiomara Garcia. I'm a mother of a student that goes to the eighth grade of the Hurley School. Una escuela con una población de 944 estudiantes, la cual el 51% son estudiantes hispanos. So it is a school that has a population of 944 students. 51% out of that population are Hispanics. Soy una madre bien comprometida con todo proceso relacionado a lo, a lo educativo de mi hijo. Formo parte de los padres de la comunidad de San Steven y he participado en varias reuniones relacionadas a la reapertura para el próximo año escolar. So I'm not part of the St. Stephen's community. I'm not being part of the uh, reopening for the school purpose. And I'm a very committed matter when it comes to the educational priorities that I have. Como madre me siento una gran preocupación relacionado a este tema. So I feel a great preoccupation, very uh, much concerned about this particular topic. Las clases están supuestas a comenzar a finales de septiembre. Hoy es 5 de agosto y todavía no he visto ninguna acción tomada por parte del distrito escolar en las escuelas. So the classes are supposed to start as soon as September the 20th. We are on August the 5th. I have not seen any action towards the opening of the schools at this moment. Para que esa reapertura sea una segura y saludable, se deben de cumplir con todos los criterios de sanitarios establecidos por el Departamento de Salud. So in order to be able to achieve a healthy opening, an appropriate opening, we do have to follow all the health stipulations that are regulated by the Commission of Health. Como ustedes saben, cada escuela está supuesta a tener un consejo, school site consul, el cual debe estar integrado por padre, principal, encargada de familia y comunidad y organización comunitaria. So there has to be a school site council in each particular school that they do deal with uh, this particular community concerns that are related to this topic. Como ustedes saben, este consejo se encarga de votar por el presupuesto de la escuela cuando es presentado, de votar por la constitución de la escuela, entre otras cosas importantes que ustedes ya tienen conocimiento. So this particular council I'm referring to, they're in charge of uh, budgeting issues, issues and votes as well, uh, things that you are uh, knowledge already, that you have knowledge about. Nosotros los padres hemos hablado acerca de todo lo que sentimos como padres. Cada niño y cada familia que compone ese hogar tiene diferentes necesidades, necesidades las cuales son muy válidas e importantes al momento de tomar una decisión. For every parent and every kid, we do have very important priorities, priorities that we have to consider when it comes to making a decision for decision making. A muchas familias les favorece el método de enseñanza remoto, así como a otras familias como la mía nos favorece el método de enseñanza híbrido. Pero claro, queremos que ese método de enseñanza sea uno seguro, saludable para nuestros estudiantes y para el personal docente de la escuela. Tiene que pausar para que le puedan interpretar. So there are two different modes of uh, educational purpose that will take place, the remote and the hybrid uh, type of uh, taking place of education taking place so some of the families favor remote uh, schooling and some of the families families favor the hybrid schooling okay pero claro queremos que este método de enseñanza sea seguro y saludable para nuestros estudiantes y para el personal docente de esa escuela so we have to make sure that whichever method that we select it has to be a very safe method not only for the school but also for everybody for the parents and for everybody it has to be a very safe method Por eso queremos pedirles que ese consejo, School Site Consul, sea quienes estén al frente de este proceso y trabajen mano a mano esa reapertura escolar. With the School Site Consul, they have to be in front of this situation. They have to take charge of the situation and they have to work towards this reopening. Todos los miembros del consejo podemos exponer ideas recomendaciones, modificaciones, y en base a eso, les aseguramos que tendremos una buena y exitosa reapertura. So remember, we, are, we would be able to provide ideas, we would be able to provide recommendations, and based on this, we 
assure you that we could have a successful reopening. Como padres, estaremos al pendiente y vigilaremos y abogaremos por los derechos de nuestros hijos. Espero que tomen esta sugerencia en consideración y muchas gracias por la oportunidad de ser escuchada. Ms. Paris, we will be vigilant, we'll be the advocating for our kids and thank you very much for the opportunity of being heard today. Good night. Gracias. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Gracias, um, uh, Our next speakers are Cade Prockford, Tim Maher, Matthew Reguero, and Sonia Medina. Cade Crockford with us? Yes, hello. Hello. My name is Cade Crockford. I'm the director of the Technology for Liberty program at the ACLU of Massachusetts. Thanks for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, the ACLU is committed to ensuring equity in education. The Massachusetts Declaration of Rights guarantees an adequate education to all students. We have serious concerns about how BPS and other districts will manage the challenge posed by this pandemic while providing equal opportunity and needed resources to every student. I don't have time to discuss all of those concerns in two minutes. So instead, I will discuss some concerns related to technology and privacy. But please do not concern, uh, confuse rather my voicing these concerns for an endorsement of in-school learning because the ACLU shares the concerns voiced by many on this call as well as the BTU about the unavoidable dangers posed by in-school learning during this pandemic. So first, just a couple notes about the haves and have nots in Boston, uh, especially when it comes to access to home internet, broadband and computers. According to the US Census, there are many communities in Boston where uh, large numbers of people lack broadband internet access. So in East Boston, Roxbury, Mattapan and Dorchester, for example, nearly one in three homes lacks broadband internet. In Mattapan and Roxbury, 20% of homes do not have a computer or internet access. Um, so we applaud the district's efforts to, to address these problems. Nonetheless, we remain concerned about the alarming disparities in access across Boston, as well as the plans for implementing the district's proposed technology solutions. To that end, I have a couple of questions. One, does the district have a plan to mobilize with other school districts in Massachusetts and across the country to push Congress to fund the E-rate program? So as you may know, Senator Markey is a top national advocate for putting tens of billions of dollars into this program. And I'd like to know what the district is doing to advance this effort in DC. Second, does the district have a plan to do direct outreach to families and neighborhoods most lacking in basic remote learning technologies? And if so, what is that plan? The ACLU also has substantial concerns about remote learning and student privacy. It is essential that students be provided with technology without being subjected to surveillance. So on that note, we have three recommendations. First, all computer hardware and software companies contracting with BPS. Uh, Ms. Crockford, if I can hold you up for a moment there, you're well past your time. If you could please email in your uh, three recommendations, we'll have this uh, committee review them. Thank can you. Can I just say one more thing, specifically to the Chromebooks, Google owns Chromebook and this company has repeatedly been sued for violations of student privacy, including most recently by the Attorney General of the state of New Mexico, who alleged that the company, quote, collected a trove of students' personal information including data on their physical locations, websites they visited, YouTube videos they watched, and their voice recordings, according to the New York Times. So the ACLU is happy to work with the district on these issues. Um, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we'll hear from Tim Maher. Tim? Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, my name is Tim Moore, and I'm a seventh and eighth grade math teacher at the Linden Pilot School. Uh, more importantly, I'm the parent of a BPS student who begins K-1 in a few weeks. I just want to clarify some terminology. I'm not going to use hopscotch or hybrid learning. I'll call it uh, worse than remote learning. I'll be the first to acknowledge that emergency remote teaching and learning is no substitute for in-person learning in normal times. But being in a hot, poorly ventilated panic room with sometimes masked, very anxious, isolated students who cannot touch any papers, or other materials that I've created while simultaneously engaging those on the other end of Zoom is no better. It is worse than remote learning. I urge the members of the school committee to consider their personal institutional commitments when making their decision about September. Uh, for personal commitment, that would mean going to work every day in a hundred year old building with no air conditioning, not knowing what type of PPE or other safety precautions will be in place, uh, regardless of your own pre-existing conditions or those of your close family members. Secondly, when I talk about institutional commitment, I'd like you to consider the impact of your decision on Boston Public Schools as an institution 10, 20, and 50 years from now. 
I asked myself and urge you to consider this question too. What will my daughter's classmates think when the class of 2034 is graduating high school? When the science has actually been published and reviewed about aerosols and long-term effects, will they hold the grudge that they missed a few weeks of worse than remote learning? And what if reopening is done without the proper safety mechanisms? Will the class of 34 still be mourning the loss of a classmate, an educator, a family member? Uh, can BPS as an institution over the long term withstand such a dramatic breach of trust with the community we serve? I'd like to be a BPS teacher 20 years from now, I was able to look back at this decision and remember that it followed the lead of educators and families and that we implemented a plan that reopened our schools safely and equitably. And you can't see the timer when you're speaking. But thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Matthew Reguero. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Matthew Ruggiero. I'm a BPS graduate, an ESL teacher at Charlestown High School, and a member of the Boston Teachers Union. Uh, I want to begin by honoring the McCormick, where I started learning to be an educator. Uh, the Dever, the McCormick, and the Harbor Point community are asking you to center their needs, voices, and priorities. And this is the same ask that we have for school reopening in the fall. BPS and city leadership must center the voices, needs, and priorities of the stakeholders most impacted by school planning from the start. Uh, these voices must be listened to not just for feedback, but empowered to make and guide the decisions that will make us safe and then able to learn. The current draft plan does not address the challenges in our school buildings, and the hybrid plan places people at risk without a real benefit for learning. Part of this is the reality of COVID-19 and our state and nation's lack of prioritizing schools, but is also the years of underfunding that have led to the deterioration of our public buildings and public services. And it is the fault of our city's closed decision-making process that places power furthest from the people most impacted. Our district and city leadership should not be putting forth a plan, even a draft, that tells student staff members and students to unnecessarily travel to and step into school buildings when we cannot guarantee their safety. If we are actually prioritizing the safety, well-being, and learning of our students and communities, with a process that has workers, students, and families at the table for all planning, then we can actually create a plan for the school year that builds on the strengths and experiences and assets of our communities. I also want to note that while remote learning is the only safe model for learning and instruction, it is alone is not enough for our students to be safe. We must recognize that in addition to COVID-19 affecting populations disproportionately, many of our students and families are also vulnerable to displacement public and environmental injustice, and economic instability. This was true before the pandemic and it has only been exacerbated. While we focus on a safe, equitable, remote learning model for the beginning of the school year, I urge us also all to advocate for, public, for housing relief, uh, PEBT, technology access, language justice, economic and unemployment benefits, and safe working conditions for students, families, and all communities. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sonia Medina. Um, I don't see her signed into the meeting. If you could please raise your hand virtually. Sonia, Sonia Medina, si puede levantar su mano virtualmente. No aparece usted como si se hubiera registrado para la reunión. Sonia Medina, nos escucha. Okay. Um, okay, our next speaker is Kenneth Reardon. And he'll be followed by Sarah. Grocer Nichols. Yes, good evening, everyone. And I think everybody on the school board and their staff has to go to heaven to deal with all of these challenges and to handle it with such uh, equanimity, these long, long meetings. But thank you for this opportunity. I'm a professor and director of the graduate program in urban planning and community development at UMass Boston. So the McCormick School and the Dever School is our neighbor school partners on Mount Vernon. My students and I were deeply involved in a planning process to look at the unintended consequences of the proposed development of the Bayside site across the street, where there is going to be a, a development of three to three and a half million square feet of new development, the amount equal to what currently exists in the Empire State Building, 20 to 30 story buildings, and thousands of additional new cars going up and down Mount Vernon. Um, I say that because it's impossible, I think, to make a thoughtful recommendation about the sale of this land without knowing the larger context. And I think when you do look at the planning history of the area, there was a uh, 
Columbia Point planned uh, about six years ago. There was a Bayside planning process, and then there was the abortive consultation, I wouldn't call it a planning process, with folks at the school most recently carried out by the Boys Club. In all of these looks, there are a number of things that are clear. A, that athletic fields, contrary to what's been cited tonight, are heavily used and deeply appreciated by not only children at the school, but area residents. Two, there's an under uh, supply of high, highly maintained, well-maintained open space on Columbia Point. And the little public space that's there, including these athletic fields, are deeply valued by local folks. And third, the point that I think is most important is that the new development, which is gonna occupy 19.94 acres and bring three to three and a half million square feet on the Bayside site, will certainly have enough options to accommodate a field house. And that was part of the suggestion of the developers that this just wouldn't be a high-end residential area, but a true neighborhood with community facilities. It seems like the perfect place rather than putting kids in this uh, face of ongoing traffic to manage what will become an increasingly busy Vernon. Plus we'll preserve this athletic space which will continue to maintain active lifestyles and the good health of our young people at the two schools. Thank you very much. I strongly oppose the sale of this public school resource uh, for the development of the Boys and Girls Club field house. Thank you, Mr. Reardon. Thank you. And I Mr. Reardon, uh, I did want to correct one item. Uh, there is no sale. This, uh, the proposal tonight is for a uh, lease. The land will retain with uh, BPS control. Next speaker, please, Ms. Sullivan. Our next speaker is Sarah Croser Nichols. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Cresser Nichols and I'm testifying today as a social worker, proud to work at Boston Arts Academy. I speak on behalf of myself and my colleagues who are or have family members who are immunocompromised due to underlying medical impairment. My son has a heart condition. This does not make me unfit or unable to work. We want to work and we are fit to work remotely. To deny us the right to work and force us to take a leave of absence due to pre-existing medical conditions beyond our control is prejudicial. As evidenced by this past spring, we are able to work remotely to support our students and our staff, albeit with continued collaboration with colleagues and consultants, including Desi. Based on the BTU's most recent survey, approximately 64.2% of our workforce is at high risk to contract COVID or has family members that are at high risk. The potential replacement of this percentage of staff would be impossible per to produce in 26 days. Even with an enormous pool of substitutes to pull from, none would have the specific expertise, the relationships or the cultural knowledge to support our students adequately. This would cause further hardship for our students, our staff, and impose undue stress on those responsible for training and curriculum development. As stated in 804 CMR 3.01 Section 5D as authorized by Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 151B, Section 3. It is unlawful for any employer personally or through an agent to dismiss from employment or refuse to hire, rehire or advance in employment or otherwise discriminate against a qualified handicapped person because of his or her handicap. I argue that due to these unprecedented times, physical impairment should extend to family members residing in the same household as those compromised. Furthermore, as a mental health professional, having worked with adolescents for eight years in numerous settings, I believe that bringing students back to school in person with the number of rules, logistical complications, and lack of resources currently in place would put significant stress on our students and cause undue anxiety, specifically to our black and brown students already at increased risk of mental health challenges. We have seen a rise in depression, anxiety, panic, and phobia. Ms. Krosner, you're, back, you're past your time. Could you please summarize quickly? Sure. My primary concern is the increased mental health concerns that would be caused by using the hybrid model as opposed to a remote learning model. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, coming up next, we have Marta Bousmer. 
Travis Marshall and Denise Mercedes. Is Marta Bousmer with us? Yes, I am. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. All right. Thank you for having me tonight. Good evening. My name is Marta Bosmer. Um, I've been a school nurse for a decade here in Boston. I'm here tonight uh, to say I fully support remote learning for all schools in BPS. Um, I just want to know, um, what are the public health met metrics for safety that the district speaks of as needing to be met in order to go back in person safely? And what does the word safe mean to the district? Can they please provide um, your description of this incredibly important word that's being used across uh, the guidelines? As a school nurse, safety for me and the nurse's code of ethics is causing no harm. So I'm gonna talk about some of the high risks of going back in person. Um, earlier, the reasoning to not check temperatures prior to entering schools each morning is because the student may have COVID-19 and may not be symptomatic. Um, I mean, is there honestly a scarier scenario than that? The most recent research shows kids spread the virus as much as adults. Kids tend to not show symptoms. Um, and absolutely, kids can become very ill from this and they can, uh, that many of them have died even without any pre-existing health issues. And these kids with no symptoms carrying COVID-19 will be in our schools, in our classrooms for hours at a time. And they are transmitting the virus, which is airborne and able to suspend in the air for lengthy amounts of time, length, lengthy amounts of time in the micro droplets, that's what they're called, which escape out of the masks, which do not protect you from transmitting or getting the virus because it's only a face covering, not a professionally fitted um, N95 mask. Um, speaking of how COVID-19 is transmitted airborne, the guidelines address the ventilation issue uh, by standing at least one window open in each room and keeping the door open, this is completely and totally inadequate. Um, they really need to have uh, the appropriate ventilation system um, with an adequate and appropriate filter. Um, and then just to talk about cleaning really quickly and all the new custodians and all that, less people in the building making it easier to keep it clean. None of that is able to keep these micro droplets from being suspended in the air and breathed in by students and staff. Six feet apart, it won't do it. Hot day, <laughs> uh, no air conditioner, fans, how do we know that that's not spreading the virus? Um, ventilation is a real problem. It's completely unsafe to be in school in person without the ventilation issue addressed. Um, I wanna thank you for your time tonight uh, and thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Travis Marshall. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Travis Marshall. I'm a parent of two BPS students and I'm a member of Quest Quality Education for Every Student. Tonight, you will vote on a years old proposal to lease Boston Public Schools property, open green space and athletic fields to a private entity for development. In fact, at a time when all BPS families and staff are concerned with how to serve students equitably in the midst of a worldwide health crisis, you spent the majority of your last meeting discussing this land deal. What I ask tonight is why? Why has BPS and this body devoted such a large amount of time to planning and considering this project when the number one issue facing BPS students is their ability to learn in a safe environment for the coming school year? What gain is there for the students at the Dever and McCormick schools to see their outdoor space taken away, especially in a pandemic where fresh air and open space have enormous value to their health? Why now? when all of our focus and energy should be devoted to finding creative solutions for safe learning environments? Why now, when students, families, and staff are focused on planning for multiple contingencies this coming year? Why now, when the McCormick is slated to become a 712 school in the future with needs for playing fields? I fear the answer to my question is simply the continued pattern of insider decision-making with little more than a nod towards stakeholder engagement. Why else would this proposal ignore what students at the McCormick expressly asked for in their meeting with developers? Why else would this proposal ignore area residents' requests for improvements to the open space? Why else would we spend precious hours leading up to the most challenging school year in recent memory on a land deal that does nothing to enhance student health and safety? We have watched this play out time and again, including most recently when students and teachers from the West Roxbury Education Complex were kicked out of their building for safety concerns, only for that facility to be used by the Boston Police Academy. We are all here out of an abiding love for this city's young people, but too often we find ourselves here to disappoint them. Please do not disappoint them tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Denise Mercedes. Denise? 
Yes. Hello. Mr. Noel, I believe Ms. Mercedes uh, needs uh, translation, please. Did we lose Mr. Bernal? Oh, there he is. Gracias. Un par de frases cortas para que le pueda interpretar. Ya puede comenzar. Ok. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Denise Mercedes. Gracias por permitirme dar mi opinión en esta reunión. Good okay, evening. My name is Denise Mercedes, and I do appreciate the fact that you're giving me the opportunity to express my opinion of this meeting tonight. Mi opinión sobre la reapertura de la escuela. Pienso que debería ser totalmente virtual. Ya que el COVID-19 no está nada controlado y nuestros niños no sabrán cuidarse por tantas horas. So, considering that the COVID-19 is not under control yet, I do believe that the reopening of the schools, they have, it has to be 100% virtual. Sé que muchos padres necesitan trabajar, pero nuestros hijos y todo el personal de la escuela no estarán seguros aún. I do believe, I do know that many parents have to go to work, but even though many of our kids will not, and people... The staff at school will not be safe yet. ¿Qué haría yo si uno de mis hijos se enferma? Si estoy trabajando, tendría que dejarlo. Los demás niños de la casa ya no podrían asistir a la escuela, entonces tendrían ausencias. So what am I going to do if one of my kids gets sick? The other kids would not be able to go to school and they will be dealing with absences at school. What am I going to do if I'm at work? El distrito está proponiendo una reapertura híbrida, pero ¿cómo van a, a cuidar ¿Cómo se van a cuidar los maestros y los niños? So the school is actually proposing a hybrid uh, reopening, but my question is, how are the uh, teachers and the students going to take care of themselves with this particular type of opening? Sé que no es igual clase virtual que presencial, pero prefiero mis hijos sanos y con un poco menos de conocimiento a que estén enfermos y con mucho conocimiento. Gracias. I do, I do believe that there is a difference, a difference between in-person type of education and virtual communication. I would rather have my kids be healthier on a virtual type of communication that, rather than being sicker on an in-person type of or education. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tatiana Williams Rodriguez. Tatiana. Tatiana. Tatiana? Yes, I'm here. Hi. My name is Tatiana Williams Rodriguez. I am a foreign language teacher at Boston Line Academy and a member of the BTU. I first want to say that being an educator is such an important part of my identity. However, at this time, I am in a position where I feel that this particular identity may cost not only my own life, but my colleagues, students, and their families' lives. There are a lot of unknowns in our futures. However, what we do know is that we are just in the middle of this global pandemic, not at the end of it. We know that this virus is deadly. It kills even healthy people. We know that young people can contract it and spread it. We know that sustained amount, amounts of time in enclosed spaces build up aerosols that can spread the virus. We know that most of the school buildings are not up to code and lack proper infrastructure in place to ensure all of our safety, such as functioning sinks and faucets, windows that open, rooms with ventilation, bathrooms with windows and soap. We know that realistically, the majority of these structures and procedures will not be available by the fall. Therefore, I am advocating for more time and uh, for full remote learning until it is clearly safe for all. Patience is a virtue. Let's exercise the sentiment by investing our time and resources on bettering remote learning while working on making the building safe for an in-person return. As for reopening plans, I ask for more transparency. If there are some resources readily available for us to lessen the danger, then inform us swiftly and in detail. We also need to be at the table, not just the select few, before decisions are made and before, during, and after proposals are made. Consistent and clear communication of information is crucial. We cannot go back until we know exactly and specifically how we are all going to be safe, even in a hybrid model. I work in a building with 1,800 students with some poorly ventilated rooms. My room cannot fit 15 students socially distant and, it, and doesn't have any cross ventilation. I ask you to consider these details when making decisions. I ask that you cons consider accurate scientific research of the nature of how this virus spreads and assume that it will spread in schools. 
I ask that you make the most logical decisions and not base decisions on short-term goals and on low positive COVID test rates in the state. Even a 1% to 2% test rate contains significant risk in most school contexts. I ask that you think more than just the metrics and make decisions that capture the reality of what the risks are in schools. I ask that you reject the unrealistic hopscotch plan. I ask that you consider our Thank lives. you, Ms. Williams Rodriguez. Please summarize. Of course, in-person learning is preferable, but we just can't do that safely right now. What we must do is to adjust and be patient, use our flexible and creative thinking to get through this pandemic with the least amount of lives lost. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speakers are Glenda Rodriguez, Mary Lewis Pierce, and Diane Lashinskis. If you could please raise your hands virtually on Zoom. Glenda Rodriguez, si está escuchando, si puede levantar la mano virtualmente, usted es la siguiente persona. Un par de frases cortas para que le pueda interpretar. Glenda Rodriguez. Mary Lewis Pierce. Mary with us. Diane Lashinskis. Can you hear me? Yes, hi Diane. Hi, hi, how are you? Um, thank you very much for having me tonight. My name is Diane Lashinskis. I'm a lifelong resident of Dorchester, residing in Savin Hill with my husband and three children. My oldest daughter recently aged out of Boston Public Schools and she spent the majority of her years at the Henderson Inclusion School. I spent 10 years on the executive board of Boston SpedPAC, stepping down a year ago when I was the former director of inclusive services at the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester. I'm also an active member at the Columbia Savin Hill Civic Association. Tonight, I'm here to voice my support for the Martin Richard Fieldhouse in Dorchester. I will never forget the day that our family visited the Henderson Inclusion School. I feel the same way when I walk into the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester a feeling of acceptance, of belonging, a place where you are celebrated for your differences and where you are embraced. I remember walking into both the club and the Henderson for the first time because it changed the course of our lives. Both places helped my daughter develop and build skills that propelled her to where she is today. She's confident, she is strong, she's employed, and she's part of the community. As a volunteer coach for the Martin Richard Challenger Sports Program, parents will often come to me after a game and share their feelings. They tell me how much the program means to them, and for most, it's the first time their loved one was able to access a sport. It's the same for my daughter. The program gave her and others an opportunity that they didn't have before. Volunteers from in and around Dorchester come out and support the athletes with varying abilities. It's a win-win for all. The Martin Richard Foundation and the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester have the same mission, helping kids of all abilities, meeting the needs of the community, and working with the community to address unmet needs. The field house is an unmet need for our for our community it will be inclusive, allowing all community members to come together, not just for sports, but for many other programs, a welcoming space that will be used by all age groups and mostly used by Boston Public School students. The current field does not allow for students with disabilities to safely play sports, always leaving them on the sidelines. And that is true for many of our schools, as we all know. We are talking tonight about inadequate school buildings, about taking up, bringing our students back in these inadequate buildings. Tonight, we're talking about supporting a building that is a new facility. I don't see this as taking away land from the students at the McCormick, but giving them a state-of-the-art facility that most schools do not currently have. This is a gift to our community. and something that all of our kids, including our students with disabilities who are continually left on the sidelines and our families deserve. It will be a place for everyone and will offer something for everyone including the students at the McCormick. I hope you will vote tonight in support of the Martin Richard Fieldhouse. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lashinskis. Um, our next speaker is David Russell Weiss Irwin. If you could please virtually raise your hand. We can unmute you. Is David with us? Okay, our next speaker is Shantai Alves. Shantai will be followed by Peggy Wiesenberg and Melanie Allen. Hello. Hello. Hi. Good evening. My name is Shantae Alves and I'm a pre-K inclusion teacher and Boston Teachers Union member. I return to the committee meeting to implore you, Superintendent, to make the decision that remote learning is the safest and most engaging way for all students to learn this school year, at minimum this fall. Education should be a liberating experience, not a potential death sentence. 
Learning needs to be solely remote in the fall at minimum until we are able to safely reopen buildings. It's not our favorite option, but it's the best option for all right now. As an inclusion teacher, I am required by law and vow as a special education teacher to provide the least restrictive learning environment for my students. Socially distanced with masks, no interactive or sensory play is the most restrictive learning environment. The conditions of most of our school buildings are subpar for any learning environment. And my, I myself have been waiting over two and a half years for lights to be fixed in my classroom, among other things. So many things in so many buildings need to be gutted and remodeled. On April 14th, 2020, Superintendent Caxelius told Councilor Arroyo at the council meeting that, I quote, I don't think we can safely open schools with social distancing for children. My best advice is that for child psychology and for purposes of normal schooling, that remote learning would be better. What has changed? Coronavirus is still alive and well. Advisor Tammy Puss said we cannot retrofit buildings with no windows or air conditioning. So why are we sending students and staff back to unfit buildings? How is that safe and equitable? We are still fighting for funding promised to us prior to this pandemic from the Student Opportunity Act. Now more than ever, schools need more funding to safely reopen. And until that funding arrives, we cannot ensure that schools will be able to consistently provide safe classrooms, common spaces, mental health resources, and wraparound services that all students deserve. We teachers have learned from the spring. And as I tweeted to you on Monday, Superintendent, imagine if we knew now that school was going back to re remote and could spend all of August making solid equitable lesson plans, ensuring students, families, and teachers in Paris have the supplies, devices, and internet access needed to succeed remotely. Now more than ever before, we need the safety of students, BPS employees, and those that they love and funding that will ensure a safe return to buildings to be the highest priority of the district and state. But right now, remote learning is the best option. Thank you very much. It looks like um, David Russell Weiss Irwin is now with us. Uh, yes, I am. Um, yes. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. My name is uh, Russell Weiss Irwin, and I teach middle school language arts at the Sarah Greenwood School in Dorchester, where I also live. I wanna take you back a few months to Tuesday, April 21st, when we all learned that we weren't gonna have in-person school again during the 2019-20 school year. I felt crushed. The sadness of not being able to see my students was painful, but I knew then, and I know even better now, that that was the correct decision. There's no comparing the difficulties of adapting to online learning with the tragedy of losing a human life. I teach ESL. My students are immigrants or the children of immigrants and were hit hard by this crisis in at least two ways. Online learning was harder for them, and their families were more likely to be essential grocery healthcare custodial workers exposed firsthand to the virus, or to be service workers who lost their jobs with few other options, or to be undocumented and not, re and not receive relief checks. They and their communities in general have borne the worst of this crisis, both in terms of sickness and death, and in terms of loss of income. There's no excuse for what has already happened and the lives lost, and there's no excuse for the dangerous, reckless hopscotch plan that is being advanced right now. Just as we knew in April, we know now that it will not be safe to reopen physical schools in September. If we do it, some people, my coworkers, my students, their families, my neighbors, will die. But today, we have an opportunity to prevent that from happening. We need adequate funding to support our BPS families and better learning conditions for our students. We need to pass the HEROES Act and disperse the Students' Opportunities Act money we need to tax the enormous wealth in this city and state to pay for continued cash relief for all people in our city, including undocumented families. We need, we need to make a decision ASAP to resume learning remotely in September so that we can spend time planning the best instruction possible for online learning rather than debating about what should be obvious. If we open with this hopscotch model, it will kill people. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Peggy Wiesenberg. Ms. Wiesenberg? Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm speaking as the parent of three uh, Boston School graduates who attended uh, 
eight different schools in nine different buildings in BPS. I urge you today, like many others, to start school remotely. But I'm here to testify about the McCormick Field. I urge you to vote no on the proposed resolution. What alternative sites has the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester explored for construction of a Reggie Lewis type sports complex in memory of Martin Richard. Has the mayor and his administration talked with Accordia Partners, which has a 99 year ground lease to develop the Bayside Expo Center site to consider subleasing a portion of that parcel to the Boys and Girls Club for the purpose of developing and operating a proposed sports affiliate facility as a community benefit. What's the deal with the city giving away land for development under a 99 year ground lease? What is the assessed value of the land at 315 Mount Vernon Street that the city is giving away to a private party? In other words, how much would it cost the club to buy real estate on Columbia Point? What control will the city have over development? How will rent be calculated during the term of the ground lease? What are the city and Boys and Girls Club's respective rights and obligations, including rebuilding obligations in the event of casualty or condemnation? What strategies will be required to mitigate the impact of rising sea levels and stormwater flooding to the site and reduce the site's contribution to stormwater flooding in the neighborhood? What rights will the city have to terminate the lease for cause or without cause? What happens if the club files for bankruptcy? What happens if the club is put under receivership? What happens if the McCormick Boston uh, Community Leadership School is put in receivership? What existing parking spaces on the parcel will be maintained or replaced? What are the hard costs disaggregated to site work, foundation, base building, garage, contingencies, et cetera? What are the soft costs that disaggregated to time, please summarize. Thank you. architectural, engineering, et cetera? I think it's incumbent on the committee, which is considering this resolution, to ask and get answers to these questions, and I'll submit my written testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Wieseberg. Nice to see you. Health to you all. It's been a while. Thank you. Our next speaker is Melanie Allen. She'll be followed by Sharon Harrison, Mara Levinson, and Jason Lambright. Melanie? Can I be heard? Yes. Excellent. Uh, Melanie Allen, Hernandez teacher, Roosevelt parent, two minutes go fast, so forgive me for jumping right in. The BPS plan has made some important changes, but we can do better. Let's boil it down to three points. One, commit to starting remotely. The notion that we know remote learning doesn't work is a false simplification. We know that what we did in the spring didn't work for all students and failed many of the most vulnerable. But what we did in the spring was to suddenly and without any time to plan, switch to a mode of teaching we had never done. Teachers spend August planning. Let us plan for remote learning in a way that is innovative and engaging. Number two, in September, let us rally our team. Give us the 10 days provided by the commissioner to meet on Zoom with our principals, our colleagues. Let us confirm the family contact information we have with phone calls, socially distant visits, conversations through storm doors. Leaders, teachers, staff, and families have to work together. Let's take those 10 days to get the team on the same page. Number three. Then let's get to work on remote learning with an eye to move to in-person learning for those identified by that team as the most in need of that opportunity. Bring them to the locations that are most able to serve that function. Some newer school buildings might work. So might open spaces of libraries, unoccupied office spaces, White Stadium or the field next to the Dever McCormick. Let's be creative here. Stop trying to solve the challenge of squeezing masked children in forward-facing rows of desks in front of a camera. The goal is not to get the most children into the most BPS buildings. The goal is to get the most children to experience engaging learning and human connection. Let's solve that challenge. Thank you. Thank you, 
Next, we'll hear from Sharon Harrison. Hello? Hi, I'm here. Thank you. My name is Sharon Harrison, and I am uh, the school, one of the school nurses at the William Carter School. Uh, I have been a school nurse for 27 years for BPS. I am speaking to you uh, about my children, uh, the needs of my children, and I need you to imagine, envision my students and the 25% of other um, students who have special needs schools, uh, special uh, health care needs and attend other schools uh, within BPS. Um, first of all, I, 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 the term guardrails that um, Ms. Poost uses is uh, I'm specifically looking at uh, testing and tracing and air quality. Um, I think of those two things as the cornerstone uh, guardrails that my students need. And why is that? Because uh, my students and like many other students in BPS uh, cannot wear uh, masks at school. Um, and neither can the uh, age three to uh, grade one. Additionally, um, my students are medically fragile. And so they have the comorbids that are affinities for COVID illnesses. Um, thirdly, um, my st students, as are the other students that attend BPS schools, come from different parts of the city with varying um, uh, 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 rates of co COVID in their um, communities. And thirdly, my, stu my parents have kept my children home, my students home, isolated, um, to keep them safe so they, they are not in contact with COVID. And now we're going to send them to school. And you're not going to promise my, me, my students, my staff, my parents, uh, that there's going to be testing in school. I like the idea of what I heard Ms. Poots talk about, uh, mobile testing coming to school. Uh, that is truly what we need. Because my children live as do many other ch children live in gray areas. They, they have runny noses all the time. They have many of those symptoms all the time. And how am I, as the clinician, going to always be able to say, you know, uh, I, I think they need to be tested. So I think routine testing is needed. I also think that um, air quality is important. This is a, uh, um, a virus that affects the lungs. And um, if you have stagnant air, then you're going to have uh, COVID uh, virus particles in the air longer. And so that makes a person susceptible. So safety first. And I would appreciate seeing those things done for our, our students because I have to suction students in school. That is not a, a maybe about it. My students will need- Ms. Harrison, Ms. Harrison, thank you. You're, you're past your two minutes. If you would please summarize, thank you. My students need NEBS in school. And so these are the things that I am looking for and I'm asking for your assistance to make sure that they uh, happen before the kids come back to school. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mira Levinson. Hi, uh, thank you so much for allowing me to testify today. My name is Mira Levinson. I am a resident of Jamaica Plain, a former teacher at the McCormick School. Um, and also a professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I'm here briefly to um, discuss the reopening plan. Uh, I was lead author of a New England Journal of Medicine article that came out last week that actually advocated the potential of reopening uh, primary schools in areas with low levels of transmission. But I want to say that we um, did so on the conditions that there were safety conditions that were met, and that included regular testing because of precisely of the asymptomatic nature of um, students uh, who are infected. And it's really important to be able to keep students and teachers, uh, bus drivers, uh, et cetera, and their families uh, safe. We also were advocating the reopening of schools um, in order to enable a good pedagogy. And I do not believe that there's possible to do really good pedagogy that takes advantage of in-person learning if teachers are also required to uh, teach remotely simultaneously. Um, but now I want to turn as a former teacher of the McCormick and as an advocate for the eighth grade civics in action program and for an environmental justice to the McCormick field. 
I uh, wish to join the chorus asking you to vote against the transfer of the field uh, to the Dorchester Boys and Girls Club as fabulous as the Boys and Girls Club is and as fabulous as the field house would be in the area. Um, I do not believe it makes sense uh, to transfer the field now. Uh, primarily, in fact, for public health reasons. Uh, open space is crucial during a pandemic. As Superintendent Casalia said at the beginning of this meeting many hours ago, uh, she's concerned that because it, even if a vaccine becomes available, it may not become widely available and keep people safe for over another year. It is essential that we keep open spaces around schools as much as possible so that they can have the opportunity to open safely and be able to educate well. Second of all, the fact that the community is against it, that students are against it, um, and that um, I, I know from when I was teaching there, but also uh, from the significant documentation by uh, students and community members, the field gets a lot of use. And um, they are putting their civics into action by trying to advocate to keep the field. It definitely needs upgrades and improvements, but it should be kept um, as green space for the community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Jason Lambright, followed by Lauren Peter, Ross Kochman, and Ann Mosley. If you could please raise your hands virtually. Jason Lambright. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, my name is Jason Lambright. I have, uh, I'm a father of three kids. Two of them go to uh, two different schools. One goes to the Murphy Elementary School. She's age seven. She's gonna start second grade hopefully this year. And the other one is going into K2 and she is uh, age 25, starting up before that. I have to tell you, it has been extremely hard. Uh, me and my wife are both very lucky that we have the option to work from home. But if you imagine trying to work from home while at the same time trying to juggle three kids, two of them trying to learn while you're trying to fight them to actually look at the screen and do work, you're trying to fight them to not do YouTube, while you're trying to fight them to try not to do anything but actually sit down, focus, and study has been difficult. So you can imagine when June hit, I was super happy, I was lucky, we were able to find someone to look after the kids for a couple of months, and then we were able to actually focus on work. And I said, yes, I'm getting ready for these kids to go back to school. I know BPS is gonna solve this problem for me. It is going to work. I opened that draft and I have to tell you, I was not happy. I was very disappointed. My three main issues, point blank, one ventilation, one door, one window will not solve the issue of the coronavirus. It legit needs more windows, more ventilation, air purifiers. That is a thing they said we need to have. We don't have them because they're cost prohibitive. So I guess then, you know, then people will just get coronavirus. I'll be fine. Second one is touching. My kids in K2, I don't see my child not touching a person and sitting still and also being able to pay attention to the teacher and the teacher not trying to stop people without doing any type of those touching. I don't see it happening. I'm very concerned about that. The third one, I didn't realize until I read the draft that apparently janitors will not be cleaning the desk. It is up to the children and the teachers to clean their own desk. I've seen my kids' room. They don't do that good of a job. I'm a little concerned about how that's gonna go with actually contacting coronavirus. But my final one is at the end of the day, I have to make a decision. Work or my kids going to a school where I want more confidence and more hopeful in. And I'm not sure if that exists. I need you to do better. I need you to go back in that draft. I need you to try to find ways to fix this problem more so. I know you're only in this your school, but you can do better than what you have right now. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Lauren Peter. Hi, how are you? Hello. Um, I have a daughter who is going into first grade at the Sumner Elementary. Um, we've been a part of the Sumner for two years now, and we love the community there. We also know about the pitfalls of the building and um, the fact that we were providing hand sanitizer and Clorox wipes at the beginning of the year, pre-pandemic, and that in December, we were asked to re-up our contribution of Clorox wipes and hand sanitizer pre-pandemic. I am a scientist. I, my lab works on coronavirus vaccines. I worked all the way through the pandemic and the shutdown when everyone was at home. We we're lucky enough that my husband was able to stay home with our daughter. But I know how six and seven year olds are, and I'm very, very concerned about the ability of 500 children to go back into the Sumner. 
um, with one bathroom and three sinks and no drinking fountains and windows that open kind of and ventilation systems that are definitely on the list to be updated. I think, and I would really like you to, to re-examine your timelines. I think that what we need to say is that September 10th is a, a false deadline. We are not dealing with reality when we talk about deadlines that were something that was pre-pandemic. We need to think about we're dealing with unprecedented times. We're dealing with a virus that can really hurt people and not just kill them, but really hurt them. They, we can hurt our children. We can hurt our teachers. We can cause people to have conditions that they will be dealing with for the rest of their lives. And we need to think about things and go slowly so that we cannot hurt our families and our communities. So let's take a second and really get ready and perhaps open more slowly to keep everybody safe. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ross Kochman. Hello, good evening. My name is Ross Kochman. I teach fifth grade at the Henderson K-12 Inclusion School. I'm also a parent of a three-year-old that will be attending Boston Public Schools in the near future. First, I wanna voice my support for the proposal of the Opportunity and Achievement Task Force to suspend the exam school test this year. Second, I also stand with the McCormick community and urge you to reject a land grab in the middle of this pandemic. And finally, about the reopening, I want to work. I want to see my students in person and build trust with them and I'm gonna help them navigate fifth grade in person. But my wife has a medical condition that puts her in the high risk category if she's infected with COVID-19. I, I wanna work, but I want my wife to be alive. I need her to be alive. My three-year-old daughter needs her to be alive. So if we go back under the current plan, with this current draft, my only option is to take an FMLA leave. My understanding is that I'm not allowed to work during that leave, even remotely. That doesn't make sense to me. I want to work, but this plan won't let me. Please update this draft to allow for health waivers so that teachers can work remotely. Better yet, follow the lead of Somerville, start remotely, and only open schools when it is safe to do so. That way, everybody's partners, everybody's family members can stay alive. But if you must continue with this hybrid plan, if the mayor, the superintendent, and the school committee see hybrid as the only option, give educators the chance to work remotely. This should not be a collective bargaining issue. This should be included in the plan because it's good for our students and teachers. We want to work. We want to work safely. Please put that in the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ann Mosley. She'll be followed by Michelle Carroll. Ashley Barker and Nancy Lesson. Ann Mosley. Okay, is Michelle Carroll with us? Hello. Hello. Hi, did you call Ann Mosley? Yes, I did. Okay, well, that's me. Good evening. Um, of the Young Achievers School, my daughter is seven, and I'm also the co-chair of the School Parent Council. And I am, um, the current plans that are drafted up right now do not support um, the No Child Left Behind Act in regards to health and safety and equity and um, I just feel that we should just take this time, let the children go back remotely, and um, let's you know perfect this draft to where it meets the needs of the children and the staff, um, and a reflective and an, an inclusionary um, measure. Because um, I'm learning more and more about this draft as I hear people talk, and that's not what the news is sharing 
or anybody's talking about, we have our CPS meetings every two weeks and Ms. Martin does a wonderful job reporting back as much as she can on what she has, but I'm learning a whole lot. And that, that I would say a few weeks ago, I was all for hybrid because I too have to work. I'm a director of a daycare center. So, but now it's like my child first. You know, I have to think about her safety now. Uh, forget about my other babies and that might sound harsh to say but it, it's getting real and I just feel that just take this time let us go back remotely and perfect the draft I mean I want to come back but not the way it's written out right now thank you thank you our next speaker is Michelle Carroll hello can you hear me yes okay Good evening, my name is Michelle Carroll and I'm a science teacher in East Boston, a community that was hit hard by COVID-19 and continues to feel the crippling impact of the virus as it surges on. Just this week, the positivity rate of East Boston is 4%, more than double the average of the city of Boston. This spring, I witnessed students and families fall ill, lose loved ones and fight for food, housing and against job insecurities. It was heart-wrenching as I attempted to provide comfort to grieving students through computer and cell phone screens. I wanted so badly to be able to hug and wipe the tears of my students, but it was not and is still not safe to do so. I am trusted by the Boston Public School District, by parents and caregivers, by community members and students to keep children safe. It is my most important job. I stand here tonight ensuring I do just that. My classroom is the space I feel most at home, and I'm longing to return to school in person more than any of you could possibly understand, but only when I do not have to simultaneously risk my life and the lives of students to do so. Tonight, I am asking you for more time so that together we can plan for a safe reopening. To safely reopen, we need functioning windows and HVAC systems in every school and classroom. We need to make sure virus numbers are under control in all areas of the city, not to simply rely on the city's average percent positive, we need educators at the table when decisions are being made. We need to be able to guarantee that lives are not hanging in the balance. Conservative scientific studies currently place the fatality rate of children at 0.016%. Crunching numbers for BPS, that's 83 student lives, 83 children dead. I ask you, how many teacher and student lives are you willing to risk? What number of deaths would you be comfortable with? Are you prepared to look families in the face and express condolences after they lose loved ones and apologize for deaths that could have been avoided? I'm asking you tonight to do what is right for our communities. I'm imploring you to stand up for the safety of our children and prioritize human life over the city's economy. I urge you to have the courage to stand up for these children and teachers of Boston, where this virus has already claimed hundreds of lives. We need your support now more than ever. Please allow us to start virtually. Please allow us the time to create plans that will allow us to safely return to our classrooms and our safe spaces. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ashley Barker. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Hi, um, I'm Ashley Barker and I am a current um, high school teacher in East Boston and I previously taught um, for four years in Dorchester. This past spring, when we switched to remote learning, many of my students and families did not have access to the proper resources they needed and some family members um, of my students were exposed to COVID-19 or tested positive for the virus itself, including some of my students. I was unable to provide my students with the supports they needed for an equitable learning opportunity and that remains a worry for the 2021 school year. There has yet to be a concrete and streamlined reopening plan that is clear for all parties, including students, teachers, staff, and our bus drivers. I, as a teacher, have yet to see what guidelines, supports, and resources will be provided for my colleagues and myself. I want to return to school, make no doubt about that, and I want to provide my students with the best education possible, but not without a safe plan in place. Our students are poor, our buildings are poorly ventilated. Many of our students are taking public transportation to schools and our families are being forced to choose between work and staying at home with their kids. Not to mention our physical classrooms are small, but house large populations of students and teachers. We've seen in states like Georgia and Indiana what happens when schools chose to reopen, regardless if they're at full capacity or not, as well as the lack of safety protocols put in place to ensure the safety, the maximum safety of students, staff, and teachers. 
It is important with the 2021 school year, a month away, that you decide on a model for schools to follow that ensures the maximum pr protection of all parties involved. It is important that you are transparent with teachers on what plans VPS is planning is taken to ensure we'll feel safe and supported for the 2021 school year. This is even more important with that hopscotch model that was released earlier, as well as the 63 page, the 63 page document that was released earlier. I want to teach and I want to go back into the classroom, but not with my safety and the safety of my students and families being put in jeopardy. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nancy Lesson. I'm Nancy Lesson, a retired occupational health specialist and member of the Mascosh Health Technical Committee. My daughter is a BPS high school teacher. Four of my grandchildren are BPS elementary school students. Two weeks ago, I sent you scientific articles about airborne transmission of coronavirus and the need for upgraded ventilation and filtration systems. This science is still being ignored by BPS, which says it will meet CDC guidance by assuring one window opens per classroom in 105 schools without HVAC systems. CDC's guidance did not take aerosol transmission into account when written. Also, CDC allowed the White House to write sections of its guidance for schools. On July 24th, DESE finally recognized aerosol transmission in its guidance for courses requiring additional safety considerations and said chorus, singing, musical, theater and using brass and woodwind instruments are no longer permitted indoors. Meanwhile, on July 25th and 30th, Dr. Caselius suggested that the way to bring joy to reopen classrooms is to have a lot of singing, songs for washing hands, uh, lining up, etc. This illustrates more than a right hand, left hand disconnect. The Berkeley College of Music just decided not to open hybrid and be online only because of the likely spread of coronavirus through aerosol particles. The college's president stated, we were not sure we can guarantee the safety of our students, staff, and faculty. We're also not sure we can ensure the safety of people in the community. An article in yesterday's New York Times titled, When Coronavirus uh, subsided, Israel reopened its schools, it did not go well. It told of hundreds of students, teachers, and relatives becoming infected. The lessons, even communities that have gotten the spread of the virus under control, need to take strict precautions when reopening schools, among them providing adequate ventilation. No one should be in a school building without upgraded ventilation and filtration systems when facing a lethal virus, period. Fix this and focus on making remote learning just, fair, equitable, and spectacular. Thank you, Ms. Lawson. Um, our next speakers are Eugenia Corbo, uh, Imaris Matias, Mike Sicola, and David Noyles. Is Eugenia Corbo with us? Hi, I'm here. My name is Eugenia Corbo. I'm the mom of a kindergartner at the East Boston EEC and of an incoming second grader at the Umana. For kids at home in, in this potential hybrid model, it involves a fair amount of synchronous instruction, instruction with peers in the classroom, with cohorts even sharing breaks. I develop curriculum for a living. In-person and remote instruction, instruction are very different. We're fooling ourselves if we really think that a teacher can do at the exact same time what's best for kids physically in the classroom and what's best for kids learning at home. All cohorts will suffer, so will our amazing teachers, so will the quality of instruction. Expecting kids to take breaks at home at the same time as their peers in the classroom is disrespectful of working families. Who's gonna serve lunch to my kindergartner when both parents are on a work Zoom? What if families want to take breaks when the parents can take a break from work? And I'm privileged as hell. I've even chosen to stop working full time so my kids are not stuck in front of screens all summer. But most parents in Boston do not have this privilege. I can't stop thinking of a black, black mom at my son's school who said last spring that she could only do remote learning after work hours or on weekends because she worked outside the home and whoever took care of her K-1 daughter could not help with remote learning during the day. 
On my own Salvadoran friend, whose kindergartner will likely be in an in-home daycare three days a week because mom works in construction. A daycare provider cannot accommodate the girls' school breaks and 6.5 hours of remote learning. The need for parents to work and to care for their own and their kids' mental health is not reflected in this hybrid proposal. Remote learning requires flexibility to accommodate families. It requires flexible curriculum, especially tailored for online delivery. If the public health crisis allows it, and that's a really, really big if, a hybrid can be discussed, but not these proposed hybrid. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Imaris Matias. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Imaris Matias, the mother of Anthony Dominguez, student at Ocho Gardens K-8 Public School. I'm here to provide you with some information and explain the needs of the Ocho Garden. At Ocho Garden, there is about, about over 900 students, 68 teachers, one full-time nurse, and one counselor. As I know, having one counselor uh, at the school for 900 students is not enough. I think Ocho Garden should be have more funds for more mental and emotional supports. As now that we're in the middle of the pandemic crisis. And our kids need mental and emotional supports because this is a problem that affects the whole family, especially on kids who can socialize with their classmates and friends. As a parents, we have so many questions about what the district has to make to the school to function in all capacity. Are we having more counselors? What about social workers? Are we going to have more nurses? It will be a better training for remote uh, education. Are we, ha uh, are we gonna be able to see what the district's plans for the fully remote education is gonna be? The school needs all the help they can have. Without, without, all, the, uh, without all the help, it will be impossible for Orchard Gardens to provide the, the help that our children need. Also, the teachers need to be able to have a better communication with parents. Our kids' education should be more a team work effort between teachers and parents to work united. As a parent, I worry about my child's safety. For me, hy hybrid auction is out of the question. I don't think our schools are not prepared for the massive impact of these changes. Keep in mind the precautions are not 100% effective to require the social distance and the spread of the virus. It's not only our kids, it's also teachers and the working staff and their family safety. Please think about it and realize what is better for, of, for the kids and families. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mike Sicola. Uh, hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Ah, oh, sweet. So, uh, you know, hey, thank you, everybody, for, for having me. Uh, I'm really uh, grateful for all the speakers before me and really, really humbled by so many of the things uh, that they said. A lot, of, a lot of my heroes spoke before me just now. So, you know, my, my name is Mike Skolka. I grew up in Dorchester and uh, still live in Savin Hill. I've worked in education for 15 years, uh, one of those years at the McCormick, which is why I'm here to talk today. So McCormick staff and students were not part of the discussion concerning the sale and use of the field next to the school there on Mount Vernon. Uh, they should have been. They're important stakeholders, just as, just as important, if not more important, as anyone who actually was involved. Now, there is a relatively easy solution to this. Please, school committee, do not approve the plan for that space as it currently exists. Restart the process, ensure that it is completely transparent and involve all stakeholders in what should happen with that space. I, I honestly do believe also that there are many community members here in Savin Hill uh, here in, in Harbor Point, not just McCormick staff and students who want to share their valuable input. But 
weren't even aware of the opportunity to do so or, or weren't able to originally when it first happened. So especially now that people are fully aware of what the proposal looks like, overall, we, we need more complete community engagement in determining what this space becomes. It, it, it's just that simple. The surrounding community and the staff and students at the McCormick deserve that. And whatever the final proposal is, we need it to be based on the perspectives of all stakeholders. Restarting the process is the fair thing to do. It's the right thing to do. Please do not approve the current proposal. Uh, thank you for your time. I hope you all enjoy your August. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is David Noyles. He'll be followed by Ruby Reyes and Claudia Jimenez. Um, thank you. My name is David Noyles. I'm with Reap Roxbury Environmental Empowerment Project, the youth organization under ACE Alternatives for Community Environment. Now I'm going to try to hold in my anger because I've been here talking with the school committee before about this. The fact that I had to do it in person and virtually, it doesn't sit with me right. I sat with the developers on with the ask of the teachers and students of the McCormick Middle and when I read the Bay State banner and when the developer said that, oh, that meeting was great, I don't understand how that meeting could be great when all the young people in that room said, no, they didn't want this. That this is the only time that they get to see grass because they come from neighborhoods that they don't have that access. Maybe people on the school committee have houses and yards and things of that nature, but that's not everybody's, that's not everybody's um, upbringing. To take away someone's grass, someone's soccer field, someone's football, or whether football Americana or soccer, whatever you want to call it, is down. And during the time of a pandemic, is just downright dirty. Like I don't see how that e this is even coming up at this time. It just shows the lack of trust that we should have. For I don't know how I can trust this committee if they move forward with this proposal during at during this time there are people literally dying holding on to jobs trying to hold on to rent and we're talking about taking away green space from children that asked you pleaded with y'all to just leave their grass alone i am so glad i can't see the people on this i because i don't even know i've seen these people in numerous um years um and i'm not going to call out names but it's just horrible that this would even have to talk about this thank you mr noyles our next speaker is ruby reyes ms reyes Hi, my name is Ruby Reyes and I'm the director of the Boston Education Justice Alliance. I'm addressing the proposal by the Boys and Girls Club to build a field house on the McCormick School's athletic fields. In response to that proposal in May and on April 2018, our school committee did something great. School committee members sought community input in trusting BPS to hold the engagement process, signing into resolution that school communities were part of writing the RFP and ensuring the proposed project would benefit all. Rob Consalvo explained at the May 9th, 2018 meeting that, quote, at the end of the day, if the community can't agree on what the use should be, then it stays just as it is. This would have been an excellent process if it had been followed. Despite expressing repeated desire for green space by students and residents at community meetings, we have not seen any adjustments to the initial plan. It is not underutilized. Why not stick with the current green space, as Consalvo said in May 2018? The mayor should commit $200,000 to a community process that takes place before an issued RFP. Why not incorporate the needs of high school reconfiguration? Why not follow your own school committee policy of authentic community engagement? In June 2020, Denise Richard of the Martin Richard Foundation published a Globe editorial stating, let us continue to take our lead from the emerging young black leaders in our nation and make sure their voices are heard and most of all echoed. What is not being echoed in this proposal is the voices of McCormick students and Harbor residents, our black and Latino leaders who came out in droves to the school committee meetings against the development and wanting to keep their green space. What is also not present is the engagement process you outlined 
that was not followed? Are we to believe in the midst of a pandemic that a reopening plan that needs so much work that our school committee superintendent and central office are working to deny green space for children and residents when it's needed more than ever? Time should be spent on developing a school reopening plan that is realistic and responsible, which the current plan is not. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speakers are Claudia Jimenez, Michelle Kane, Adina Schechter, and Lisa Green. If you could please virtually raise your hands. Señora Claudia Jimenez, si puede levantar su mano virtualmente, por favor. Nos está escuchando. Claudia Jimenez. Okay. Thank you, Juan. Our next speaker is Michelle Kane. Can you hear me? Yes, hello. My name is Michelle Kane and I'm a chemistry, physics, and biology teacher at Excel High School. After examining the draft reopening proposal, I was struck by the fact that relationships and equity are touted as core values of BPS in this reopening plan. That is laughable, as is the assertion that science is driving this decision. Ms. Pust has said that these are difficult circumstances and we all must do what we can as we go back to school. Well, I suggest to you now that we don't have to do any of this. We don't have to return to the physical buildings at all. This is a choice that you are making to receive federal funds. Mr. Lacanto mentioned that it is important that we are all able to react at any moment to the public health data available. And Ms. Pust emphasized that science will drive this decision. Well, I wanna reiterate that science says that rapid readily available testing is one of the only ways to ensure COVID containment and public safety. We do not have this in Boston, we do not have this in our schools, and we have no protocols nor the resources to address students that come to school sick. Wide-scale rapid testing is not on the table, not because science says it is unnecessary and frivolous, in fact, the science says it is critical, but because our country is suffering from poor leadership and substandard public health infrastructure and support. I'm immensely saddened and disappointed that we are spending valuable time and resources debating this preposterous plan and worrying over a million logistical challenges when we could be preparing for functional, safe, and equitable remote learning. As the vice chair mentioned earlier, remote learning needs to be excellent. Why are we not dedicating this time and money to that? Why are we not dedicating this time to updating our crumbling buildings? It is so evident from this meeting that this district and the city's leadership does not care about us, teachers, nor students, nor families. We have begged for change so many times and provided valuable important data only to be dismissed, condescended to, and ignored time and time again. This is reflective of the opaque, frustrating, and disrespectful treatment that BPS staff and families have, unfortunately, become accustomed. I urge you, Dr. Caselius, to reconsider this in-person hybrid hopscotch plan, or someone else mentioned, worse than remote learning plan. And I, I would like to close by asking, Will you and all the Office of Human Capital employees be returning to your offices in one month wearing masks all day? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Adina Schechter. Hello, I'm Adina Schechter. I have been the literacy coach at the McCormick Middle School for the past five years, but next year will be my first year in the newly created BPS position of transformation coach. This summer, I've attended district-led professional development to prepare for this new role. The emphasis of every session has been on family and community collaboration, student voice and agency, and dismantling racist ideas and practices. The fact that the Boys and Girls Club Fieldhouse proposal was slipped into the last school committee agenda during a pandemic when our school is not in session is completely in opposition to the values that BPS has articulated around the vision of district-wide transformation. Our school community has made it abundantly clear that we wanna use the outdoor space for recess, field days, baseball games, community building, and family events. We use the space every single day of the year that is over 32 degrees. Let's ask ourselves a question. Would we ever consider taking away the one and only outdoor space from a white suburban school community? In one year, our middle school will merge with a high school. It is only right that the new school community has a say in what happens to the field. It is only right that during a pandemic, we keep an outside space sacred for our students, who will no doubt need to social distance in the years to come. If our city truly wants to transform, then we need to transform how we make decisions so that we are community-based, giving power into the hands of our students and their families. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lisa Green. She'll be followed by Jonathan Haynes and Patricia Chapel. 
Can you hear me? Yes, hello. Okay. I'm Lisa Green with a statement on behalf of the Boston Coalition for Education Equity. On the Columbia Point Peninsula, the McCormick Middle School is in the process of transforming into a 7 through 12 secondary school through a merger with Boston Community Leadership Academy. The new high school must offer varsity sports to attract students, and fortunately, the McCormick does have an athletic field. But for at least the past two years, some city and school officials have been trying to turn that field over to the Boys and Girls Clubs of Dorchester at no charge for construction of a field house to which McCormick students would have only limited access. The school committee has been asked to approve this plan at tonight's meeting. We call on the school committee to put off any commitments regarding the school owned land until plans for the new McCormick Secondary School are complete and the combined faculty and students can take part in the plan. We also call on the committee to respect the voices of the Harbor Point neighbors who've been maintaining the field and using it after hours for decades. Students, faculty, and neighbors have said clearly and almost unanimously that they want improved open space, not a closed structure covering most of the land. Their voices have been consistently disregarded. It's probably not a coincidence that the residents and students of the area are mostly low-income people of color. While the board of the BGCD includes well-connected leaders in the construction and real estate industries, wealthy philanthropists, congressmen, and celebrities, mostly white. In this period of heightened awareness of the systemic racism that American society is built upon and the structural racism inherent in both education and land use in Boston, the word equity has been used frequently by BPS officials and our mayor. School committee members can now show they mean what they say by listening to the voices of the school and Harbor Point communities and refusing to approve the current proposal to let the Boys and Girls Clubs of Dorchester build on the McCormick land. Since chat's been disabled for this meeting, we'd like to invite members of the community to join the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag BPS chat. We want to hear what you think. Thanks to all who have joined so far tonight and please continue using this hashtag at BPS meetings in future where chat is disabled. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jonathan Haynes. Hi, my name is Jonathan Haynes and I'm a school nurse. If I were asked by a parent or student today, are our schools safe to reopen? It would be my duty as a nurse to place the health of my patients above all else and answer no. Ms. Pooh said earlier, there's no testing available. There's no valid screening method that's available for us to use. Right there, we should know that we should not reopen in September. It isn't the fault of the current school committee or the superintendent that our school facilities are obsolete and that it'll take a massive infusion of funds to make them safe. Decades of injustice in our tax system and our public education funding system have created these conditions. However, it is the responsibility of this school committee to face this fact openly and honestly. Now is not the time to paper over our problems. Now is the time for honesty, thorough investigation, and transparency. If nothing else, I beg the school committee, superintendent and mayor to assess honestly and to catalog publicly details about the conditions that exist in our schools that so many of our teachers have testified to today. Because then it will be clear why a truly safe reopening is impossible at this time. It is a complete fallacy that in regards to COVID conditions in the community, that, that in regards to COVID, Conditions in the community are the only or even the primary factor about when it is safe to reopen. Because if we do not have safe schools and we reopen, we will spread the disease. So conditions in our schools are equally important as conditions in our communities in the decision to reopen. COVID has hit communities of color in Boston hardest. How would the spread of the virus in those communities been affected if BPS had closed on March 6th or on February 28th? instead of on March 13th? How many lives would have been saved? How many hospitalizations would have been avoided? How much stuff, human suffering was caused by this delay? Let's remember that schools have to restart on September 10th. They do not have to reopen. When considering reopening, we must commit ourselves to honesty, transparency, and safety. The only safe way to restart BPS is remote only. Let's start safe. Let's get remote right. At this moment in the history of BPS, to err on the side of caution will be viewed as the bold thing, the safe thing, and the just thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Patricia Chappell. Hi, 
Hi. Thank Hello. you for listening. My name is Trisha Chapel, and I am an education strategist at the Boys and Girls Clubs of Dorchester and work primarily with the teens and tweens. We provide college and career prep along with the career speaker series. My goal for each of our high school members is to provide the resources and guidance to allow them a healthy and productive post-secondary pathway. I'm super excited about the prospect of having access to the Martin Richard Fieldhouse to enhance this program in combining education, athletics, fitness and wellness, and especially mental health. Last year, we restructured our middle school program and created a more intentional and conversational curriculum focus, focusing on social emotional behavior um, and having the children think about their future. Although it was a successful program, it was challenging. Gathering 15 overly excited tweens in a room too small for them was not ideal. They needed to run, to walk, to shoot hoops, do yoga, meditate, something that could help with their transition from a stressful day at school to a productive afternoon of fun and feeling good about themselves. Again, the prospect of a field house to accommodate all these needs is exciting. Imagine students at the McCormick having their own retreat space where they can walk to after school and start their journey to college and career exploration and be excited about athletics and wellness. I often think how wonderful it would be to have, uh, to have a sleek, modern, state-of-the-art field house. How rewarding would it be for these children to pay $5 of their pocket money and make a fabulous investment in themselves? How great would it be to have a field house full of fabulous staff and mentors, mentors to build up lifelong friendships? How wonderful would it be for this field house to be their oasis? BGCD has mastered community building and not only because they have created a safe and viable program, but because they are, all, they are always nimble, willing to grow, make changes, and most importantly, collaborate with friends. A strong community is so important for the success of the Columbia Point Peninsula. This is why the Boys and Girls Clubs of Dorchester was sele selected to engage all children of Harper Point as well as their close neighbors. It can be very isolating on a peninsula and it is important to invite neighbors in. The field house would do just that and knit a host of small communities together to become one big community, unified in sport, wellness, and friendship. It would create more employment opportunities for Harbor Point residents and allow children from Dever and McCormick schools a beautiful place to connect with role models, mentors, release stress, and build confidence. I spent the first 10 years of my Ms. life- Ms. Chapel, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you're uh, past your two minutes. Could you please uh, briefly summarize? Sure, yeah, I just um, I hope you all decide to support the Fieldhouse for the children of the Harbor Point community because they indeed are the most important children in Dorchester. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Um, our next speakers are Maria Flores, Carly Osuelo, Tony Wiley, and James Morton. If you could please raise your hand on Zoom. Is Ms. Flores with us? Maria Flores, si nos está escuchando, levante la mano en Zoom, por favor. Nos está escuchando. Maria Flores. Thank you, Juan. Um, Carly Asuelo. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Carly Osiello. I am the head of community impact at United Way of Mass Bay in Merrimack Valley. I'm also a BPS parent to two children. I'm joined tonight by a group of leaders from Boston's after school and out of school time sector. Through our testimony, we hope to communicate that the out of school time field stands ready to partner with BPS schools to support students and ensure that reopening is as equitable as possible. United Way is one of the largest funders of after school and summer learning programs and we're proud to support over 60 out of school time providers in the region through grants and our BOSTEM initiative with Boston Public Schools. These community-based organizations work tirelessly to amplify students' academic and social emotional development, keeping kids safe and supporting working families. The COVID crisis has revealed the deep, long-standing inequities in our city's social infrastructure. And yet, amidst, amidst this time of great uncertainty, out-of-school time programs have stepped up to deliver programming virtually and ensure that BPS students could still have a summer filled with learning and enrichment. As you'll hear from my colleagues, these programs are critical lifelines for countless 
campus and families. Regardless of whether BPS schools move forward with hybrid learning or go fully remote, after school providers are well positioned to partners with schools, as noted by Superintendent Caselius, providing safe, culturally grounded, enriching experiences. As we know, schools can't do this alone and BPS should look to the out of school time field as a key ally in order to deliver on the district's goals of equity and, school and student success, school community partnerships must be part of this equation. We look forward to working with you to find creative solutions to reach both Boston's most vulnerable students and to better align with what happens during the school day and out of school time. I'll let my colleagues who represent the best of Boston's out of school time sector share how their organizations are positioned to help meet the needs of students this fall. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tony Wiley. You could virtually raise your hand, please. Uh, James Morton. Welcome. James Morton. Uh, I am the President and CEO of the YMCA of Greater Boston. Um, and uh, I've been on this call for about five hours. I've been really uh, deeply uh, moved uh, by uh, lots of the uh, testimony that we've heard this evening. Um, it is clear that this is a community of uh, caring adults who want to make the right decisions, uh, want to make the best decisions to uh, uh, determine the best ways in which to serve the, uh, the needs of our students. Um, and I've been, I've been very moved by what I've heard. Uh, we at the YMCA of Greater Boston uh, want to partner with the schools uh, to do the best that we can to support learning in the out of school time. I've had several conversations with, uh, with many of you uh, on the call uh, about that very issue and the ways in which we might be able to support student learning um, in those times when the kids are uh, with us and other youth serving organizations. Um, I, I have been uh, moved by the conversation about the importance of partnerships, um, uh, integrated partnerships, ways in which the, the schools and our nonprofit uh, organizations uh, can work together to find ways to best support the needs of the needs of students, and those needs are tremendous. Um, you know, at, in in our after school programs, we provide opportunities for uh, simple things like physical movement and and a nutritious snack, but we also provide opportunities for social emotional learning uh, for uh, for young people to uh, uh, get the academic support that they need through tutorial uh, services, um, and they also get an opportunity to develop a relationship. Uh, with a caring adult outside of their uh, outside of their home and in addition to their teachers. And so with all of that said, um, we're very pleased to uh, be a part of this effort to make sure that we're supporting uh, children in the best possible ways and to do that uh, uh, in the out of school time uh, as we do during the summer and as we have been doing during our provision of emergency child care services to uh, the children of essential workers. Uh, we've proven our ability to provide those services and to do it in, in such a way um, that keeps both uh, children and staff uh, safe um, uh, and protected as best we can from, from the coronavirus. And so with all of that said, um, I thank you for everything that you are doing in support of our children and look forward to finding ways to partner with you so that we can uh, make sure that every one, of the, uh, every one of our children reaches his or her fullest potential. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Selena Miranda, followed by Helen Russell, Emily Lewis, and Chris Smith. If you could please raise your hands on Zoom. Selena? Uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, hello. Oh, wonderful. Uh, good evening. My name is Selena Miranda, and I'm the Executive Director of Hyde Square Task Force. I do want to echo what my colleague just said. I want to thank you for all the all the thought that you're putting to, um, to thinking about the plan for reopening. Uh, and also, um, I'm very moved by all the testimony that we've heard tonight. Um, I, I am the Executive Director of Hyde Square Task Force. We are a creative youth development organization located in Boston's Latin Quarter, otherwise known as Hyde Square uh, or the Hyde Jackson Square area in Jamaica Plain. Our core program, Jovenes in Acción or Youth in Action, works with youth in grades eight to 12, combining Afro-Latin arts with education supports and civic engagement and leadership development to ensure that our young people grow as artists, scholars, and leaders. Our other core program focuses on providing one-on-one -on -one coaching to college students so they stay on track and graduate college on time. 
Through these programs, we work with over 400 Boston Public School students and our graduates each year. I am here to stress, along with my colleagues, uh, the importance of out of school time programs in the lives of, Bo of Boston Public School students. In the middle of this pandemic, our role has been even more important. In March, like many of, uh, of my colleagues, we shifted to a virtual mode of program delivery. We have also doubled down on the emotional support, support we provide our students. Fortunately, we have a youth supports coordinator with a social work background on the team who is able to provide targeted emotional support to our youth when they need it most. Over the past few months, uh, she has been checking in with our youth in greater frequency while all of our staff are, and while all of our staff are holding up our youth and families, our keen focus on the social emotional support of our young people has risen to a greater importance during these difficult times. I share this to emphasize that the out of school time programs are more than places that keep youth safe. We have always been a criti critical to filling the ever widening opportunity gaps in our city. The current crisis has magnified what we, we have always known to be true. Our most vulnerable youth, ELL students, immigrant students, black and brown students, and students who reside in low-income households bear the brunt of our city's inequities. I urge Boston Public Schools to think of the after, of after school programs not only as nice to haves, but as critical partners in the reopening plans. We need to be at the table as the decisions you are making directly and indirectly impact our work. We also have connections to students Ms. that can Miranda, help your overall goals. I'm sorry to interrupt, I'm but you're past dying. your uh, two minutes for speaking. Could you please uh, uh, briefly sure. summarize? I, I, Thank I'm you. summarizing right now. I just want you to know that you know we also have connections to students that can help your overall goals and can help mitigate the learning loss and academic disengagement that so many of us are deeply concerned about. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Helen Russell. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hello. Hi, uh, my name is Helen Russell. I am the Executive Director of Apprentice Learning. We are founded in 2012 and we provide summer and school year career education programs for middle school students in five Boston public schools. <clears throat> the schools are the Boston Teachers Union, the Dearborn, the Jackson Mann School, the Hernandez and Mission Hill School. School year programming occurs as an integral part of the school day and includes learning in the workplace. And these programs are offered at modest cost to participating schools. For the upcoming school year, we will be offering virtual career apprenticeships for 200 eighth graders in these partner schools. Since July 8th, 36 BPS 9th and 10th graders have been learning professional skills and exploring STEM careers with local businesses in our city summer internship program. The program has been generously supported by YouthWorks and the Boston Private Industry Council. It's been entirely virtual. In our transition to virtual programming, we had a lot of doubts about how a highly experiential program could shift to an online format but it's been very positive. We've learned a lot about how eager young people are to get back to work and the enormous gap in their technology skills. We'd love to share our practices to support BPS, especially by offering virtual learning that can help young people sustain hope for their future career dreams. Superintendent Caselius, we offer a full support to you and to the teachers, school leaders, and families. These are especially difficult times and especially difficult for children. And we share your commitment to serve our students. I just have one question and that's how can apprentice learning be helpful? We like all of the BPS school partners are eager to be of service as a resource for a safe reopening. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Emily Lewis. Oh, can you hear me? A little bit louder, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, great. Awesome. Good evening, my name is Emily Lewis. I'm here as the Manager of Arts, Culture, and Civic Engagement at Sociedad Latina. 
with our out of school time partners, Boston After School and Beyond, United Way, Hyde Square Task Force, Sportsman's Tennis, Apprentice Learning, and the YMCA of Greater Boston to share that we are eager to support youth, families, school leaders, and teachers with school reopening. First, we'd like to thank the mayor and the city of Boston for the quick action taken to keep our city safe, as well as the breadth of services provided to the community. We thank and support the mayor's stance on calling racism out as a public health issue. We also want to thank Dr. Caselius and the many BPS staff who worked tirelessly to provide meals, technology, and different supports to BPS students and their families. Out-of-school time partners play a crucial role in the success of students' education, career readiness, and workforce development. They also play a vital role in creating deep and meaningful relationships with students and families. These relationships often bridge communication between school and home. During the spring, Sociedad Latina ensured that all the young people that we work with successfully transitioned to online programming. We went above and beyond to guarantee the students had the necessary technology and resources to set them up for success in a remote learning environment while providing daily academic support as well as regular check-ins to support their social emotional development. Additionally, we worked closely with families to make certain that they had access to any resources available, including giving out $50,000 in cash assistance. We joined and continued to take part in numerous committees and collaboratives while still attending countless meetings where we plan, brainstorm, and express the needs and opportunities to support young people holistically in and out of the classroom. Youth are in need of the social emotional learning and support that out of school time partners provide within school buildings, in the community and in their homes. We are here to let you know that our sector is ready, willing and able to partner with the district to support BPS students and their families. Our OST partners stand at the ready to partner with you to assure a successful school reopening this fall. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Um, our next speaker is Chris Smith and he'll be followed by Rosie Hosking, Allison Doherty, Denise Barry, and Velma Glover. Mr. Smith? Thanks, Liz. Hello, everyone. Chris Smith, Executive Director of Boston After School and Beyond. I wanted to answer Michael O'Neill's question from earlier. Yes, summer offers lessons for fall, back to school, back to learning. Um, through a collective effort, 164 programs, actually the highest ever, serve close to 12,000 kids this summer, both remotely and importantly, 45 did so in person, providing necessary childcare connection and physical activity. They made creative use of parks, playgrounds around the city, and even boats. Um, camp staff from uh, the Blue Hills, Harbor Islands came into the city to provide programming. And this was the re result of planning that began on March 13th, the day schools closed. Uh, Superintendent Caselius and her team that evening got on planning for summer. And it worked. We have a lot to share on both uh, remote learning and in-person strategies for the hours and the days that students are not in school. So we look forward to working with the district and individual schools as we gear up our network of programs, which are at the intersection of childcare, learning, relationships, and skill development. So thanks for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rosie Hosking. Hi, thanks for giving me the opportunity. I am the parent of an incoming K-1 student. I'm a biomedical scientist. And together with my neighbor, who is also a BPS parent and a child psychologist, I sent my written testimony via Ms. Sullivan to you all. I want to focus on a couple of quick points that uh, reiterate what has already been said and then also things which I haven't heard yet. The first is that City Hall absolutely has to support what BPS is trying to do. And I haven't heard much about advocacy from the school committee and Dr. Caselius to Marty Walsh and his team. Um, but this is essential. We have to get City Hall to understand that schools are the beating hearts of our community and everything else to do with reopening needs to be carefully put together to support that goal. Community transmission must stay low in order for schools to reopen. Marty Walsh must give more money to BPS. I don't understand 
as a new uh, parent in Boston, why the funding is why it is, but if not now, during the pandemic, when will it improve? It has to be now. So keep the pressure on him and get more money for all the things that need to happen. As a scientist, I can agree with what has already been said about the absolute essential nature of surveillance testing in schools, at least for the adults. So that means every week, all the adults get a COVID test with a rapid result that can then help shut down outbreaks. Schools cannot reopen safely without that step. Now that can happen if there's funding and desire to make it happen. Cambridge Public Schools and Somerville Public Schools are looking into this right now and they're going to make it happen. I encourage Dr. Caselli to speak with these superintendents as well to share best practice and information about how to make this a reality. In my written testimony, I talk about why we should prioritize elementary schools for reopening first. And you can read those remarks. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Hosking. Our next speaker is Alison Doherty. Hello, good evening. I hope you guys are all still awake. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Okay. Hello, my name is Allison Doherty. I am a 22-year veteran teacher of the Boston Public Schools, a graduate of BPS, and a parent of two elementary school students in BPS. While I understand these are unprecedented times and we all need to think outside the box, hopscotch is unsafe. I worked in a building for 20 years, West Roxbury High slash Education Complex. It was grossly ne neglected for generations. The building was closed because it became too expensive to fix. My point of bringing this up is that parents, teachers, students, and staff had asked, begged, pleaded to have our buildings fixed and our schools funded. These calls for help have mostly been ignored for decades. Now there is a pandemic and magically our buildings that have no warm water, soap ventilation systems, or, or windows that open will be ready in September. Our buses that have had a myriad of timing issues will have time to be cleaned in between each run. Classrooms that have no windows that open, such as mine, which was 84 degrees all winter with no ventilation, will not be used. And that's fine, but where will my self-contained classroom of high-need students go? As we have seen in the news, other districts that have opened in person have closed immediately. Why don't we spend time focusing on an excellent remote learning plan to open up schools instead of knowing, not knowing what to plan for? We will close, that is a given. Why gamble with lives? This pandemic will end like the 18, 1918 flu did. Why possibly extend the timeline or increase the death rate by mass exposure? We know we can't do group learning, sit on rugs, play taggy, lunch in the cafeteria, play most sports, comfort a crying kindergartner, have a one-on-one -on -one conference at the teacher's desk. School will not be the same. In your press conference today, Superintendent, you stated repeatedly that there is much uncertainty. We must learn together and it takes a village. Due to this uncertainty, I do not want to learn together how many cases will develop from in-person learning. I do not want to learn together of students, caretakers, bus drivers, and or educators dying. Are you certain during this time of uncertainty that you can protect the city from this? It takes a village, it does. A village that works together to protect each other and support each other. I want to go back, I want my children to go back, but only when it's safe. The plan that the district has rolled out does not meet expectations. I support fully remote start to 2021 school year, and I hope you do too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Doherty. Our next speakers are Denise Barry, Velma Glover, Camila Washington, and Elizabeth Yoshimura. If you could please raise your hands on Zoom. Is Denise Barry with us? Velma Glover. Camila Washington. Welcome. Camila. I can hear me. Yes, welcome. Hi, my name is Camila Washington, and I'm the Athletics Director at the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester, and I am here to state why we deserve to have the Martin Richardson Fieldhouse. Um, although I know this is a rough time for everybody, um, I want to look at the positives of having this fieldhouse and the opportunities it will provide for all children, all children of color. 
Boston um, Boys and Girls Club Dorchester provides many opportunities for young children of all races and backgrounds across Dorchester. The benefits I've seen while working there are health and nutrition, social justice, bullying, black history, going to Disney, going on skiing trips, camping, going to sporting um, outing games, going, learning about music and education, and even having a teen center. Having this field house will not only bring together more people and children of color, but it will bring together friendship and a diversity in the community. During this summer session, I've been working with the teen center and we've been doing a social justice program. Although we've only been talking about social justice and racism, we've also been talking about opportunities. So why not give them the chance to have this opportunity? What kid wouldn't want to have an amazing field house? What kid wouldn't want to live up to that dream? This will give them the benefits that they deserve and the opportunities that they deserve. This is not going to separate them from the McCormick School. It's gonna bring them together with the other kids of the Boys and Girls Club community. So I hope you guys would vote yes, again, uh, yes for this uh, field house. And I also wanna say that I think that BPS should be opening remotely as well, because you also have to think about the um, out of school staff as well and their health in this situation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Yoshimura, followed by Bianca Perilla and Juanita Lane. Is Elizabeth with us? Okay. Bianca Perilla. Hello? Hello. Hi, yes. So Hello, board members, superintendent. My name is Bianca Perla. I am addressing the proposal by the Boys and Girls Club and the Mayan Richard Foundation to build a field house on the McCormick School's athletic field. In response to the proposal in April and May of 2018, our school committee addressed the issue in favor of the McCormick kids and the neighborhood by not transferring the land to the Department of Neighborhood Development. Now, this has become a struggle to preserve this valuable parcel of land, which benefits a vast majority of low-income youth, Black, Hispanic, and Asian. For McCormick students and the neighborhood, open athletic fields provide greater opportunities for learning, recreation, and is an extremely healthy environment. I have been a resident in Harbor Point my whole life, and I have seen with my own eyes and through my own experiences that the McCormick School's open athletic field has been put to use and should be here to stay. I am part of the Tiger Squad at Harbor Point, which is an acronym for Teens Initiative Gathering Educational Resources. As a member, I address tasks completing the maintenance and landscaping to allow our community to enjoy the resources offered, including the open athletic field between the McCormick and Dever schools and the Harbor Point apartments. Even after a long day of cleaning the field, my team members and I would play kickball outside. An enclosed field house takes away the outdoor playing experience and fresh air. In addition, we have scheduled softball games where youth members and students from McCormick who are part of the Harbor Point community would come to the field playing till the sun went down. Such great memories. Memories kids at the field house wouldn't have the opportunity to say. Open athletic fields benefit children and adolescents more as they can interact with the environment, allow for stronger immune system, and most importantly, it benefits their cognitive development. A building has a much detrimental impact on the environment and our planet is already at risk. We need as many green fields as possible so our children and the future generations appreciate the outdoors instead of being in another building as the field. This is a form of a gentrification and an issue about residents and students' needs. Their voices are being re erased and on top of that much needed green space, especially now during the pandemic. Why accept a proposal that destroys green space and ignores the voices of students and the Dorchester residents? I ask that you vote against the boys and girls proposal for Fieldhouse. Thank you and hopefully we can all get some sleep soon. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Perella. Our next speaker is Luanita Lane, followed by Eolani Perella, Richard Fulham, and Sharon Kunz. Ms. Lane with us? Ilani Perilla. Ilani. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me. 
Um, hello, board members, superintendent. My name is Aolani Perella. I am addressing the proposal for the Boys and Girls Club and the Martin Richard Foundation to build a field house on the McCormick School's athletic fields. In response to that proposal in April and May 2018, our school committee addressed the issue in favor of the McCormick kids and the neighborhood by not transferring the land to the Department of Neighborhood Development. As a Harbor Point resident, the McCormick Field has always been a place where I would spend time playing softball or basketball with my family. Now as an adult, I've seen other children and adults use the field to play sports, spend quality time making friends, and getting some fresh air. Moreover, green space can allow our children to enjoy being outside as quarantine has brought cases of depression and stress in students from being inside. The outdoors and fields have given youth in our neighborhood and the opportunity to no longer be inside four walls and be with friends while implementing social distancing and wearing a mask. This is a call for action as this field house is not going to benefit our low income minority students or residents with after school memberships that cost and the lack of racial equity. Low income students who want to play sports but then have to pay. There is no BPS system in which students should pay to play sports and that is not fair. I have seen the students of McCormick endeavor play sports on the field as well as football, softball and basketball. I could see the enjoyment of being outdoors and doing something that is a mental break from schoolwork indoors. The Harbor Point residents and McCormick students have been fighting to keep their green space for the past two years. The proposal is not a priority right now as school communities are still figuring out how to deal with the pandemic learning loss and preparing for school reopening. Our school communities are in need of more outdoor green space for social distancing needs. I ask that you vote against the Boys and Girls Club proposal for the field house and I also would like to add that um, an observation, um, I know a lot of high schools in the suburbs and rural areas where they have outdoor fields. And I believe that the McCormick School in which will become a high school should deserve to have that outdoor field and continue the tradition of high schools in the United States that have that outdoor field. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perella. Our next speaker is Richard Fulham. He'll be followed by Sharon Kunz and Ryan Batez. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Oh, okay, very good, thank you. Uh, I am uh, speaking in favor of the Martin Richard Field House. Um, I am a lifelong Dorchester resident and I have been working on Columbia Point for over 38 years. Um, the McCormick Field I feel has been underused and underutilized. And I would ask that you vote in favor of it and look at this as not a land grab, but an improvement to a parcel that is underused um, that will provide recreation, wellness, and inclusion 12 months of a year. My argument to those opposed to it is there is open space along Harbor Point's Harbor Walk, Harbor Point itself, the Moakley Park is less than a five minute walk with fields. Uh, it has undergone uh, an extensive renovation. There is plenty of open space. And uh, if the McCormick does become a seven to 12, um, which I, I don't know if that's gonna be the case or not, but if it does, there's partnerships here with UMass Boston, BC High uh, for those fields. And I, I think that would be a great opportunity there as well. But I think that the field house would provide 12 months of recreation and wellness for the um, residents of Harbor Point and the students of the McCormick. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Kunz. Ms. Kunz with us. Um, Ryan Batez. Hello. Hello, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for um, spending so much time on these different, different uh, topics. My name is Ryan Batez. I work for the management company at, um, that manages Harbor Point Apartments. And I just wanted to voice my, my voice my support for the Boys and Girls Club 
Um, they've been a partner with us. They've, um, they run our after school program. They run our um, summer camp and they run our um, early learning center and they've been a great partner. And I really think that they'd be a great addition um, to have the field house. So I just wanna voice my, my support for them and I wanna thank your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rebecca Mulligan. She'll be followed by Edward Perilla, Alexander Reyes, and Danielle Turney. Rebecca? Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Rebecca Mulligan, and I teach at Boston International Newcomers Academy. While I love and miss my school community dearly, I'm here to ask that you move the start of our school district school year to remote learning. Our quick turnaround this school was haphazard, and I'm asking us to show that we learn from that lesson. The sooner we come to a decision for remote classes, the better our teaching and learning will be. Cases are rising in mass, and we know that down ticks do not come quickly. We can make a decision based on science now. If we wait until after the school year has started, the first positive tests in our school community will make the decisions for us, possibly even in the first week of school. In Boston, siblings from the same households attend different schools. One positive test in a class would mean those students would need to quarantine for 14 days, as well as potentially their siblings, their siblings' classmates, and on and on. Desi informed the public this week that while they assume COVID cases are inevitable in schools, Mass is not formally tracking COVID outbreaks in schools, and there's no formal reporting process for schools. Lack of accurate testing strategies should not mean that we continue anyway. It means that we should wait until we can and do track cases. Each school community is made up of a wide social network. The middle of a pandemic is no time to step physically into its center and blindly offer its channels to the spread of a deadly virus. A hybrid plan at this point is dangerous for the community at large. Teachers leave vectors between rotating groups of students, as well as students who come to school four days a week. Students in daycare settings when they are away from school will bring the impact of those set contacts into schools. Lastly, I've heard the district speak a, lot about, speak a lot about equity being a motivator to return to our school buildings this fall, but I would also like to point out that our communities of color in Boston who make up 47% of our city have experienced 75% of Boston's COVID cases. And among Bostonians who lost their lives to COVID, 66% were people of color. We know that 86% of BPS students are students of color. Ignoring this data is ignoring the value of their health and their lives, their families' health and their families' lives. This is an issue of equity and racial justice. Therefore, I ask you to please make the decision to begin our year remotely. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Mulligan. Our next speaker is Edward Perilla. Is Edward with us? Alexander Reyes. Alexander. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Hi, good evening. I'm, I'm here to voice my support for the Martin Richards Field House. As a former employee, alumni, parent, product of the community, still living in the community, raising a family in the community, and working in and around the community, I can personally attest to the greatness of this organization, but more importantly, the need for it. As cliche, cliche as it may sound, as many times as, as you may have heard it, uh, allow me to say it again, the Boys and Girls Club, AKA the club has helped change lives. Uh, growing up, it, it has helped my generation of club goers as, as it did the generations before me and after me with a safe place, a comfort zone, surrounded by people who genuinely care and connecting us with other kids in the community who we can explore and experience new things with. I didn't realize it then, but the club was helping to mold me into a contributing member of society. It was at the club where I got my first job. It was at the club where I learned how to write a resume. It was at the club where I was able to see that doing the right thing is the right, is the right thing to do, but also a good thing. I learned that caring never gets old, it gets paid forward. We're all in this together. Each one teach one, be the change you want to see in the world. And I am my brother's keeper. From a kid to, young, to, you, to a young teen, to young adults, to adulthood, the club has always played a part in my evolution, which is a great in and of itself. But the better story is that I'm only echoing the story of many, 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 many other boys and girls. From one generation to the next, I have 
I now have a little girl, she's 10 years old, and she's been there since the age of three. When her grandmother became too ill to care for her, the clear and obvious answers as to who would care for her, the club was a place. No other place I would rather have her be. I'm very particular about where I leave my child, especially at such a young age, and because of the papa bear in me, it was, it was an easy choice. Being able to trust someone with the most important person in my life is a big deal and not one I take lightly. I trust the club and I trust what they are doing and the direction they are moving in. It's rewarding and it's nostalgic to see her enjoy her time at the club and the club enjoys having her there. As a police officer, I, for, I know firsthand the benefits of having a community centers, buildings, agencies dedicated to the members of the community to help pull them away from the dangers of the community and also turning them away from being a danger in the community. I am all in for this project. I am really excited to see it up and running and the benefits that, the benefits that come along with it. I've seen the rendering and it's truly an impressive place with great intentions. The club has done it again. The great minds and hearts at the club don't stop working and have shown their ability to keep up with the times so to, the best, so to have the best facility available. Harbor Point will be better for this with this and at, with, with this, in addition to already having a Denny Center. I ask you to please help make this a reality. The city would appreciate it. I thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Um, our next speakers are Danielle Tierney, Nora Paul Schultz, Shanam Osman, and Pamela Rose. Thank you. My name is Danielle Tierney and I'm a lifelong Boston resident and the parent of three children, one with significant special needs. I wish I could come on here and agree with many of the teachers, nurses, and friends that have, you know, what they have expressed, citing the fear of returning to school in any form but remote. Unfortunately, I don't have a choice because my son has autism. Since March 16th, 2020, he has become unhinged. He is unable to attend to remote learning. He cannot tolerate Zoom sessions and therefore he cannot receive the services he is legally entitled to. I am not qualified to render these services or even assist with them. He has developed behaviors and regressed exponentially. His skills have plummeted and he needs to attend school in person five days a week just to maintain his baseline. The hopscotch model is not equitable for children with special needs. How will they be accommodated? Will these kids be prioritized as the guidelines suggest? We know that city halls and town halls and courthouses are open with skeletal staff for emergency matters. Shouldn't this be true of the schools as well? Shouldn't they open for their most vulnerable in emergency cases? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nora Paul. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Nora Paul Schultz and I'm a physics teacher at the O'Brien. I want to first paint you a picture of my class classroom. Usually my classroom is filled with students working in small groups solving problems on whiteboards or doing labs and, or projects. I love my students and miss them dearly. My, my, wind, my classroom has no windows at all, not even on the outside facing wall. I have so many questions about how it will be possible to teach under the district's current plans. How will I be able to teach in my classroom? I read the district's plan that the classrooms without windows will not be used, but my classroom is in a building where all but one classroom does not have windows. Will all of us need to teach in other classrooms? How will that work in a school that with so many classrooms without windows? This is, this is especially concerning in a school like mine where many teachers are already sharing classrooms. We are overcrowded already. I do not actually think that our school has enough windows that open for all of the classes that need to happen simultaneously. What happens in winter or even in October when it becomes too cold to open the window? And this is all just about classrooms. What about other parts of the schools. Passing time at high, at high schools are, are notoriously crowded. How will I, all the students get from room to room in the five minute passing time while st staying six feet apart? I think we, are, we all know the answers we can't and that means we will all be in danger. 
I also have questions about how I am supposed to teach students in front of me and over Zoom at the same time. From my experience of remote learning, it took an immense amount of focus on the Zoom chat to engage with my students. How can I focus on the students in front of me and support the students who are following along on Zoom? Um, I, for all these reasons and more, I, I don't have time to name. As a teacher, I believe it is imperative that we start the school year with remote learning. We need useful professional development to give us, us teachers the skills we yearn for, to be the best teachers, the young people we so, deep, we so deeply care about from, from a safe distance that keeps all of us healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're in our last set of speakers. Um, we'll hear from Shannon Osman, Pamela Rose, Michael Corcoran, and Jacqueline Rodriguez. Is Mr. Osman with us? Pamela Rose? Pamela? Could you unmute yourself, please? Michael Corcoran? Michael? Hi, my name is Michael Corcoran. I'm the president of Corcoran Jenison Companies which owns properties on Columbia Point, including Bayside Office Center, the Double Tree Hotel, and the Harbor Point Apartments. I'm here to express my support for the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester. BGCD has operated the Denny Center at Harbor Point for nearly two decades, and has served all youth at Harbor Point. I have the pleasure to meet monthly with BGCD staff uh, for several years to discuss all the wonderful programming available to the Harbor Point youth. Their work is remarkable at both Harbor Point and within the greater Dorchester community. I believe there was an opportunity to rethink the McCormick buildings and fields, and I would urge that BGCD continues to be part of the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Jacqueline Rodriguez. Hi, uh, my name is Jackie Rodriguez. I'm a school psychologist uh, with the Sumner Elementary School and Mildred Avenue K-8. Um, I will make this very brief because I think I'm the last person. Um, thank you for your patience, school superintendent and school committee. Um, we're facing a plethora of mental health needs and overdue assessments when we return to our buildings in the fall. Our students deserve access to licensed social workers and psychologists. I'm raising the flag to highlight the need for additional BPS mental health services. Thanks to presenting before this committee, deep cuts to our positions were restored a few years ago. The superintendent added 30 social workers, which is a step certainly in the right direction. But the reality is that we have 13 bilingual school psychologists up from uh, 12 when I last presented before you. It is a question of equitable services and language access services. We need more staff. Um, lastly, I'll just say real quick, quickly, uh, remote start to the year uh, is not ideal really, but I recommend it um, based on the scientific information that we've been listening to all night. Um, I thank you very much for your patience and your um, willingness to listen to me. And I actually did not run out of time this time. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Mr. Lacondo, that concludes our speakers for general public comment. Well, thank you, Ms. Sullivan and uh, Ms. Rodriguez. You're too kind and uh, you're too humble as well. Um, we thank you for uh, hanging on and, and waiting to the uh, bitter end to share your comments with us. Um, so first of all, I want to thank our staff. Um, I know uh, a lot of time goes by 
uh, when we have these meetings, especially when we have these long rosters of speakers, where uh, we forget to say thank you to uh, Ms. Sullivan and uh, Ms. Parvix. Um, I think it's, uh, it's quite a juggling act uh, to uh, keep all these speakers um, uh, in line um, in the, uh, the order that they've come in, as well as uh, identifying them in the Zoom list and bringing them up. So I want to just thank you for the, uh, the hard work you do to keep uh, the train running. Um, and second, I uh, just want to make sure that we thank uh, the folks that um, joined us uh, tonight to uh, provide comment. Um, you know, a lot of charged opinions. Um, this is a tough time on a number of levels and um, certainly um, on uh, reopening um, or hitting upon um, the most important issue that is facing this district and uh, this, um, <coughs> this committee right now. Um, so we, uh, we are uh, faithful that um, the superintendent and uh, Ms. Poost and all the others that are uh, working on uh, this plan day in and day out have taken uh, the comments they've heard tonight to heart and uh, will continue to work uh, in the best interest of our, uh, our children and uh, the families in Boston. So um, it's 1044, we're gonna move on to the, uh, the business of the meeting. Uh, our first action item this evening is grants for approval totaling $2,999,376. Uh, I'll now open it up to any questions or comments from the committee. Okay. Uh, well, hearing no comments this evening, I'll entertain a motion to um, approve the grants as presented. <coughs> Excuse me. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Vice Chair. Any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, please call the roll. And Dr. members, please remember to unmute your uh, microphones. Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. L Excuse me. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lacanto. Yes. Grants are approved unanimously. Well, excellent, thank you. Our next action item this evening is the subdivision of the address 315 to 325 Mount Vernon Street, Dorchester, and the request for proposal selection of the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester. You'll recall that at our last meeting, BPS Senior Advisor Rob Consalvo presented the committee with an update on the Columbia Point parcel RFP process. We've also received an overview of the proposed field house from RFP respondents, Bob Scannell, the president and CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester and Mr. Bill Richard, co-founder of the Martin Richard Foundation. As members will also recall, at a school committee meeting in May uh, 2018, which actually predated a few of our members, uh, this committee voted to authorize this RFP with the condition that the district would come back to the committee for a vote should a favorable RFP be received and the district sought to surplus the land. Surplus in this case and, and in uh, the normal case for uh, real estate would entail handing over the land to the custody of the city, uh, excuse me, the city for disposal. Here the districts obtained a favorable RFP that is rec recommended by the superintendent for approval. However, the district will actually retain ownership of the land and sublease the property under the proposed terms. The committee does not typically take a vote on subleases. I wanna make that clear. However, given our prior commitments on this issue, the committee is scheduled to vote tonight on this proposal. So at this time, I'd like to open it up uh, first to uh, perhaps um, Dr. Casilius and uh, Mr. Consalvo, um, if there are any issues they'd uh, like to uh, raise here uh, in light of um, some of the testimony this evening, and then we can move on to uh, the members for questions and discussion. Um, I don't have any additional comments on the proposal. I want to thank the speakers for their incredible um, testimony, their passion in which they uh, gave it, and the many students who also um, were here for speaking, uh, speaking tonight. The only thing I do want to say to this particular um, topic is that when I met with the students and spoke with them, they did talk about their green space and really wanting to have that um, for activities. And when I had visited, I noticed a lot of concrete around the school, um, both the Dever and also the McCormick. 
And I went to the mayor and said, mayor, the children really want to have their green space. And uh, could we, you know, do something about that? And as I talked with some of the teachers at the Dever School, they told me that they actually call the, the back of their building Dever Lake. Um, because I guess they have some uh, sewer issues back there and when it rains it pools and I just thought what a waste of space with all of this concrete all around and so the mayor did give $200,000 uh, to the beautification of the green spaces and to take up all of that concrete um, so I, and I know that there is a process now um, for the property, it's the IAG process, I think it's called Impact Advisory Board. And I think I get the opportunity to help appoint members to that. Um, and I, I think also um, I would commit to that process that it would be a fair and equitable process as they look to plot the building, as they look to uh, do the green spaces around the building um, and how they uh, position it and all of that I think is just really critical um, to a successful um, moving forward, I think. And so I was thankful for the mayor to do that. And I and I heard to work on uh, the project personally if it is to be voted on tonight. Well, thank you for that, Superintendent, and I appreciate you uh, providing some of that context. And um, as Mr. Consalvo mentioned in the uh, report that we received uh, two weeks ago, uh, that um, uh, investment in green space that you uh, requested of the mayor um, was a big uh, move forward in um, this process, which has actually uh, been something that's, um, again, been two years in the making and has undergone a number of iterations in response to the, I believe, seven uh, community meetings in addition to the three school committee meetings uh, where this topic has been discussed. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of context here that um, probably bears a little um, uh, recalling on the part of the, uh, the committee looking back over the, um, the last two years of discussions on this uh, topic, um, particularly in light of some of the um, information that was shared by in some of the public comment this evening that uh, doesn't really marry with uh, the reality of where uh, we've been over the last two years with respect to uh, the community process and the changes that have happened with this uh, proposal. So um, rather than um, uh, go through that right now, I think it might be uh, wise to open up um, this issue for discussion with the, uh, the committee prior to the vote. Um, and I want to um, remind folks to use the, uh, the raise hand button uh, so that we can make sure that everybody has a chance to be heard. And I see Dr. Coleman uh, has done that uh, nice and early. So we will start with him. Thank you, Chair Lacano. I'm going to say th this is a difficult um, um, issue for me. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with my grandfather ran the Wizard and Boys Club for decades, and it was the first uh, in that Camp Amble in Philadelphia, and it was the first um, club to include, uh, well, it was segregated, but first uh, club for colored kids in the country. And so this is deep, you know, I believe in the, si the system, it's worked well, we're still uh, support the Philadelphia Boys and Girls Club, it's central to my family's background, and, and, and clubs and camps that have been central to my belief in what's good for positive development. And so I, I completely uh, support everything that the supporters of the clubs have said. On the other hand, you had this issue of we've gone forward with the theory of a high school and we have not um, completed that planning process. And it seems to me we're making choices between things we don't know. So I'm, 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 I'm feeling that uh, a vote either way right now by me would feel uninformed about all the possibilities for that land and that area. For example, you know, yes, if BC High was sitting at the table saying, we're gonna, whatever high school you can create there, we'll share our fields or, or people were coming forward with these solutions that are, you know, that we know are important. Um, I, I feel more comfortable right now. Frankly, uh, it's, I, I, I agree with both sides and I don't have enough information to, 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 um, to make a decision. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Mr. O'Neill. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chia. So um, this has been a multi-year process and um, I want to be consistent in the viewpoints that I have expressed. I was the one, I believe, uh, along with Dean Col uh, Dr. Coleman, uh, that when this came up before, we very intentionally expressed that we wanted to make sure BPS students had first priority and Harbor Point residents did as well. And to me, um, you know, this is interesting, right? We heard a lot of voices on both sides of the table today, which is somewhat unusual when we have an important decision to make. Uh, oftentimes public opinion will skew very heavily one way or another. And we heard really impassioned and thoughtful comments from both sides today. And uh, I, I have been listening, I've been following this process, as I said at last week's meeting or two weeks ago's meeting, I went out uh, several times the past year and have walked the grounds, I've walked the field, I have walked Devil Lake as you called it, uh, Superintendent Casilius, as the teachers call it, and had the exact same reaction of, boy, couldn't we do something here that provides outdoor recess space for the Deva students? There's a, a lot of land in behind in the McCormick. I am absolutely convinced we're gonna have a great seven to 12 school there. Um, there's a lot of excess space within that building. And even if we expand it, that building, um, which I'm not necessarily sure we need to do to make it a seven or 12, it will need a complete renovation. I'm not quite sure if it needs too much of a footprint increase, but there's um, a lot of room to do that in behind. And, you know, I think what was really important to me was that one of the days that I was walking that field, a couple of days after a snowstorm, and there were, you know, one set of footprints on that field. And I, then I walked all the way down the beautiful Harbor Point green space that was now covered with snow down to that beautiful park they have on the harbor front that all the snow was trampled down. I mean, that was showing where the people were using the space. And I completely understand and hear the comments about our students and the Harbor Point families using that field. Um, but I also think they can't use it when it rains, they can't use it when it snows. And we're proposing to build a field house that we saw last week is going to be beautiful. That is not being privately done, it's being done by a nonprofit. And it's by, being done by a nonprofit that has an impeccable re reputation in the city for their devotion to our most disadvantaged students and that now our students are going to have the opportunity to use this field house, you know, in, in rain, sleet, snow, or hail. And um, I would, to be consistent with the viewpoints I've expressed before, I would want to ensure that in any vote that we take, and then therefore in any lease that is done with a nonprofit, it is very explicit that first priority is for the McCormick and Deva students. Second priority is for other BPS students in the immediate area. And third priority is for the Harbor Point family. And, you know, Mr. Consalvo, I'm kind of looking at you. Is there a way that that could be absolutely crystal clear? Um, well, the chair could decide how it could be in our vote, but also as a condition that it could be put in the lease. Yeah, I think that's one of the important points to remember is that um, we haven't executed a lease yet. The vote is contingent upon the applicant receiving all of uh, proper permitting and going through a public community process and getting sort of permission from BPS to move forward based on that. We can, we can tailor a lease to, to have any of the terms we want in it. And so it's important for folks to realize that um, we heard several times tonight that, um, th that the land was for sale, it's not for sale. You know, we, we heard that it was a land things like of that nature. It's still retained by BPS property at all times. We have the right to terminate a lease at any time we want for uh, based on any reason that we feel we need to if the applicant isn't meeting the terms of the lease. Um, and, and, there's, and certainly the public process that will move forward under Article 80, as the superintendent mentioned, is a whole other public process with community meetings, uh, with BPS at the table in those community meetings, Superintendent Park talked about an impact advisory group that will be formed, who we will make appointments to that, probably 10 to 15 member impact advisory group. That's the public entity that works with the city and the state to uh, you know, hold the applicant, applicant accountable for what the community wants to see in the project. You'll see that the plan that was presented last week and the drawings uh, differs from the, pre, the original plan uh, in terms of the design of, design of the building, uh, the 
the expansion of open space in front and the back of the building because of the way they situated the building. And I can't underscore uh, that those changes to the plan are a direct, direct result of feedback heard from the community. Uh, and then I can't underscore the importance of the mayor's commitment of $200,000 to begin a study and a master planning process um, that will be led by an outside consultant that will be working with the students, the teachers, and the community to come up with what the plan will look like for the rest of the remaining open space. And that will lead to a probably multi-million dollar capital budget commitment to actually construct that open space. So when all is said and done, the city will and end up spending millions of dollars to reconstruct the open space around the building as well. So all of that can be determined by the district. We can write the lease any way we want. We haven't executed a lease yet. Uh, this vote tonight just allows the next step to move forward. And I said last week, the bottom of the first in a nine inning game, that is the absolute truth because there's so much process that has to happen after this, but we can't even get to that if we don't make a decision on uh, sort of where we're going with this. But Mr. Consalvo, when we talk about who is using the facility, can it be in the lease that first priority is to McCormick Endeavor students and athletic teams. Second is to other BPS schools in the, in the vicinity and third to the Harbor Point family. Is there a way that that can be included in the lease and therefore in our vote? That so I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I turn to you a bit as a lawyer as well. I was just gonna say, I'm not a lawyer. I know Kathy Lazard is probably on this call, but I think we can write the lease any way we want. That's absolutely correct. And um, so, so, Mr. Chair, to, to summarize my comments, and I, and I have been listening very closely to both sides, um, to me, the benefits of doing this for our youth, right at the end of the day, we're a school committee charged with trying to improve the opportunities for the youth in our care. And for the youth in our care at the McCormick that we are going to turn into a 7 and 12 school, to have the use of facility right next door that allows them to do sports and, and play round, you know, at all hours, um, in, in bad weather, in the middle of winter. Yes, I, none of us like giving up green space that they use part of the time, but we saw from the plans, this is gonna be built first class. Um, I'm sure it's gonna be LEED certified. I'll be shocked if it's not. I'm sure it will take into account uh, rising potential waters, et cetera. And to me, the benefits for our students, which is what I'm charged with, what I feel I'm charged with having responsibility for, outweigh the negatives of the loss of the space, knowing that the community across the street also feels ownership of that partial. But as someone who feels that my responsibility is towards our BPS students, I believe this is in the best interest of the McCormick Endeavor students in our care, particularly with regards to that second piece that the superintendent was able to work with the city to get funding for and turn that desolate part of the Deva into active green space as well. And, and Mr. Chair, just to remember O'Neill's point, um, the RFP, right, was a call for ideas for folks to submit ideas on this public-private partnership. And the RFP specifically called out it had to benefit BPS students, and it had to it had to allow BPS students to you know have access to the facility. It had to be a benefit to BPS students. So the criteria for even advancing the um, the uh, proposal forward, um, the applicant had to meet a set of criteria related to the RFP as either highly advantageous, advantageous, or, or not advantageous. And as a result, <laughs> the applicant had to meet those criteria, which included supporting BPS kids, giving BPS kids the opportunity to use the space, and being a partner with the Boston Public Schools. And, and that um, recommendation, as we said last week, that we I read to you, showed that the applicant met that criteria. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Consalvo, and thank you for that uh, helpful suggestion, Mr. O'Neill. Um, I know we'd had a, a number of prior discussions uh, that revolved, and this is going back to 2018, revolved around um, ensuring uh, adequate access to um, whatever building might be built on that space um, for BPS students. Um, and I think, you know, for from the, um, I think you make a good point, you know, we're primarily here for BPS students, but, you know, those Harbor Point families, uh, many of those kids are our, are, are our students as well. And so making sure that we're serving uh, not only the neighborhood that this building would be in, but um, the specific schools that are adjacent to it, um, it makes uh, good sense. And, you know, because of the, the fact that we've been able to retain um, 
this um, this parcel as BPS property uh, through the um, the proposal that's been made, uh, we can um, uh, implement those uh, those lease measures in. Um, uh, in the lease here for this project. And, and Mr. L Mr. Chair, may I just point out one other thing that hit me as well. And, and I am very sensitive to a lot of people saying, you know, and now you're taking away green space in the middle of a pandemic when green space is more important than ever. And, and I fully understand that, right? We all love to, I, I leave my street here in Charlestown, go up to the corner and walk around the park, you know, three blocks away. Um, but even even now, Mr. Consalvo, if, if we vote on this now, what is the likelihood of timing of you know work actually starting in this? With this has to be a year, two years away, I would assume. Yeah, I, I mean, we're, you would be months away from seeing any action on actual groundbreaking. Um, you you, I think we heard last week that uh, um, that the applicant would need to begin the process of fundraising. Um, there's a lengthy permitting process. Again, Article 80 itself is a lengthy process. That actual area is undergoing a planning process by the BPDA on top of it anyway, as you've heard people talk about. Uh, so there's a lot of process to go on this. Yes, it would likely be many, many months away um, from uh, actual breaking of ground and construction happening on the site. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill, and thank you again, Mr. Consalvo. We'll go to Dr. Uh, Rivera next. So um, I just also wanted to um, thank all the speakers, all the writers of um, passionate um, sides, both sides. Um, I, you know, I've said this before, and I'll just be, I'll be brief. But I, I do not support um, the the transfer of this uh, or the lease um, because um, I think that we need to have a solid plan for the McCormick School and what that footprint is going to involve, um, what the needs are going to be. I also um, know um, as a member of the UMass Boston community for 20 years um, that UMass Boston is a, is a big part of that community too. And the kind of development opportunities and partnerships at the Bayside are, are you know, it's just endless. Um, there's, there's no solid plan there either. Um, and I think that there's a lot of potential for, for that site to, to also um, be considered and not then uh, give up any of the green space um, and, and whatever design needs to happen for the 7 to 12 um, school. Um, so I, you know, again, I think that it's just not the right time. Um, I think there's uh, well-meaning parties. I, I love the Boys and Girls Club. My son has was in it for since kindergarten, summer schools. So I, I love the Boys and Girls Club. It's not about their, their programming or their mission, um, but it's more about the McCormick School, Boston Public Schools at the center of our decision making and having more of the voices of the youth. I, 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 that really touched me. And, um, you know, I hope that we could maybe defer um, this decision until we have some solid plans around what's gonna happen with the McCormick School and that's, that's really the core issue for me. Thank you. Mr. Tran. I believe uh, Ms. Oliver Davila right behind me. Oh, we always go last to the vice chair, thank you. Oh, I see, okay. Uh, oh, and I see Ms. Robinson has her hand up as well. We'll go. We'll go to you next, Ms. Robinson. Excuse me. Thank you. I've I've, I've been uh, following up with this uh, proposal for a while now. I understand all the concerns. I I see uh, the concern from uh, different groups and uh, and um, community advocates. Uh, I hear. Our colleagues are concerned as well, you know, uh, opposing views um, regarding this. But uh, we boil down to the practical uh, benefits that would uh, afford the community at large. Um, and rega uh, regarding how you uh, map out the uh, 
the contract giving a, a preference to uh, groups around that area to students at those two schools over other groups or other students that in and of itself is an equity issue for me I'd like to see that as clearly as, as expressed um, in, in, in the uh, you know in, in whatever comes after the contract but for me personally just on the practical side I I I I would, I would, um, I would go along with uh, Mr. Gonzalo's um, endeavor on this. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Tran. Uh, Ms. Robinson. Um, yes, um, I'm very conflicted about this, um, and. Um, for several reasons. You know, I love the plan. I love the whole idea of the plan. I am concerned about the process. I'm concerned that we continue to hear the same voices that we heard two years ago back with the same amount of concern about not feeling heard in the process. And also my other concern is what is the timeline of the redevelopment and the opening of the McCormick as a seven to twelve. When would that when would that process supposedly be finished and the next school be in that space? How many years out are we from that transition? Um, I want to ask uh, the superintendent and Mr. Consalvo to chime in on that. Um, uh, you know, I I should have all these uh, build BPS uh, schedules committed to memory, but I believe that we were. Uh, looking to extend um, the life of the um, uh, standalone McCormick for at least another school year before we could, uh, began the um, combination. Is, is that accurate, Superintendent? Yes, so we had originally planned uh, with the Bill PPS that we would uh, do all of our 7 through 12 high schools um, as we began to think about Bill PPS, and we were planning on bringing that in April, as you know, with the Bill PPS plan, but with COVID, we are readjusting our timelines. And so, um, you know, it is for sure at least another year, but it could be longer depending on what we need to do for COVID and whether we're remote or hybrid or how all of this goes. And so um, some of that is still yet unknown given, given COVID. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and, and, and that I guess so that is my, my kind of concern of, of trying to understand who's going to be where in terms of the current um, McCormick students or that school remaining in that building, the building of something that is new, and then having a high school on top of it come in that wasn't part of the planning. And, you know, if there was a way that we could make sure we've got the development and the needs of the high school done before the development of the community center, then we would have a program that fit better together. If we're gonna go and develop the land, the extra land because of the needs, why wouldn't we just wanna have the whole program proposed out for the use of that space to figure out whether or not that is the best siting for the field house or as has been said, is a lot of development or a potential development space within the greater Columbia Point area. And because of not just the fact that the, the space will be there, I hear you continue to say that the school will have access, but the question is, I haven't heard you really say the school would have priority access. And I remember last week they talked about utilizing the spaces for other kinds of groups also to rent it, et cetera. And these would be adults with cars and other needs. You know, how do we balance the, the needs of a high school and the kind of space it should have, as well as a community center that's got great space needs all in the same plane when we really haven't fully developed that program. And you know, it's, it's one of our moments we're building a brand new high school. Shouldn't it get its full priority and, and feel the, fully vetted for its needs before we're already asking them to share space with another program highly sought after, but may and off, may also offer some conflicts. Well, because Ms. we're Ms. trying Robinson, to get something in without the other. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, mm -hmm. 
Well, I think you, you raised two important issues. One is the priority issue. So again, you know, I think with uh, respect to what Mr. O'Neill raised earlier um, around granting access to our BPS students, uh, specifically our Dorm um, Dever and McCormick students, as well as the children that live in uh, um, Harbor Point, um, I, you know, to the point that Mr. Consalvo raised earlier as well, we, we can write this lease however we want. And I think the, the um, inference in Mr. O'Neill's, um, or at least the way that I took it in his comments were that we would be creating as a condition of that lease preference for um, our students and the, and the children that live in Harbor Point. Um, Mr. Chair, may I just make a comment to that? Please. Um, I, yes, I, I, I want to be abundantly clear. And Ms. Robinson, I think I was getting at what you were saying too, which is it should be the first priority is for the McCormick Endeavor students and teams. Second priority is for the other BPS schools in the area around, because again, there are several fairly close ones as well, the CLAP, et cetera. And then third is to the Harbor Point families. Mm -hmm. And then to the greater Dorchester, you know, then the, B, the Boys and Girls Club can, you know, expand their programs as they see fit. But I think I, I would be very comfortable if we were very explicit that first, second, and third priority were to the following. Right. I think is that get at what you were trying to get at, Ms. Robinson? Yes. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. if I could just well, add. Mr. Consal, well, hold just one second. So, Ms. Sullivan, um, Ms. Lazat, I'm apologizing, but I don't have the um, the actual vote document open in front of me. Um, so I was hoping that um, the two of you might be uh, taking notes as we're going through this mm -hmm. conversation and trying to sketch out some language around uh, um, least priority access for uh, the, the populations that we've discussed to, to insert into that vote. Um, so if maybe you can, you've, uh, while we continue this conversation, you could take a couple minutes and, and try to uh, do some editing there. Uh, we can come back to that. Um, in the meantime, I want to address the other issue as well, um, Ms. Uh, Robinson, coming back to you know, your question of timing. Um, I think it's an ap uh, eminently reasonable um, question. However, um, we have a couple of things that are um, arguing in favor of accepting uh, the proposal that's been made to us. One is that this was an open RFP process that occurred over the last two years, and we had one bidder, and that was the bidder that um, that's um, before us tonight. Uh, and more importantly, that's a bidder that came back to us with the conditions that we placed in the RFP to begin with, which was to create a building um, for the benefit of BPS students on Harbor Point. Um, and that's the, pro the proposal that um, has come back to us. Now, that's a group that needs to go out and do its fundraising, as we heard in their presentation last week. And that's also, it's a nonprofit group, you know. I mean, I think we've heard a lot in the comments about private development and public-private partnership. The Boys and Girls Club is a nonprofit. The Martin Richard Foundation is a nonprofit. They're creating this, this building for our benefit. It's a community benefit. And, you know, that group needs to go out and raise the money necessary to build this building. And that money might not be there or this building proposal um, more um, directly might not be there a couple years down the road. And I certainly don't know that um, the proposal that's based on the land that we are able to provide for the benefit of our students on uh, BPS property is going to compare in any way to the market value of the, um, of the land that's available elsewhere on Harbor Point. You know, to put it bluntly, a, a nonprofit is not going to be able to afford a, um, a, a comparable piece of land across the street um, uh, on the Cork and Jenison property or the um, or the Bayside property. And so, I think when we think through, you know, what might be there when we get to a point where we have further clarity about um, the combination of the two uh, schools that are presently on. Um, the Dever McCormick land and the creation of a 7 to 12. Um, I, I don't know that this, we're necessarily going to have an opportunity like this available to us at that time. Um, and the final point I'll make is, um, Mr. Consalvo, you might be able to um, shed some light on this as well, but I believe in previous uh, presentations on this subject and on the subject of the 7 to 12 being created at um, uh, the Dever McCormick uh, space, there wasn't any need for additional footprint 
um, with respect to the renovation that was going to be um, that was going to be undertaken to create that seven to twelve. Is that is that the correct recollection? Um, I, I believe, as we're discussing it now, yes, that there's uh, would be de developing within the existing footprint, and I'd look to the superintendent for that as well. Um, um, but Mr. Chairman, one other point I want to make that uh, school committee member Robinson brought up was about planning and, um, you know, the, the planning for the 7 to 12 and the planning for the new field house. Um, it, I would argue it actually is the right time to do them all simultaneously. Um, you're looking at an Article 80 process that will take us literally months, uh, a year to 18 months to be completed. Uh, going through a public article 80 process, which in essence is a community planning process of what the final design will look like. We know the city's undertaking a planning process of the entire peninsula, but you know, the Boston Public Schools um, through an intergovernmental relations perspective will be a part of that planning process. We've already heard from the BPDA on that. Uh, the district will be planning uh, on opening the seven to 12. Um, so I think it's actually a thoughtful process that all of this planning has happened simultaneously. The planning with the BPDA through the Article 80 process with community input, the greater vision and planning that the BPDA is going to take for the entire peninsula, and the district's planning of what the future of the 7 to 12 will look like in the next year or two. So they all will be happening at the same exact time, and including, I would add, the smaller planning of uh, redeveloping the remaining open space as part of the $200,000 planning study that the mayor put forward. Um, totality of planning on the on our parcel, totality of planning on the peninsula, and totality of planning for the new field house, all happening simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Has the McCormick community that has said that they're not in favor at this moment of the field house, what has been their reaction to the proposal of the development, the money, the planning money, the $200,000 and the, the planning of looking at the redevelopment of the other spaces that potentially become the green space. Do they see that as a variable trade-off? I mean, how are they seeing those two things in comparison? The field house versus the development of yet of, of space that. Superintendent, do you want to weigh in on that? Uh, I'm Ms. Robinson. Mm -hmm. Say that again. I'm, I'm trying to understand how the community sees this new development of the $200,000 offer from the mayor and the idea of developing these other spaces that really weren't on the table when the field house conversation began. Do they see that as a both end and either or um, sleight of hand? How do they see it as they think about either wanting to support or still wanting to push for the remain the green space to remain yeah. after this so so i talked to a few people and i think that they see it they're excited about it right and because it is a it is a, a positive but i think that um just from what i've heard and what you heard tonight i think that it you know they just um are wanting to be part of the process um, and wanted to be part of the process prior or felt as though they weren't part of the process. And I think that that's what's, you know, just kind of gotten in the way to see that um, as a positive um, in terms of the overall project. So, I, you know, you got the sense of the speakers this evening and um, I see it as a win-win, um, but I also, I also, you know, listened carefully to what people have said and it just, you know, it's, it's a hard spot, but, um, you know, the Boys and Girls Club is known and has a good tradition of a lot of good offering. What we really heard, what really got me today when I, when I was listening was the one um, student who talked, to, I think it was a student who talked about the winter months and how it's just muddy and not usable. And for many of the months up here in the, you know, New England states, it is muddy and unusable outside. And so having an indoor facility is really quite a benefit uh, to the community. Um, so I thought that that was nice. They're also doing some pretty unique services with students with disabilities, which I thought was another really wonderful um, service to our community. So, you know, I see those things as just really a huge win. And, and then when I went to the mayor for the additional green space, I thought it was just a really great opportunity to have um, have that Dever Lake fixed and to and to create um, more green space around this and outdoor uh, classrooms. 
but I do understand where people uh, could be upset with the process. Um, that's why I was really encouraged when Rob told me about the IEG process and maybe a place to restart and to move forward. And just piggybacking on the superintendent's comments for so people are clear, the two hundred thousand dollars isn't the money that's been given to renovate the spaces. The two hundred thousand no, dollars is a public process. Yeah, I get it. that will lead to a final plan that will be capital that will be budgeted through the capital budget, which will likely be in the millions of dollars. So yet, and a continued investment in this campus. Thank you, Mr. Consalvo. Mm -hmm. Ms. Robinson, did you have further questions? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to the. I want to make sure I, I didn't miss anyone. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I want to thank uh, everybody who came out and spoke on this <clears throat> with so much passion tonight. Uh, very much appreciated that you stuck it out um, all the way until 10 o'clock. So um, I just want to say um, there's a really big disconnect when we present something and say we got community feedback and then the community says that they don't feel that they were part of it. So I think hopefully this is a learning of how do we do this better? Um, because obviously the students and some of the community doesn't feel like they were included in this. So I do want us to, to take a hard look at ourselves and see how we make sure to have a, a process where people feel included and heard. I, um, I echo um, the sentiments of Mr. O'Neill and Ms. Robinson. When we first um, looked at this, there was a schedule that was put forth and there was a lot of um, rental <clears throat> in the schedule, which was very concerning to me. Um, and I know in subsequent meetings, it was taken out uh, and we talked a little bit about it, but for me, I would need to have a guarantee that, um, you know, and, I, and, I, and I'm gonna say, I support the Boys and Girls Club. My daughter also went to Boys and Girls Club. It's a great organization. So it feels very weird to be pitted in this situation um, because I'm not anti Boys and Girls Club, but I also want to, you know, support some facets of the community I do think that it is a benefit to actually have a space where young people can go to all year round. And then, you know, hearing about the other dollars and the other green space also makes me feel better. But what would make me feel best is to have a guarantee that, um, and not just a priority, but a guarantee that we're going to prioritize the Dever and McCormick students, the BPS and Harbor Point and that it doesn't become a rental place. You know, I understand the Boys and Girls Clubs need to make money but this is a space that was used by the community all the time. You know, people live here. We are all used to being in bad weather and being cold. That doesn't scare us. We don't stay home because it's cold outside. Um, so I want to make sure that in the language and the vote um, that we have a guarantee for um, moving forward. And then my last request would be that for the IAG, um, I would like to see um, uh, some youth be on the IAG from the McCormick, and I'd like to see um, Harbor Point residents be on the IAG as well. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. And as you were speaking, um, Ms. Uh, Sullivan and Ms. Lazat shared back um, some revised language on the vote. Um, that's uh, proposed for this evening. And I'm actually making some further edits just to uh, capture um, uh, your comments here as well. Um, uh, and I, I wanna read this out um, if I might um, to, uh, for the record. Um, so voted, um, this would be the, the motion that would be um, proposed for the vote this evening. Um, voted comment to authorize the subdivision of the parcel located at 315 to 325 Mount Vernon Street and to approve the selection of the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester as the most advantageous proposal in response to an RFP offering a 30-year lease of the subdivided parcel located at 315 Mount Vernon Street. The lease shall specify that the work on the parcel shall not begin until all uh, ap applicable permits and approvals have been obtained and BPS has issued a written notice to proceed. Now this is the new, the new language in response to Mr. O'Neill's concerns and further edited um, with uh, the vice chair's input. The lease shall also require that guaranteed, I added that word for the vice chair's um, comments, guaranteed priority use for the field house 
shall be given first to the students of the Dever and the McCormick. And I've also added this parenthetical or the successor schools on that property because we want to um, uh, recognize that um, the, uh, the grade configuration as well as the name might change at some point. Uh, then next uh, guaranteed priority to other BPS students and then to Harbor Point residents. So just to read that last sentence again, without the, the pauses, the lease shall also require the guaranteed priority use for the field house shall be given first to students of the Dever and the McCormick or successor schools on that property, then to other BPS students, and then to Harbor Point residents. So having read that, um, I wanna pause and take a look around and see uh, whether there are other, there, there would be other edits uh, or that, uh, members would offer or if there are further questions from the members in light of uh, those changes. Vice Chair. Yes. That's okay. My only question is, uh, and it can't, I know it can't be in this policy, but if there's a way moving forward that we, if we, if there was like a percentage on rentals, mm -hmm. that we, that, that would help to guarantee that it's not you know, in the evening, it's just not going to be completely rented because all I, all I remember is that first chart that we received that had like a ton of like external rental mm -hmm. entities. So I don't know. It, well, that's a, I understand what you're saying there and I, I appreciate that. And I think it's probably a little hard to, to handicap what that, you know, minimum uh, requirement would be. Something that can be carried forward in, uh, by Mr. Consalvo and in this IAG process or mm -hmm. like that it's well do we do have in here let, let me I don't know. I might be getting ahead of myself but I just feel like it's but, great but your point is well taken I mean I think that's you know trying to ensure that we have some minimum amount of access here when we say priority access um, we do have a the, the prior statement that was in the original um, draft of this uh, resolution read, the lease shall specify that the work on the parcel will not begin until all applicable permits and approvals have been obtained and BPS has issued a written notice to proceed. So I think it might be um, advantageous for us to ask B um, the district to ensure that an adequate level of um, access to the building be built into the lease prior to um, the district issuing that notice to proceed. And that, and you know, going back to what Mr. Consalvo talked about earlier, um, we're gonna be embarking on a um, Article 80 process with the um, Planning and Development Authority, uh, which is part of any large project uh, approval review. And that is the process where the IAG gets involved, the, um, uh, which is a, a community group to uh, provide feedback on this project. Um, at the same time, the district should be moving through its uh, design uh, phase for that seven to 12. And so I think um, it, it might provide some um, symmetry for uh, the two processes to move along together and allow for the district to um, hone what that, um, that uh, ideal percentage of use might be for, uh, for uh, the schools that'll be on that property. Little, little known fact, the first ever youth on an IAG was from Sociedad Latina, so. Well, all right. Know that. And probably won't be the last either. Part of the trend. <laughs> Mr. Tran, you had your hand up. Yes, uh, I still feel kind of shaky and kind of uneasy about the additional language 